Dear Lord, thank you, Lord, for a church that values your word. Thank you, Father, for the hearts of the men and women here that uh, you have given to us for this service that they provide. And thank you for the opportunity to serve you, Father, to have opportunities to step into one role or another. It's uh, easy, Father, to forget what we have and think only of what we don't have. And in some places, Father, the churches are so big you can't serve anywhere for there's hardly a place that doesn't already have workers. Um, But in a small church, Father, there's always needs. I thank you for that. For it draws us closer to you and it, it leads us into service. Father, thank you for the mystery and the wisdom and the the power of your word. Thank you, Father, that uh, you've revealed yourself to us in your word. Now, Father, as we open your book, we study a new one today. We open up the book of Ruth. We come to it, Father, with eager anticipation. We know that there's something here for us. Many of us know the story, Father, or have heard it. But, Father, we know the depths of of your word just have no limit. And so we're asking, Father, that as we open it again this morning, you would show it to us once again, but in a new way, in a deeper way, so that we would, uh, we would gain from it what you intend. Father, challenge us as well. Challenge us to be students that listen and do, not just hear. Challenge us, Father, to be those who would step out in a new walk according to what we learn. Challenge us, Father, to work harder for you in the days that remain. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our study in the book of Judges is over, as you know. And please, no cheering or clapping. But, but our journey through the time of Judges continues on. Today we're going to begin the study of Ruth, a small but powerful and important story in the Bible. The book of Ruth has been called, in fact, one of the most important and beautiful short stories ever written. Never mind the Bible, but in all literature. The German poet Goeth said Ruth was the loveliest complete work on a small scale ever written. Another literary critic said that no poet in the world has ever written a more beautiful short story. And W.F. Albright wrote that the delicacy of the story remains unsurpassed anywhere. Of course, Ruth, as we know, is also a book of scripture, which means that it was inspired by the Spirit of God. And not only in the writing, the writing of it is certainly divine, but even the very events themselves were divinely appointed. Those are the events that are portrayed in the book. The Lord orchestrated many details of this historical event and of the period in order to create this powerful picture of his future plans for Israel and for the Gentiles. Now, the pictures that are embedded in the story of this book move outward in time like the concentric circles of a bullseye. So first, at the center of the bullseye, you have the story of Ruth itself, the story of a a small family in a time of trouble in Israel, and how he moved them through the circumstances of the story. And now the story moves off of the literal events of Ruth and starts to portray other events through the lives and the circumstances of the characters. And that first ring outward is a picture of God's plan to provide a monarch for the nation. The monarch that he plans to bring will deliver Israel from anarchy and the self-destruction of the time of Judges. It's the solution to all that bad stuff that we've been talking about for so long in the book of Judges. That monarch is going to lead his people beyond merely doing what is right in their own eyes into a life of serving God, at least to some extent. That picture is closest to the bullseye, in my analogy, because it's closest in time to the events of Ruth. We're only a few generations at this point away from the fulfillment of this promise of a coming monarch. And as you may know, David is the one that we're speaking about here. David will come and rule Israel and provide a degree of stability and a degree of righteousness to the rule of the people that is lacking in this time of Judges. That's the first ring. But as we go through this story, we're going to have to go even further in looking at pictures. There's a yet another picture embedded in this story, and that's one ring outward again from this first one. It's the second one now. And that's a story of the coming Messiah who will redeem sinners, both Jew and Gentile, from the curse of the law. Just as we saw in the time of Judges, sin is the ever-present scourge in this nation. It leads them to doing what is right in their own eyes, but not what is right in God's eyes. You know, we've seen this problem now for 21 chapters in the book of Judges, and it just went on and on and on. 
So God tells a story now in this little book of Ruth that follows Judges through the characters of the book, like Naomi and Ruth and Boaz and Obed and others. And through these characters, he's going to explain to us how God will eventually save sinners from the condemnation that they rightfully deserve for all the terrible stuff you see happening in their culture. In fact, the story of Ruth reveals more clearly than perhaps any other Old Testament story how the Lord will address sin through a Redeemer. Some have said that Ruth preaches the gospel more clearly than any other Old Testament book through the lives of these characters. This second story is the next ring in our bullseye because the fulfillment of these events are some distance away from the age of Ruth. They're farther away than the fulfillment on the monarch, that is David. Now, most people who teach the book of Ruth, as I've experienced it, would stop with what I've just provided to you. They would teach Ruth, they would teach how it perhaps prefigures the coming of David, and then they might go, and certainly many do go, to the next level, and they talk about Jesus being pictured in these events. And that's all appropriate. But there is yet one more ring to this story that is often overlooked. The ring that reveals how the Lord will bring our age to an end. And how he will fulfill all promises to Israel and the nations of the earth in the last days of this age. So just as in our second story about Jesus as Redeemer, this prophetic story is told symbolically as well, through the characters, through the circumstances of the story. But since this third story I'm talking about, this third picture, deals with events that are far in the future, distant events from Ruth's day, It sits at the outermost ring of our bullseye. So you already get a sense of just how complex and layered the story of Ruth truly is. It's only four chapters. It's a story you can sit and read in maybe 12 minutes. And yet it's telling a story, many stories really, that go from Ruth's day into times that have yet to transpire even for us. So that's all to say it's four chapters, but it's going to take a while. Now, in all three of these picture stories that sit on top of the story of Ruth, in all three of these, the central theme will be the same. God's faithfulness to redeem his people and give them rest. In fact, the book of Ruth is a chiasm. And I won't take much time on this this morning, but I just want to set the stage for this for future weeks. A chiasm or a chiastic structure is a way of organizing a narrative in literature, an outline, if you will. But chiasms are different than the way we typically outline. We break down a thought into its subcomponents. A1, A2, B, B1, B2. Chiastic structures work a little differently. They take a thought, they build to it through a series of progressive points, and then once they reach the main thought, the main point, they back out, they reverse out, using the same points in reverse order. So the the organized outline would be A, B, C, D, D, C, B, A. And you match the two points on either end. So the A's on either end are talking about the same thing, but maybe from a different perspective. The B's will be the same. The idea of a chiastic structure is that turning point is supposed to be our focus. It's the main idea. And so when you find chiasms in Scripture, your idea is to find where is the turning point. That's what's going to tell me what the main idea is. The turning point happens about midway through the book, as you'd expect. All four chapters form this chiasm. We see Ruth being provided a husband in this story, which leads her into rest and security. But through her, the Lord is going to grant to her mother-in-law, Naomi, a child as well, which will become her source for rest and security and a new son. Through that son, eventually the line gets us to the king, David, who will grant Israel a time of security and rest. Through David, we get the line to Messiah, who will provide to mankind a time of secure, eternal rest. And through the nation as a whole, we eventually find the whole world redeemed in a kingdom of security and rest. What do you think you're going to find at that turning point in the chiasm? You're going to find a verse in which you see security and rest being discussed. So there's clearly some organized thinking and structure to the way the book has been written as the Spirit inspired. It's designed to teach many things at the same time. In many ways, you could say that most of what the Bible has to say to us in general 
can be found in the book of Ruth, at least in some way or another, symbolically. We have the story of God working through Israel. We have the story of God bringing a redeemer. We have the story of how God is going to bring this age to an end and put a new kingdom in its place. These are all elements of the story of the book of Ruth. All right, perhaps you're beginning to see just how amazing this one little story is. So as we look at this account, we need to understand these three stories. Because these three stories are woven together in the events and in the characters, we'll spend time on each thread at various points along in the study. So we'll begin each chapter looking at the primary story, that is of Ruth and the characters of the story. But as we go, we'll take time here and there to look at those other rings of the bullseye. And I won't always do all three in the same order. I'm not going to make it quite that mechanical. I don't want to lose the, the beauty of the story and the process of dissecting it. You know, So keeping track of these three storylines and the central story of Ruth, that's my job for your sake. And it's going to require your careful attention. And I know in this room, some are prone to taking notes. Others are prone to just listen. Some have Bibles. Perhaps some do not. That's fine. But I would tell you, it wouldn't hurt, if you want to understand this book properly, it would not hurt to be a note taker during this study. Because, as I said, there are a lot of, of threads here, and they can get easily overlooked if you're not taking good notes. And as well, if you miss a week, be sure to listen to the recordings. That would be my encouragement to you. So with that background, let's begin. We'll read the opening verses of chapter 1. Now it came about in the days when the judges governed that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the land of Moab with his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech. And the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion, Ephraites of Bethlehem in Judah. Now they entered the land of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left with her two sons. They took for themselves Moabite women as wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they lived there about ten years. Then both Malon and Chilion also died, and the woman was bereft of her two children and her husband. Well, the story reaches the negative climax pretty quickly. We get all the bad news up front. That's, that's one good thing about the story. The rest of it's all going up from there. Uh, as I mentioned repeatedly, the story of Ruth is set in the time of Judges. And there is some disagreement over exactly when this story took place during the 300 years of that period of, of Israel's history. There's good evidence that it took place in the first half of those 300 years. And here's why. One of the main characters in this story, a man named Boaz, who we have yet to be introduced to, He, Scripture says, is the son of Rahab. Now, you remember the name Rahab, don't you? She was the harlot living in the city when the people of Israel came in under Joshua. And she was the one who comforted the spies of Israel when they were in the town spying out the land. Remember this story vaguely? Well, that all took place in the book of Joshua. So we know that Boaz's mother was a young child as the nation of Israel first entered the land. And then Joshua led them in the land for several decades before the time of Judges began. Boaz is clearly an older man in this story. So perhaps by the time this account is happening, we're 80 to 100 years into the time of Judges. So this is clearly in the early part of the time of Judges. Now regardless of the specific timing, the meaning of verse 1 though is really very clear, especially for those of us coming out of the book of Judges. This account is the third summary of those three stories that end the book of Judges. Remember the first two we studied at the end of Judges? Those first two summaries were the ones that gave us all the bad news about what was going on in the age. This one follows immediately in the book of Ruth. This is our final footnote to the same period of history. And the good news is this story is nothing like the first two. Well, the first two had tales of hatred and violence and treachery. This story is anything but like those. This is an account of love faithfulness, self-sacrifice, and upright behavior. It's a story that represents the hearts of God's people who were living in an age and among a community of people who did not follow God. This is the story of the remnant, if you will. While we were seeing what the community at large was doing and their disobedience to God, there was, thankfully, some within the people who were doing the right thing. And now we get to see what their lives were like. So that's the backdrop of Ruth. It's a time when men were doing what was right in their own eyes. And as we saw in the book of Judges, the people's sin would often move the Lord to act against them as a result. Remember what Jesus said in Luke 16, 15. 
He said to them, You are those, speaking to the Pharisees, you are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men, but God knows your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. We need to understand, God would act to judge Israel at moments along that path, if you remember, whenever they went astray into idolatry. And he did it in a variety of ways. In this story, you see one of those ways. In the first events of this story, you see a Jewish family from Bethlehem fleeing the land due to famine. And it starts with the phrase, a certain man took his wife and his two sons and sojourned in Moab. Notice he's described as a certain man of Bethlehem. Now clearly, some of you must remember that phrase from our Judges study, right? Isn't that exactly the way the last two stories in the book of Judges began? A certain man of Bethlehem. All three center on a man from Bethlehem. And so that's telling us that we're to understand this story is connected to the other two. That the writer is trying to make sure we see these as all part of the same setting. In this case, the man is Elimelech. He takes his family, he leaves Bethlehem, and as I said, he does it because there's a famine. And we've seen elsewhere in Scripture that famines are dire circumstances, and if you depend on the land for your livelihood, a famine is a terrifying thing in your life because your survival may be at risk as a result of not being able to grow things. And when that happens, it forces migration. People will look elsewhere for their food. But God is working here to discipline the sin of Israel. God is bringing the famine for that reason. In Deuteronomy 11:13, God told Israel in advance... This is the kind of thing he would do. He says to them, It shall come about if you listen obediently to my commandments, which I am commanding you today, to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and all your soul, that he will give the rain for your land in its season, the early and the late rain, that you may gather in your grain and your new wine and your oil. He will give grass in your fields for your cattle and you will eat and be satisfied. Then he says this, Beware that your hearts are not deceived and that you do not turn away and serve other gods and worship them, or the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you and he will shut up the heavens so that there will be no rain and the ground will not yield its fruit and you will perish quickly from the good land which the Lord is giving you. So the Lord told Israel before they ever entered the land that if they gave in to idolatry, they'd know famine. And now you see famine in this land. And we know it's happening during the time of Judges. And we remember from our study that in the time of Judges, idolatry was the key issue. So we put two and two together and we come to the conclusion that this is not just your random, everyday, ordinary, casual famine. This is a judgment from God on the land because of their idolatry in their hearts. This man, Elimelech, he decides he needs to flee and go to Moab. That is further evidence of people doing what is right in their own eyes. Moab is the historical enemy of Israel. You may remember this story as well from Genesis. The story of Lot and his daughters. Lot's living in Sodom. God plans to destroy the city. Lot being righteous. God allows for a way to rescue Lot and his family. They come out of the city, minus mom, who made a bad mistake of looking back. And the three, Lot and his two daughters, are now by themselves. And they're so desperate to have a son, to have the continuation of their family, they see no other opportunities. Not that they look very hard, apparently. And in desperation, his ungodly daughters come up with this terrible plan of getting him drunk in Genesis 19, taking advantage of him so as to become pregnant by him incestually, And the sons that are produced from that ancestral relationship become the fathers of two of Israel's greatest enemies, Ammon and Moab. The nations of the Ammonites and the Moabites come out of those two sons. So here we have a Jew, Elimelech, suffering under God's judgment for sin, for the people's sin. He is seeking refuge from God's judgment with Israel's enemies. He is responding to God's chastisement by running from God, not returning to God in repentance. Now, obviously, Elimelech is not personally responsible for all the sin in Israel. I'm not saying that. But his behavior is certainly a part of it. And his response is giving us evidence that, just like we've heard, people just did what was right in their own eyes, including Elimelech. There's no reason for us to assume that the Lord wanted Elimelech and his family to flee the land that God gave them, to go into the arms of his enemies, to Israel's enemies, in the middle of this famine. Instead, it's apparent they're running from God's discipline. They're seeking a human solution to a divinely created problem. And running from God, friends, never improves your situation with God. Whatever trials, whatever tribulations we encounter with God, nothing gets better without God than we have with him. Elimelech and his family are suffering in Bethlehem during 
times of famine, certainly, as a result of something God was at work doing for good, ultimately for good. But that suffering is the direct result of their disobedience, the people's disobedience, so the judgment is deserved, and God in his response is trying to motivate them to better things. And it could only have that effect if they would allow it to do that work in their hearts. Just consider the same kind of situation from the perspective of a parent for a moment. If you ground your child, or if you remove some some privileges from your child, you're doing so, I presume, in the hope of motivating that child to be more obedient in the future than they have been in the past. That's the reason for the punishment, right? Now, I want you to imagine what would you think if your child circumvented those restrictions and escaped your discipline in some fashion. Are things going to be better or worse for that child once you discover their circumvention? You'd understand now how God viewed Elimelech's choice to flee into Moab. He's trying to avoid the discipline that God has brought, rightly so, for good purposes. Now you're beginning to see the negative effects of this choice almost immediately in the text because it says, as they go into Moab, Elimelech and then his wife, Naomi, and his sons, within a relatively short period of time, the patriarch dies. Elimelech dies. Isn't this ironic? He fled Bethlehem to save his life. He goes into the land of his enemies to die. That's a very ironic turn of events. I think God is using that to make a commentary, don't you think? And it's even more ironic when you understand what the name Bethlehem means. The name Bethlehem means place of bread. So, get this. Elimelech leaves the place of bread seeking bread. He flees from death only to find death. That's exactly what you find, by the way, when you flee God's love. And yes, discipline is a form of love. So when God disciplines his children, he does it just as a loving father would do it. When you run from that love, when that, you run from that discipline, when you seek refuge somewhere in the world, you should expect to find even less of what you are seeking to obtain. You think it's bad to be under God's trials and discipline because of your sin? Try walking away from him and seeing how that's going to go. It's not going to get better. You'll find more of what you're trying to escape. In its place, you'll see only an increase in the sadness that your sin produced in the first place. But if you withstand the trial, if you concern yourself with obedience, if you think twice about why you're in your circumstances and use that as motive to come back to God in a repentful heart, watch what he does with that. Because, friends, as a father does with his own children, when your son or daughter responds well to the discipline you hand out, you are eager to bring them back into your arms and move onward from that moment. No one delights in continuing the punishment after it's had its good effect. But the father's sin is not only going to take his life. Look at the toll on his family. Elimelech's choice to bring his family into the land resulted in his sons marrying Moabite women. Malon and Chilion, they marry Orpah and Ruth. And that decision was another act contrary to God's law. In Deuteronomy 23, we're told this. No Ammonite or Moabite, the two groups we're talking about, shall enter the assembly of the Lord. None of their descendants, even to the tenth generation, shall ever enter the assembly of the Lord because they did not meet you with food and water on the way when you came out of Egypt and because they hired against you Balaam, the son of Beor, from Pethor of Mesopotamia to curse you. Nevertheless, the Lord your God was not willing to listen to Balaam, but the Lord your God turned the curse into a blessing for you because the Lord your God loves you. You shall never seek their peace or their prosperity all your days. Speaking about those two people groups. So obviously the law precludes people from seeking peace with Moabites. And friends, in case you're confused, marrying them means seeking peace with them. Okay? So when they seek a union with Moabite women, they're violating Deuteronomy chapter 23. Furthermore, the law prescribes that Jews can never marry from among those of the Gentile nations of Canaan. You find that in Deuteronomy chapter 7. I won't read it for the sake of time, but if you look at the first three or four verses of chapter 7 in Deuteronomy, the Lord specifically commands Israel that they cannot marry Moabites, among others. So the sons now have acted directly contrary to the word of God in marrying these two women. Now obviously the roots of their mistake trace back to their father's sinful choice to move the whole family to that region in the first place. Because now the boys are living in Moab, and they get to the point where they're ready for wives, they lift their eyes and they look around, and what kind of women do they see around them? All they see are Moabites. Again, that doesn't excuse their choice to marry outside of Israel, but you can see how the father's sin contributed to the boys being in a situation to sin themselves. And as a result of all this bad decision-making, all this running from God and from his law, 
The family suffers even more loss. Now you find that the two sons die, it says here, after about ten years. That's after they'd married two women. And so, you now are left with this family of women. You have Naomi, the mother. You have Orpah and Ruth, the daughters-in-law. But you have no men in the family anymore. I mean, what's ironic is this family is now reduced to three widows who are not blood-related. Nobody in the family is actually related to anyone. Now, let's take a moment to look at this circumstance from Naomi's point of view, just briefly. And when you look at it from Naomi, she's the wife of Elimelech, the widow of this family, the matriarch now. When you look at it from her perspective, it's all bad. It's all bad. She's been thrust out of her own land. That means she's abandoned her inheritance in the land. She doesn't know what's happened to it. She's destined to wander now in the land of her enemies. While she's there, her family has dwindled and weakened to the point of almost non-existence, seeming to disappear. And she has no prospects now for provision. A widow in this time and in this age was the most destitute person you could find, maybe save only a cripple. You have no way to make a living. Generally, women could not earn a living very easily. They could not own property under most rules. They would have had no benefactor generally. They're kind of damaged goods to anyone who might be looking for a wife. There's just no benefit to anyone. She doesn't come with a dowry. She's going to be left alone, penniless, and with very little future. Very easily, a widow under her circumstances would starve to death unless she found some benefactor or the mercy of someone to care for her. That's Naomi. Now, if we reverse the lens of that comparison for a moment, I want you to look at the circumstances from the perspective of the Moabite women here, that is, Orpah and Ruth. From their point of view, they've suffered loss too, but their circumstances are quite different. By law, they are prohibited from ever entering into the assembly of Israel. We just read that from Deuteronomy. That is to say, they could never join in worship in the nation of Israel. They could never go before the tabernacle. They could never participate in a Jewish feast. And now you might wonder, well, what does that matter? They're Moabites. They don't care. Well, exactly. They would never have the opportunity to know the living God. They would never have the opportunity to be brought into the family of God, to understand the things of God, as we would say today, to be saved because of who they are and where they lived. They were strangers to the covenants. They were outside the grace of God. They were living in the world and without knowledge or love of Him. That's who they were. But what's happened? Now, what was impossible by law has been made possible by grace. By grace, that is to say, by an unmerited favor, these women, these two widows now, through the actions of a disobedient Jewish family, they've been brought into the knowledge of God. They've been brought out of this little corner of the Gentile world and into an exposure of God. Over these ten years, they, through this disobedient family, have been introduced to the living God. They never could have gone into Israel on their own. They never could have found God by their own seeking. They couldn't go to God in Israel, but God brought Israel to them. So while God was holding a Jewish family accountable for their sin under Jewish law, He was also extending grace to these Gentiles through that association. He was turning all things to good for those who loved Him and are called according to His purpose. From their point of view, they may have lost a husband, but they've gained access to the God of all creation. Now, as you can probably sense at this point, this is one of those moments in our teaching in which I'm going to introduce one of those outer rings of the story of Ruth, and in this case, the one of Jesus being pictured as a redeemer here. You have this woman, Naomi. She stands as a picture of the Jewish people. She's a Jewish wife, while her widowed daughter-in-laws represent Gentiles in this comparison. So they picture two groups of people living on the earth. Naomi, the Jewish people who are in covenant with the living God, and the Gentile women representing the nations of Gentiles who are outside the knowledge of God during this time. The Jewish people are a people God created out of nothing. He created them out of Abraham's son, Isaac, and they were established supernaturally by a promise. And therefore, friends, the Jewish people exist for one reason. The only reason they exist is to accomplish God's program of redemption. Through the Jewish people, the Lord brings into existence everything required for our redemption. Through the Jewish people came the covenants of promise on which our salvation is based. And then through them he brought the law. And through them he brought the tabernacle service, which picture and explain the need for redemption. Later, he brings through them all the prophets, and therefore all the word of God came through the Jewish prophets, including the New Testament, came through Jews. And eventually... 
Israel brings the Messiah himself, the one who's foretold. So everything for our redemption comes through Israel. But as God contemplated his plan, he predetermined that he would work through this group of people, Israel, to bring all nations to know him. He wanted to preclude the possibility that he might have selected some existing nation, let's say, for example, like Egypt or the Babylonians, and said to them, hey, guess what? I've got a plan for redemption. I need a people through whom I'm going to bring my word and my prophets and, and the Messiah, etc. I'm going to use you, you Babylonians, you Egyptians. Had God selected one of those existing people, then we can assume those people would have started to claim they were inherently better than any other people. We might have assigned them that significance, in fact. And as a result, they could steal a little of God's glory because they could claim to be inherently necessary to the plan of God. So God doesn't want that to happen. He precludes that from happening. So what does he do? He makes a people of his own out of nothing, calls them the Jewish people, the Jewish nation. And just to make sure that you and I don't think that they had something inherently good to offer, he says this about them in Deuteronomy 7, verse 6. He says to them, you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people of his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. And then he says this, The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any of the peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. He says, but because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your forefathers, the Lord brought you out by a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. In other words, what he's saying is, you ain't all that. You were important, because I made you important, but you weren't important before I found you. You didn't exist before I found you. The point was to find you so I could use you for something of my own glory. And these women, Naomi and the two Gentile women, are providing a nice picture for us of how the relationship is today for us between the Jewish people and all Gentile peoples. The Gentiles in the story had no opportunity to know God until and unless they were introduced to God through the Jewish people or through, as we would say, through the outworking of the Jewish nation. Paul wrote it this way in Ephesians 2.11. He says, Remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So by the grace of God, Gentiles have an opportunity to know and follow the living God. And we came to that awareness by means of what God did to the Jewish people. And so when you read your Bible, friends, you're reading words delivered to you by Jewish men. Uh, When you come to know your Savior, you're receiving a Jewish Messiah. When we glory in God's forgiveness, we're rejoicing over Jewish covenants into which we were grafted in by faith. That's what you're rejoicing in. And that mercy you begin to see here with these two Gentile women, women who were strangers to the things of God, but now through one woman, through a family, they've been introduced into the things of God. Now the question is, what's going to happen to them? Are both of them going to follow this opportunity? Are both going to pursue what they've been exposed to? Or will any of them? Next week we're going to answer that question and we're going to introduce our third story next week that is of the end times. We'll begin to weave that in too because even in what we've just covered, there is also a story present of things that are yet to come. And the names of the characters, even the number 10 in that about 10 years, all factors into an understanding of how this is picturing the end times and things that are yet to happen. We'll start back in that part of chapter 1 next week. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you, Lord, for the reminders and for the encouragement of the book of Ruth, the reminders, Father, this morning that I took away for knowing that as you you may come into our lives when necessary at times to discipline us and show us the the things that need to change, Father, I hope you'd uh, also encourage us to stay by you and to accept what comes and knowing that it brings good things in the end, not to run from it, not to seek solace somewhere in the world. And I also thank you, Father, for the encouragement that we see how hard you have worked through how long you have been at work and giving us the opportunity to know you through a people that often refuse to follow you. And Lord, your faithfulness is why we have what we have. So we have encouragement to know that even as we are faithless, you will remain faithful, and that's, uh, that's all we need. 
Thank you, Father, for this study. I pray in the weeks to come, Father, you'd, uh, you'd just direct our hearts into the details of it. You'd help us keep it straight in our mind. You'd help us absorb all that there is for us here and let it do its work in us. Thank you for a place that studies your Bible. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Father, for Oak Hill Bible Church and for every man and woman in this room this morning, this family of God that you've assembled, Lord, by faith in Jesus Christ. I thank you for their, their love for you. I thank you, Father, for their, their love and concern for Annette and I and for the, um, for the others who lead at this church, Father, the elders. I thank you, Father, for their, their longstanding faithfulness to the mission you've given us. And, Father, I thank you for their efforts in serving you. Lord, I ask that you would uh, just give us all a renewed and increased heart that wants to serve you in the days that remain. In our own way, in our own place of life, wherever you've put us, we all serve in some respect, Father. And that's uh, all in keeping with your spirit and and how he directs us. We know that. Uh, And now I'll ask, Father, you you bring us together so that three chords are a lot stronger than one, and you'd use us in that way, Father, to to, uh, lift heavier burdens for your sake, for the sake of your glory. And uh, direct us in where that needs to happen, Father. Meanwhile, we're still being prepared for that work even now as we study in your word. And I ask, Lord, that as we study this morning, uh, our hearts would be stirred. I mean, we'd be given things to think about and new desires and new initiatives, perhaps, while at the same time addressing those aspects of our life that are just not in keeping with your will. And uh, we'd, uh, we'd free those encumbrances, Father, so that we're in a better place to serve you as well. Let your, work, let your word do all that work in our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, friends, I want you to have your Bibles open if you can this morning, and you can turn them on or you can open them, whatever is appropriate, because we will be moving around in some places as we study Ruth again this morning. I think it would be helpful if you had a chance to follow me. I'll be reading the verses as you know, but it's sometimes good to see them. Last week, we spent most of our time introducing the structure and the character of this book, and we did that by reading verses 1 through 5 of chapter 1. I want to reread those verses this morning, not because we're going to go through old territory, but because we're going to go through some new things that still build on these same verses in this same passage. So let's begin there. Chapter 1 again, verse 1. Now it came about in the days when the judges governed that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the land of Moab with his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion, Ephraites of Bethlehem in Judah. Now they entered the land of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They took for themselves Moabite women as wives. The name of the one was Oprah. Uh, You know, it's too easy, isn't it? (laughs) Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth, and they lived there about ten years. Then both Malon and Chilion also died, and the woman was bereft of her two children and her husband. So that's a review, as you know. And as we saw last week, this beautiful love story revolves around a single Jewish family in the time of Judges. You have a man, his wife, and his two sons, and they flee a famine in the land of Judah. That famine we studied last week was a result of God's judgment on the land for the nation's sin under their covenant. And the family is escaping the famine because, in a sense, they're trying to escape God's judgment, fleeing into the land of Israel's enemies. But as we said last week, you can't run to escape God's authority. And so during those years that they spend in Moab, the father and then later the two sons die, leaving behind the mother and the two daughters-in-law who had married those sons while they were in Moab. So now you have all these three women, all now widows, all destitute, living in the land of Israel's enemies. Now, during the introduction of our story last week, we also learned that the book of Ruth contains additional layers of meaning. Embedded in our story is another lesson or story picturing Jesus as Israel's Redeemer. And that's the one many of us are very familiar with when we've studied Ruth perhaps in the past. But then I told you last week there's also a third story embedded here in the pages of the book of Ruth. A story of end times. A story that says how the Lord will bring this age to its conclusion. In fact, let's take a moment to understand pictures in general. This is maybe a good opportunity for that to be a topic. A picture. When I've said the word before, maybe you didn't know exactly what I meant. But a picture in Scripture is a prophetic story that uses the characters and the circumstances of some narrative in the Bible to represent another set of characters and events from the future. 
So you have one character in the story standing for another character, a future character. One set of circumstances that actually represent future set of circumstances. And scripture is literally filled with these kinds of pictures. You see them all throughout the Bible. For example, Jesus told us that the story of Noah is to be understood also as a picture of how the world will come to its end ultimately. We get that in Matthew 24. Or you may know the story of Moses holding up the bronze serpent on the staff. Jesus tells us in John's gospel that that's a picture of Jesus being lifted up on the cross. Or Abraham taking Isaac to the top of the mountain to be sacrificed. We're told later that that is a picture of Jesus being sacrificed by the Father on the cross. Or, for that matter, the Passover lamb is a picture of Jesus being sacrificed. I mean, you get the point, right? In fact, all the Jewish feasts, all seven of them, are pictures of events that relate to either Jesus' first coming or his second coming. And this goes on and on and on. I don't know of a book of the Bible that does not contain vivid pictures in this respect. That begs the question, then, why does the Lord embed or create these pictures within other stories of the Bible? Well, at least two reasons that I can think of. First, because they teach us about the meaning of those events. You see a picture behind the events of some story long ago, and you come to understand, like, for example, with Passover, you come to understand that there's something being foreshadowed. There's a bigger story that needs to be understood. It's not just about Israel getting out of Egypt. It's about us getting out of sin, about getting out of the judgment for sin. These things start to take on broader understanding when we see the pictures properly, right? Secondly, pictures are evidence of the sovereignty of God. When he moves through the events of history in such a way that he can orchestrate the movements of people and kings and armies and whole nations so that at the end of it all they create this little drama for us that their very life becomes a symbol of things yet to come. Well, who can look at that and not stand back and say, Oh my goodness, is there anything God can't do? Is there anything not under his control? I mean, if he can move the armies of Egypt in such a way that as people pass through the Red Sea, you have a picture of baptism. And as he comes into the the land of Midian and stands at the mountain, you have a picture of covenants being made in the future from a Christ that they haven't even seen revealed yet. I mean, all of these things tell us that there is not a circumstance of life that is not under God's control. His sovereignty becomes self-evident. Unequivocally, everything exists to serve him. And it confirms for us the trustworthiness of the Word of God. For if something was written thousands of years ago, but yet had in it pictures of things that are unfolding in years to come, clearly that's not just random written word by different people who might have all been somehow assembled together by chance. That's clearly God at work from beginning to end. The majesty of His power just starts to become self-evident when you look at pictures in Scripture. So with that background, let's go back to chapter 1 for a minute. But we're not going to go back to the story that we started last week. Instead, let's start a different story this morning. Like our first story, our second story begins with a wife and with a husband. But in this story, the wife's name is Israel. And the husband's name is Jehovah. And this husband, as you know, is no ordinary man. In Scripture, God often describes himself as the husband of Israel and Israel. Conversely, he describes Israel as his wife, spiritually speaking. And I'll give you one passage. This is where flipping around in your Bible starts to become helpful. This is in Isaiah. So if you want to turn while I'm reading, Isaiah 54. And I'll be in 54 verses 4 through 8. As I said, you don't have to, but it's helpful if you'd like to follow. So in Isaiah 54, 4, speaking to Israel, we hear the prophet saying this. Fear not, for you will not be put to shame, and do not feel humiliated, for you will not be disgraced, but you will forget the shame of your youth, and the reproach of your widowhood you will remember no more. For your husband is your maker, whose name is the Lord of hosts, and your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, who is called the God of all the earth. For the Lord has called you like a wife forsaken and grieved in spirit, even like a wife of one's youth when she is rejected, says your God. For a brief moment I forsook you, but with great compassion I will gather you. In an outburst of anger I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting loving kindness I will have compassion on you, says the Lord your Redeemer. 
Now, this is just one example, and I picked it because it's so clear. There's certainly many others we could turn to out of the Old Testament, where you see the Lord comparing Israel to be his wife, and he calls himself her husband. But notice, interestingly, what he says to her in this passage. The Lord says that Israel is like a wife who has been rejected by her husband, at least for a time. He's referring to the way that in the culture of this time, if a wife did something particularly egregious to her husband, like fooled around, for example, the punishment that might be merited out is the husband might kick her out of the house for a time, temporarily, as a just punishment for taking on that kind of sin. And in that culture, this was a real punishment. If a wife was set outside her home, she had no provision, she had no protector, she had no way to care for herself. It was a very desperate thing for a husband to do to a woman and would only have been done, if it was being done fairly, under the worst of circumstances, like when she has an adulterous affair, for example. The Lord is referring to this practice and using it to reference what he did to Israel when Israel rejected the Lord by forsaking the covenant and worshiping idols. In fact, elsewhere in Scripture, God describes Israel's willingness to worship idols as a kind of spiritual adultery against him. And so he's saying to her, you're like a wife who's been forsaken by her husband because of what you've done, but then he reassures her in that passage that he won't leave her outside forever. He will gather her back at some point. And this is the pattern, by the way, you see in some ways within the book of Judges we just studied. Israel would go through a period of of idolatry, and then God would bring them under a period of justice, of punishment, and then eventually he would bring them back, right? But what's even more interesting is, notice what the Lord says in that passage. He speaks about a time in Israel's history when the Lord, in disciplining Israel, will make her like a widow. Did you catch that? He, He refers to her widowhood. The Lord forsook Israel, in this case, because of her sin, making her like a wife grieved in spirit as if without a husband. And that's one of the classic ways the Bible describes disobedient Israel whenever that's the topic. It speaks of her being set aside in widowhood, as it were, away from her husband, forsaken, without the Lord's blessing. Never permanently, never to her destruction, but it's a way of describing his response. And so now, in Ruth, we have this second story, as I'm calling it today, And this second story is telling us what the Lord does to his disobedient wife as a result of her sin against him. Last week we learned that the Lord brings famine and drought to the land of Israel. He said he would do that to them if they disobeyed the covenant. He promised them that in Deuteronomy. But the Lord does a lot more than just bring famine when Israel disobeys. Go to Leviticus for me for a second. Leviticus 26. And we're building to something here, as you can tell, so it's going to take a little while to get there. In Leviticus 26, this is in the law, in the covenant given to Israel, God spells out to Israel what would happen to them if they fail to keep the covenant. And I want you to take note of some of the things in Leviticus 26, starting in verse 14. Look at some of the things the Lord says would happen to Israel were they to be disobedient. He says, But if you do not obey me and do not carry out all these commandments... If indeed you reject my statutes, and if your soul abhors my ordinances so as not to carry out all my commandments and so break my covenant, I in turn will do this to you. I will appoint over you a sudden terror, consumption and fever that will waste away the eyes and cause the soul to pine away. Also, you will sow your seed uselessly for your enemies will eat it up. Jump to verse 19. I will also break down your pride of power. I will also make your sky like iron and your earth like bronze. Verse 22. I will let loose among you the beasts of the field, which will bereave you of your children and destroy your cattle and reduce your numbers so that your, uh, so that your roads lie deserted. And then verse 38. But you will perish among the nations and your enemy's land will consume you. So those of you who may be left will rot away because of their iniquity in the lands of your enemies. And also because of the iniquities of their forefathers, they will rot away with them. Now the Lord tells Israel in that chapter that if they fail to keep all his commandments, then he's going to bring a series of devastating curses on them. Specifically, he says, I'm just going to list some of what we read. He's going to weaken them in several ways. He says, I'm going to consume them. I'm going to cause you to waste away. I'm going to bring wasting diseases, drain away your life, make your sky like iron and the earth like bronze. That's a reference to the drought, to famine and drought. He says, I'm going to rob you of your children. I'm going to make them fewer in number. Notice where they're going to perish. Among the nations, that is among Gentiles, they're going to rot away in the land of their enemies. Do you recognize that pattern? Think back for a moment to the names of the characters from our opening lesson in Ruth. We have, for example, Elimelech, the husband. His name means God of the king. 
And then you have Naomi, the wife. Her name means lovely, as in lovely Jewish wife. And they live in the time of judges, we know, a time marked by Israel's disobedience, a time in which the Lord brought drought and famine, and that famine resulted in scattering them into the land of their enemies. So while they're in the land, what happened to them? Well, the family begins to waste away. It reduces in number. Their children are taken from them. Soon Naomi's without a husband. She's a widow. Her sons, Malon and Chilion, they die as well. And interestingly, the name Mahon means sick, weak, and afflicted. I don't know what mom was thinking, but that's what she called him. And the name Chilion means pining, destruction, consumption, failing. Those words ringing any bells? You see, friends, these names foreshadow their lives in Moab. They succumb to weakness. They died while in the land of their enemies. The circumstances of this little family in the book of Ruth closely parallel the promises that the father spoke to Israel, his bride, under the very same circumstances. Just as Leviticus promised, the sons of Israel, the sons of Elimelech in this case, are wasting away during their exile, being reduced in number. And so what we're learning is that the events of Ruth are not only telling the story of this one family, it's also prophetically picturing how God deals with his disobedient wife, Israel. And each of these characters now takes on an identity in that second story, in that prophetic story. So the story of Ruth is a story in which the Lord is explaining that these events were necessary as a result of a wife's disobedience to her husband. Not Naomi's disobedience to Elimelech, but Israel's disobedience to Jehovah. Now, it's one thing for me to draw a simple connection between Jewish characters in this story and Jewish people as a whole, or the Lord, etc. That's one thing. But it's a whole other thing for me to suggest that even the smallest details in the lives of these people in this story hold important prophetic meaning. But yet, that's exactly the case. The prophetic connections in the book of Ruth go far beyond the meanings of these names or the identity of these characters. Let me show you what I mean. I want to draw your attention to a little word at the end of verse 4 in Ruth. At the end of verse 4, you find the word about in the phrase about 10 years. Now that word in Hebrew is ke, ke, means about. But friend, scripture is, is careful to tell us that Naomi was in the land of Moab for about 10 years. And the Bible is never inexact. It's not as though the writer of the book of Ruth didn't quite know how long they were there and he had to estimate. Every Hebrew or Greek word, as it were, in the New Testament, in the original manuscripts from which we have our translation, every single word is carefully chosen by the Spirit of God for a specific purpose and meaning, and that is true even in the case of this little phrase, about 10 years. So when you see the author use the term about 10 years, it's not because he didn't know the exact date, it's because the word about is important to understanding something in the story. And here's what it means. As I'm sure many of you know, numbers in Scripture have symbolic meaning in the way that God uses them repeatedly. God orchestrates events in the world to align with certain numbers, like he created the world in seven days and not some other number because the number seven was important to him. And so on. Now, that's not to say numbers aren't also literal. That is to say, it is the case that everything we can see was made in only six days plus a seventh day for rest. It is literally true, but then on top of that, there is symbolic meaning that God is communicating to us through the selection of the date or the time or the number of days, etc. He does that to supply us with an important clue so that we can understand his purpose a little better. Those who might suggest that six days for creation is way too short and very unrealistic and nothing but a myth, they're asking the wrong question. They're asking how could it have been done so fast. That's the wrong question. The right question is why did God take so long? Because if he could do it at all, he could have done it like that. But he purposely chose to take six days to do something. That's telling us something. The fact that he took seven is meaningful. We're supposed to understand something from that number. So by observing the pattern of how God uses numbers in Scripture carefully, we can begin to pick up on the meaning of numbers by just noticing how God is consistently using numbers. Here's what you can learn. I'll run through the first ten numbers for you. This a little background. The number one means God's sovereignty. The number two means division. The number three means the Godhead. The number four means the earth. You know, so we have four winds, four compass directions. Fours are reflected in the earth. Five means grace. Six means fallen or sinful man. Seven means perfect or complete. God's number for 100% is seven. Eight means new beginning. On the eighth day, you have a new week. On the eighth day, you're circumcised. Nine means judgment. 
And ten is the number of testimony, that is, testifying to God, testifying to His faithfulness, testifying of something. So let's take a closer look at that verse again in chapter 1 of Ruth, verse 4. Naomi and her family are living in Moab about ten years. Now, that means they've been there at least nine, right? You wouldn't say about ten if it was less than nine. So they've been there at least nine, but they haven't quite reached the tenth year, or you would have just said ten years. It's about ten. It's between nine and ten. Therefore, saying about ten years is a way of saying we're leaving a period of judgment and we're preparing to enter a time of testimony. Naomi's family has endured a time of judgment in Moab because they fled a famine during a time of judges, a time of sinfulness. God left them there for nine years to communicate sovereignly that his purpose in their exile was a time of judgment. Now, at the beginning or near the beginning of the tenth year, circumstances change and a transition is beginning. This period of God's judgment is coming to an end and it's going to give way now for this remnant of the family, this remnant of Naomi's family, to return to their land. And in that return will come a time of testimony to God's faithfulness to this family. And that year is about to begin. This also, of course, pictures something bigger, as we've already studied, our second story. This is a picture of how the husband Jehovah and his wife Israel will proceed after a time of judgment. Just as Naomi's period of judgment transitions into a time of testimony, so will Israel's time of exile outside her land eventually give way to a time of testimony as God faithfully returns Israel to where he once had her. And to understand that transition a little, we need to first understand how Israel became forsaken by her husband. And this will be a very brief review of how we get to the same moment in the story of Israel that we've reached in the story of Ruth. That is, Israel at the end of a time of judgment and at a preparation of time for testimony. So we're going to begin that back in the law again in Deuteronomy. Briefly in Deuteronomy 28. Look at what the Lord promises He would do for Israel when they disobeyed. We studied some of this last week when we looked at what he said about famine. But famine was just the tip of the iceberg. Look what God has promised to Israel in Deuteronomy 28, verses 62 through 66. This is after a bunch of bad stuff's already been said, by the way. He gets to 62 and he says, Then you shall be left few in number. Sound familiar? Whereas you were as numerous as the stars of heaven, because you did not obey the Lord your God. It shall come about that as the Lord delighted over you to prosper you and multiply you, so the Lord will delight over you to make you perish and destroy you. And you will be torn from the land where you are entering to possess it. Moreover, the Lord will scatter you among all peoples, that is, all Gentiles, from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth, and there you shall serve other gods, wood and stone, which you or your fathers have not known. Among those nations you shall find no rest, and there will be no resting place for the sole of your foot. But there the Lord will give you a trembling heart, failing of eyes, and despair of soul. So your life shall hang in doubt before you, and you will be in dread night and day, and shall have no assurance of your life. Pretty dramatic, isn't it? But that's what God said to Israel, even before they entered into the land, telling them in advance that as they sinned against him, there would be severe consequences for his people. This began to take place over a series of steps, the fulfillment of this. You may know it began with Assyria. Assyria came in and took a number of the tribes away in the northern kingdom and dispersed them into the lands of the Gentiles. It reached its next step for the rest of Israel in 605 B.C. when the Babylonians came in and took the remaining tribes of Israel out of the land and took them captive. In the years that followed, they were able to return. And they were there when Jesus came in the first century. But after the first century, in A.D. 70, or in the first century, in A.D. 70, we reach the point, the final dramatic moment, when God fulfills Deuteronomy 28 and scatters his people outward into all the nations. Jesus warned the Jews when he was walking the earth about this coming judgment, about the fact that there would be this time when God would scatter his people. You can read that in Luke 21. Jesus says this, When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her desolation is near. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains, and those who are in the midst of the city must leave. And those who are in the country must not enter the city. Because these are days of vengeance, so that all things which are written will be fulfilled. Jesus 
gave those who would listen in his day the clue to know when this final judgment, this final scattering would happen to the people and how they could avoid it if they would believe in his word. Jesus said, he said, these will be days of vengeance when what is written is fulfilled. He's referring to Deuteronomy 28. He's referring back to the fulfilling of what Moses said would happen to the people of Israel for their disobedience. And then he says, once they're scattered, what Deuteronomy goes on to say is, once they're scattered, then all the rest of the curses will follow as well. The wasting away, the reducing in number, and so on. Friends, that's the history of Israel. You know, the Jewish people have been the most persecuted people on earth since the days that they came under Gentile authority, back in Jesus' day and prior. And that continues on to today. They continue to be scattered. They continue to be under the times of the Gentiles, as Jesus referred to it. They continue to be persecuted. Not to their destruction, not to their end, but to the purposes of God, the fulfilling of what God has in his plan for the church as well as for Israel. But just like Naomi, this time of wandering in judgment among the nations will transition to a period of regathering of Israel in preparation for a new testimony of God's faithfulness. And I'm sure many of you probably know when we saw this period of transition begin in the nation of Israel. A hundred years ago, if we were having this conversation, we would be saying it's still nine and we don't know how long before we get to ten, so to speak. But in 1948, miraculously, God opened the door for Israel to come back onto the world scene as a nation and people to be able to regather in that land. And ever since 1948, the return of Jews into their land has continued unabated and it's even accelerated in recent decades. That is the beginning of the transition. The comparable moment in God's prophetic plan for Israel that you see happening here in Ruth. God told them this would happen. In Ezekiel chapter 20, listen to what Ezekiel says concerning the future for Israel. Ezekiel 20:33. As I live, declares the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out, I shall be king over you. I will bring you out from the peoples and gather you from the lands where you are scattered with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples and there I will enter into judgment with you face to face. Verse 36, As I entered into judgment with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so I will enter into judgment with you, declares the Lord God. I will make you pass into the rod. I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. And I will purge from you the rebels and those who transgress against me. I will bring them out of the land where they sojourn, but they will not enter the land of Israel. Thus you will know that I am the Lord. Notice he keeps talking about a time of judgment. He says, I scattered you and surely I'll bring you back. But when I bring you back, it's going to be, he says here, with wrath poured out. Under a time of judgment. I love the phrase, I will make you to pass under the rod. As a parent, you should know what that means. Even if you don't use one, as a child, you should know what that means. Not that you necessarily use one, but the point is clear. It's a time of like parental discipline. He's speaking here about how he's going to move Israel out of a period of judgment into a time of testimony right before he delivers the kingdom to them that he's promised. But it won't come easy. He's going to have to purge, it says, the rebels. Those who transgress against him will not be allowed to come into the kingdom. They're going to be removed from the equation. But Israel must first go through a period of purification, of being purified, beginning with their regathering. And friends, we are among those in this privileged generation of believers to see these things beginning to play out. Things spoken of thousands of years ago are actually starting to transpire before our very eyes. It's as if we were, in the story of Ruth, watching that poor pitiful family coming out of Moab and beginning to move back into Israel. That's what we're now watching prophetically. We're watching that in the nation of Israel. In Ezekiel 36, verse 17, he says this, Son of man, when the house of Israel was living in their own land, they defiled it by their ways and their deeds. Their way before me was like the uncleanness of a woman in her impurity. Therefore I poured out my wrath on them for the blood which they had shed on the land because they had defiled it with their idols. I also scattered them among the nations and they were dispersed throughout the lands. According to their ways and their deeds, I judged them. When they came to the nations where they went, They profane my holy name, because it was said of them, These are the people of the Lord, yet they have come out of his land. But I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations where they went. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went. 
I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. For I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. If the Lord were to wait for someone in Israel to have a heart to follow him, he would have been waiting a very long time, an eternity. So he says, I will for my own namesake, which is a way of saying, in keeping with my promises so that history will judge me to be faithful to my word, I will one day, by my own hand, take Israel and regather them, not because they become holy overnight, but because I'm doing what I said I was going to do. I'm going to bring them into the land, and as we read earlier, with wrath poured out, I'm going to purify them, bring them to the point so that they can have the things I promised, and bring to conclusion all of these events. This is the love of a God who is dealing with a stubborn and disobedient idolatrous people. So that's where our second story is headed. Israel in exile for the past two millennia. Less than a hundred years ago, that nation began to regather into her land. That regathering is our sign to know they're now moving out of a period of judgment into a time of testimony, just as Ezekiel 20 and Ezekiel 36 promised. Speaking in the Bible's language of numbers, it's been about 10 years for Israel, figuratively speaking. She's had much despair and much misery for her years of wandering, and yet judgment's giving way now to testimony, or soon to give way. Now, we've only scratched the surface of our second story, and we still have the whole first story yet to pursue as well. So next week, we're going to return to the story of Naomi and her two daughters-in-law. We're going to see where they go now that they've faced this moment of destitution in the land of their enemies, what draws them back, how they proceed. And then, of course, as we watch those events unfold, we'll continue to examine how those events picture a prophetic story of what God is preparing to do with Israel. Before this story is out, we will watch prophetically how God will take Israel, redeem her, and bring her into the kingdom to come. All of that is pictured And, of course, we're in this story, too. For the kingdom is not just a kingdom of Jews. It is a Jewish kingdom that brings in a whole set of nations of Gentiles, you and I. And, yes, we're in the story, too. We're pictured as well by the characters of this story. That's where we're going to be going in future weeks. Father, thank you, Lord, for the the message of uh, Ruth. Thank you, Lord, for the pictures that you put in Scripture. We have such great confidence to put our trust in the word that you've given us because... Uh, We see clearly your hand at work in having put it together, not just in the writing of it, but, Father, also in the events of it. And, Father, if you can orchestrate people and nations and armies from long ago in the way that you've clearly done, then our lives, Father, must be a simple matter for you. Let us remember that as we concern ourselves with the frustrations of life and the worries and those things that we can't seem to get our head around at times and keep us awake at night. Let us rest, Father, knowing that you've got it under control. No matter what comes against us, Father, it won't change where we go in eternity. It can't change who we are in Christ. And if so, then there must be good purpose in it, whatever that thing is. And I pray, Lord, as we, as we live our life in service to you, that we're thinking boldly about how to serve a God who has so much under his control and that we're, we're not resting in fear, but we're resting in peace, knowing that nothing that happens isn't a part of your plan. Let those things begin to change us in in the way they're intended, Father, even as we study this simple story of a family who lived long ago. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Dear Father, thank you, Father, for the celebration of joy this weekend and for the cause that made it necessary. That is, Father, the faithfulness of our leaders. And thank you, Lord, for the work that has been done here over such a long period of time in consideration to what others experience in other places. Lord, we have been so blessed continuing to be so blessed and in our modest size our modest facilities we can sometimes find our our thoughts turning to what we don't have and to what we wish we could have and that's just human nature father perhaps it's a a godly desire as well at times to to want to expand our reach but in the meantime father let us remember what faithfulness has been here and how much you have already done so that we would not be discouraged and uh, we could celebrate And Father, one of the things that we're most encouraged by is the long-standing desire in this place for the Word of God to be declared properly, boldly, and uh, to hearts and, and to ears that eagerly receive it. And Lord, we want to continue that for as long as you give us 
the opportunity. And today is one more day on that path. And we ask, Lord, that our study today in the book of Ruth would edify us as only your word can. It would open our hearts to the truths of what you've done and are doing. And, and in the majesty and the magnificence of your sovereignty as displayed in these things, I pray, Father, that we would be humble before you and acknowledge that sovereignty in our everyday lives so that we would follow you in greater obedience. For we know that pleases you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're still in chapter 1. It's been two weeks now into our book of Ruth. We've spent that two weeks studying exactly five verses in the book of Ruth. So at that pace, we will require nine months to finish this study. But have no fear. We're not going to need more than seven months tops. Just kidding. Seriously, our pace is going to pick up this morning. We've been spending time in the early part of this book establishing some basic things that we needed to know so that as we move through the rest of the book, we have that framework to work in. And in the first five verses of the book, what we've learned is that the story of Ruth, first and foremost, centers on a Jewish family, a family living in the time of Judges, a family that has fled the nation, their land, their inheritance because of famine. They have sought refuge in the land of their enemies in Moab. And in over nine years of time, the family has been reduced to just three women. And then we learned, as we looked at the symbols that are contained in these facts, we learned that this story is more than just a story of this small family. This is also a picture of Jesus as our Redeemer. That story will obviously play out over the next four chapters. And as I would submit to you, it's also a story of how God deals with disobedient Israel through the events of the last days, into the ends of this age. These pictures are embedded in the story of Ruth. And so as we move through it, we're going to look at all of these aspects of the book. For now, though, it's time for us to return to the primary story, that is, of this family, and of what's left of it, living in the time of Judges. And we pick that up at verse 6. Reading verse 6, speaking here of Naomi, it says, Then she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the land of Moab, for she had heard in the land of Moab that the Lord had visited his people in giving them food. So she departed from the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return, each of you, to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. May the Lord grant that you might find rest, each in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, but we will surely return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return, my daughters. Why should you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands? Return, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I said I have hope, if I should even have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you therefore wait until they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from Mary? No, my daughters. For it is harder for me than for you, for the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. You remember last week we noted that they have been in the land of Moab now nine years. They are now approaching the tenth year in Moab. And at this point, Naomi decides it's time that she leaves the land, that she returns to the land of her family in Judah. And as you can tell from the text, the thing that prompts this thought in her head, it's not the loss of her sons. It's not the loss of her husband. I mean, she's been bereaved of her husband now for quite some time. Now, in verse 6, we're told that she's heard something that's prompted this desire to go back. And what she heard was that there were good things happening back home in Judah. Specifically, the Lord had, quote, visited her people, and that specifically he was giving them food again. The famine was over. So the famine and drought have ended, and now it sounds like it's time to go back. But more importantly, the people here have recognized, the people of Israel have recognized that the arrival of these better times is a result of the Lord's sovereign will. That's the meaning of the phrase, he has visited his people. Just as that time of devastation, of deprivation under the famine, was itself directed by God as judgment, as we noted out of Deuteronomy last time, so now is this blessing a result of God's direction or God's countenance toward the people. So they see the ebb and flow of these circumstances of life as a reflection of God's pleasure or displeasure in the people. So now, as a result of food returning, Naomi says, I need to go back to my own people. But now the question is what to do with your daughters-in-law. These are not Jewish women. They're Moabites, Gentiles. They don't have husbands anymore. There's a very tenuous connection in the family between her and them. And in the culture of this day, a woman 
in the way it was done when you married, a woman left her father's home and she attached herself to the home of her new husband. So in a sense, these two Moabites women are no longer a part of their parents' family. They now belong to this family of Elimelech, this new tribe of Judah. And yet, their husbands, Mahon and, and Chilion, are gone. Even Elimelech now is gone. So there's a question, an open question in this family for where their allegiance will lie. These women have remained at this point so far a part of Elimelech's household and they have the prospect then of receiving Elimelech's inheritance. But the future for a woman in the circumstances that each of these women face was very bleak in these days. Historically, these women would have had very little options, very few options for survival. They don't own any land on which to survive since Elimelech is not a Moabite, so he has no land in the land of Moab. Any land, any inheritance that he might have received within the tribe of Judah was back in Judah. And he abandoned that property. Now, he didn't abandon rights to it, but when you leave a property that is intended to produce in farming, if you leave it for 10 years, what do you think it's going to look like when you come back? So even if they did return to Elimelech's inheritance in the land of Judah, and assuming that it hadn't fallen into the hands of someone else and they were willing to relinquish it back to them, nevertheless, the overgrown land would have been unable to be farmed without a lot of effort, and these women, likely, or more than likely, lacked the physical strength necessary to work the land, or even perhaps the expertise to do so. What I'm pointing out is that even if you could legally find a route to prosperity for these women in practical terms, they have very little hope to find anything on their own in this world. They are destined, likely destined, to be beggars. Moreover, these women are unlikely to attract new husbands, which of course would have been one other way in which they could have worked themselves up out of their circumstances. They've all been given into marriage already once. Now they are widowed, so they have right under law to be remarried, but they're no longer as attractive to a prospective suitor as a woman who has never been married. To draw a very crude comparison, it's in the same way that someone might prefer a new car over a used car. And I'm not saying that's true. I'm saying that's the perspective. I knew I'd get in trouble for that. That's why I said it the way I did. You get what you pay for. You have a... Someone's offering me 35 cents, I hear, over here in the corner. Now, all of, this, all of this cultural truth is particularly true for Naomi, because she's the oldest of the women. At least her daughters-in-law were younger. If they separated from Naomi, if they returned to their homes, they had a decent chance of being accepted by another man one day. And that's Naomi's argument. She's saying, if you come with me, you will have few reasons for hope. Remember, we studied this at the outset of the book. The law prohibited the nation of Israel's sons from marrying Moabites. Up until the 10th generation, it was said they would be cursed. So there is a concern for the women here, for the younger women on Naomi's part, that if they follow, they're taking the path of least hope, least opportunity. And for all the, the negative consequences of their situation, they might as well choose the best possible option. And for her, she's giving them permission to separate and go their own way. It's an act of mercy. She's attempting to persuade her daughters-in-law to abandon her for their own best interests. In verse 8, she blesses the women by asking that the Lord be as kind to them as they have been to their deceased husbands. And so we can see that they were loved by Naomi. They had a good relationship. Furthermore, Naomi calls for the Lord to grant them rest from this trial and the uncertainty of widowhood. And, and resting in the house of a husband is her euphemism for remarriage. Resting from all of the trial that widowhood brings. So as Naomi suggests this plan, the ladies, you notice, they, they first embrace in tears over the prospect of seeing this, what's, what's left of this pitiful little family, be broken up further. The younger women declare here in solidarity with her, we're not going to abandon you. But Naomi doesn't want to hear it. She insists. What, what she's really doing here, it's a bit of a cultural thing here, for them to suggest, for her to suggest to them that they abandon her, which would have been culturally inappropriate, you know, to leave this dependent mother-in-law, to fall away from her in this way. They have to do what they do. It's, it's sort of like that moment at a table in a restaurant where you're trying to figure out who's going to pay the check. Everyone has to offer. But whoever really, really wants to do it will be the one who persists to the end. Everyone else sort of backs off. And it's a polite way of making clear that you tried. And that's kind of what I think is going on here in the culture. They are going to make the necessary cultural response to her offer. Oh, no, 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 we couldn't possibly abandon you. 
But she knows that's expected, so she presses the argument. She begins in what I sense is perhaps a little self-pity, but understandably so. See, she sarcastically asks, look, if it were possible for me to even be married now and get pregnant now and have two sons in my womb even now, if we could get to even that possibility, which is itself very remote, would you be willing to wait till they grow up and then be old enough to marry you? Would you wait that long to be married? And she's not going to bear any more children. She doesn't even expect to get remarried. And so she's trying to point out to them that the Lord has gone forth against her, as she says, so that who would want to have a part in that future? Why would you hitch your wagon to this train, knowing where it's headed? She's giving these young women permission to be selfishly minded under these circumstances. They would naturally feel obligated to stay with this mother-in-law, but she's giving them the chance to do what they would prefer. Because they know that staying with her likely means they'd never get married. That's almost inevitably what it would have happened. So look what they say in response to her. They lift up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. But Ruth clung to her. Now here we see the, the first moment of distinction between these two daughters-in-law. Orpah, she decides to take advantage of the opportunity. She decides to agree with Naomi and abandon the sinking ship of the family of Elimelech. She kisses Naomi, and that's a final gesture of love, and she departs. She loved Naomi. I don't think we have to question that, but not enough to sacrifice her own desires. In a sense, Orpah valued marriage to a future husband more than she valued her relationship with Naomi. And when Naomi gave her a chance to choose which one of these two do you care more about, well, Orpah chose husband instead of Naomi. And her name, by the way, reflects her heart. Her name means stubborn or stiff-necked, which is to say her personal interest came before Naomi's. Then there's Ruth. Now, at the end of verse 14, we hear that Ruth clings to Naomi. The word cling can also mean cleave or join to. That word does not merely indicate she stays with Naomi. It's a very specific word. It means she's pledging herself to Naomi. It's covenantal language. Ruth has made a commitment here that she's going to spend the rest of her life in the household of Naomi, come what may. Even if it means she never marries. Naomi mattered more to Ruth than even the prospect of a husband or the opportunity to have children. She's not foregoing those things necessarily, but she's saying that if I have to choose between the two, my choice is to be committed to Naomi more than it is to be committed to my own instincts. Why do you think Ruth is making this connection? Why do you think she has this interest? Well, part of it goes back to the second story that we've been studying in earlier weeks of this book. We've already said that Naomi pictures the nation of Israel in this story. And we've said that what Ruth gained in her relationship to Naomi was access to the knowledge of the true living God, to the ability to understand things that would have been outside her reach as a Moabite living in the land. And... When Naomi releases each of these women from their obligation and insists that they make the decisions of their heart, what happens next is a reflection of each woman's heart. You see in the case of Orpah a desire to go back to the earthly, to the the things of this world that she values so much, to the exclusion of what was available to her in the relationship that Naomi offered, the relationship into the nation of Israel. But, But Ruth, Ruth has exactly the opposite heart. Ruth is no less interested in marriage. She's a normal, healthy young woman. I'm assuming it was very much in her desire. But in contrast, or in comparison to the riches of what it is to know the living God, Jehovah, she finds her interest going with Naomi. And you can see that next in what Naomi says to Ruth. Verse 15. Then she says, Behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you, for where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. Thus may the Lord do to me, and worse, if anything but death parts you and me. Naomi, in verse 15, actually hints at the reason why Orpah chose her path. We don't see Orpah's own testimony. She just disappeared. But Naomi says Orpah returned not just to her people and not just looking for a husband, but more specifically to her gods. 
which would tell us that Naomi must have sensed that Orpah's allegiance to Moab went much deeper than merely finding a husband in the culture. She was drawn back to pagan worship. Elimelech's God, the God of Israel, has never made an impression upon Orpah's heart, or so it would seem. So when the going got tough with Naomi, well, there was nothing else holding Orpah to the family. There was no spiritual connection. But then there's Ruth. And when Naomi begs Ruth to leave, Ruth's response is to beg Naomi not to leave her behind. She pledges that whatever future Naomi has, it will be Ruth's future as well until she dies. In fact, she invites a curse from God should she fail to keep this commitment. She's entering into a covenant here. This is very classic covenantal language. To death they will be bound. And Ruth's reason for this commitment to be among uh, considered a part of Naomi's family is because she wants access to Naomi's people that is the Jewish people and to Naomi's God the God of Israel we're coming to understand here that Orpah isn't leaving simply because she wants a husband and neither is Ruth staying simply because she doesn't the husbands are really immaterial at this point the bigger concern is a matter of faith in their hearts Orpah finds nothing particularly attractive about the Israel of God and she has no affinity for the God of Israel. Orpah's proof that you can take the girl out of pagan Moab but you can't take pagan Moab out of the girl. Likewise, or in reverse to that, Ruth, it appears, has become a worshiper of Yahweh. She no doubt wants a husband, as I said, like any young woman would, but she has come to realize there's something much greater than being married. She wants to know and follow the true living God above all else. And could you imagine if you were in her circumstance and had the understanding that she has apparently come to, and if you were watching the one person in, in your entire world who has any connection to that living God walking away without you, I mean, it's hard for us to even conceive of such a situation, but if you could imagine yourself in a place in which you are the only person who knows the truth of Christ, let's say, and, for that matter, you are without a Bible, for it would not have been possible for Ruth to have found any source for the truth of God in her arena. So, you're in the world, you know of a God who knows you by faith, and you have no connection to Him physically, you have no tangible connection. Wouldn't you be seeking for someone, something, that you could relate to that would help you in that relationship. That would be the natural thing you'd want. That's Ruth. More importantly than that even, Ruth realizes that maintaining her connection to Naomi is, by identity, her connection to God. In other words, being part of the nation of Israel is, in this day, having access to God, as Paul says elsewhere in the New Testament. Before Naomi came into her life, she didn't know Yahweh. Now she does. If Ruth is a follower of Yahweh, she has to remain close to those who are in relationship, in covenant with Yahweh. And so her love for God propels her to sacrifice her earthly desires in order to obtain heavenly things. I often wonder why Ruth wasn't included in chapter 11 of Hebrews, you know, the Hall of Faith, as we call it. She exemplifies the self-sacrificial love that faith requires. She, she passed on the opportunity for earthly reward in order to seek heavenly reward. If there is a reason why she wasn't included, it may just be because at the end of the story she actually receives the earthly thing that she was potentially sacrificing. So perhaps in the way the writer of Hebrews 11 ends by saying those who wish for these things did not receive them, right? She does, but she will also be rewarded, of course, in, in heaven. But anyway, based on her actions and her words, here's what we can safely conclude about Ruth. She was saved by her faith in the promises of the God of Israel. And by the same token, I think you can safely assume that Orpah had never turned that corner. You can remember each of these three women in this way. Naomi was the grieving widow. Orpah was the leaving widow. And Ruth was the cleaving widow in this story. Let's go back to the text, verse 18. When she, that is Naomi, saw that she, Ruth, was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. So they both went until they came to Bethlehem. And when they had come to Bethlehem, all the city was stirred because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? She said to them, Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi? Since the Lord has witnessed against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me. So Naomi returned, and with her, Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, who returned from the land of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. 
So Naomi does relent. She allows Ruth, as you see, to accompany her, no doubt, I think, with a measure of relief. I mean, can you imagine that she must have been glad to see that her insistence of Ruth's departure was met by equal insistence, greater insistence, that Ruth stay with her. She must have had great appreciation and encouragement that Ruth remained committed to her under these circumstances. Friends, this is, by the way, the biblical definition of love. Love is not an emotion. Love is a verb. Love is, according to the Bible, the one's, a one's willingness to sacrifice your own interest for the need of someone else's interest. Perhaps that's why Jesus' greater love has no man that he would lay down his life for his friends. That self-sacrificial act is a definition of love. And perhaps that's why the name Ruth actually means friendship. Because in what she does here... It is the definition, as Jesus calls it, the definition of friendship that is of laying your life down for another. And so Naomi and and Ruth head back to Bethlehem. And as Naomi arrives, she's greeted by those who remember her family from years ago. They're astonished to see her. They must have assumed that the family of Elimelech was, was gone. I'm sure they must have heard some of the bad news of the family falling on hard times in Moab, and they must have assumed it was, it was all over for them. And as they greet her by name, she says, well, don't call me by that name anymore. I want a new name. She says, I don't want to be called Naomi. Remember that word means pleasant, as in pleasant Jewish wife, you could say. They say, and so she says instead, my new name is Mara, which means bitter. She's bitter. She's bitter about her circumstances. She's bitter about her misery and her loss. But more importantly, who she bitter against? Well, she says, she's bitter against the Lord, for she knows he is the one that causes all things. But remember, friends, that why they're in this situation. We said last week that this family is suffering as a result of a chain of sin, not as a result of a cruel God. They, the story of, of what happened in their life began first with the sin of Israel in the time of Judges, disobeying the Lord, breaking his covenant. That prompted the Lord's response of judgment, as he does in that cycle of Judges that we all studied. And that judgment, which was famine in their day, brought as a result a decision by the Father to abandon the land and go seek refuge in the land of enemies. That's another sin on top of the sin. And then that sin was continued by the son's sinful decision to marry Moabite women, contrary to the law. So Naomi may be bitter toward the Lord, but it wasn't the Lord's fault. Naomi has spent nine years outside the land during a period of judgment, as we noted last time. And even then, the Lord has remained faithful. And that's why she's now back in her land. This is such an ironic moment. She has just returned from exile to a land that is now seeing the plentiful blessings of the Lord in harvest. And it's only now that she's harboring all this resentment against God for her situation. Naomi even adds here that she left full and she returned empty. Now we understand, of course, what she means. She's lost her husband. She's lost her sons-in-law, even one of her daughters now. But in reality, spiritually speaking, her situation is exactly the opposite, I would argue. She left in a famine. She's returning in a time of plenty. She left with three men who were intent on disobeying the Lord and leading the whole family into ruin in serving only their own self-interests. And she returns accompanied by a devoted follower of Yahweh who is faithful to her at her own loss. Which of those two sounds better? The truth is, in what Naomi can really point to, she's never had it better. In the things that really matter in life, she's never had a better situation. On the surface, things look great as she left. But deep down inside, that family was, was on a path to destruction. As she comes back, she feels slighted by the Lord. The truth is, His grace is evident in this story. Her situation at the end of chapter 1 is a classic representation of how the child of God can be persecuted, deprived, and hated by the world, and yet, at the same time, be considered blessed by the Lord. If you measure your circumstances in earthly terms, worldly terms, then you will always, almost always, find somewhere in your life you can point to for a cause in bitterness. I mean, if you want to be upset at your circumstances, I doubt it's very hard if you look you know, enough to find it. Our Lord himself has said, though, that those who follow him are going to know things like rejection and persecution, just as he knew it before us. He says in Matthew 10, 24, a disciple's not above his teacher, nor is a slave above his master. It is enough for the disciple that he become like his teacher and the slave like his master. If they have called the head of the house Beelzebub, well, how much more will they malign the members of the household? 
So it's an expectation that we would run into difficult circumstances as a result merely of our association with Christ, to say nothing of the consequences of our own sin. And Paul reminds us that our faith in Christ has made us enemies with the world, as it was from the beginning. In Galatians, he's using an allegory, and at one point in that allegory, in chapter 4, verse 28, he says, And you, brethren, are like Isaac, that is, a child of promise, but as at that time, he who was born according to the flesh, speaking here about Ishmael, persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, and so it is now also. There's a basic, fundamental principle, spiritual principle, that guides the way our life will uh, continue to its end. And that basic principle is, having come into faith, having become a child of the promise, Paul says, by faith, we now set ourselves up for attack by the world that does not know the Lord, for it has always been that way, Paul says. You remember the very first example of that, Abel and Cain, the child of the promise versus the child of the flesh. That's what we have to understand if we're going to live with spiritual understanding, with eyes for eternity. You have to know that your happiness in this life is not a determiner of whether or not God is pleased with you. Because the Word of God has already disclosed that the life of a Christian will mirror to some extent the life of his Lord, of our Lord. And therefore, we should expect we're going to suffer at times at the hands of hateful men. We're going to see trial. We're going to see testing. And on top of all of that, if we don't walk in obedience to the Lord, we'll see consequences for our own sin. Therefore, you have to let your joy come, not from those things, but from knowing that you are assured of glory in a heavenly state yet to come. And you will have eternal reward in that time based on your service to the Lord here. And no one can take any of that away. You will enjoy your inheritance in a glorified body. You'll never die again. You'll never suffer in the way you did here. And in light of that future, how can you dwell in your present suffering? It'd be one thing, I think, for us to wish for better things in this life. Who can argue against that? But it's another thing altogether to have your entire mindset dependent upon things going well here. You're setting yourself up for failure. Now, I don't want to slight Naomi's hardship. Clearly, Naomi has suffered a great deal in her life, and there's good reason for her to feel some misery as a result of that. But it's so ironic that she chooses this moment to declare herself outside the love of God, outside the grace of God. Paul says in Romans 8.18, he says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. What I love so much about 8.18 is that he doesn't disavow the fact that we will be suffering or that there won't be difficulties in the present time. But he puts it in the balance and he says, if I can take all the things that I'll have to suffer in, in the life that God puts in front of me on earth and I can set them on one side of this scale and if it were possible this side of heaven to understand all of the riches and the glory that God has reserved for those who love him and put that on the other side of the scale, the scale would fall so hard like this, my attention would be fully devoted to the right side. I'd not even care to look at the left side any longer. What's lacking in our understanding so often is this right side. And I don't mean to suggest we can gain a full understanding. That's not the expectation. We merely have a trust, a confidence in the goodness of God and in the promises of God to know that he is more than capable of establishing for us an inheritance that will have the kind of weightiness Paul implies here. We can trust that. And so we can begin to push the scales this way in our own understanding, even before we see it. Naomi, she entered the land of Judah with her eyes down, so to speak, thinking of her circumstances, locked on her earthly situation. She didn't have her eyes up. She wasn't thinking about her heavenly position. Her situation was difficult, yes, but friends, there's a difference between mourning and bitterness. Naomi is bitter because she can't see past her circumstances. She needed to lift her eyes heavenward. She needed to consider what God was doing around her. That was the key. That's our challenge too. Look past the world, consider the one to come. This isn't a perspective, by the way, that you gain in a single sermon. You know, this isn't Vincent Van Peel. I can't write you a book this thin about the power of positive thinking and assume that with that in hand, you'll be fine and set to go. That that is not biblical. The way you reach the point in your walk as a Christian where people can die in your family, economically you can have devastation in your life, sicknesses can enter into your life, trials of persecution can come your way. The way you can absorb those things and continue in the joy of the Lord does not come because you will yourself out of that mindset. It comes only as a consequence of spiritual maturity. Spend time in God's Word. Consider the examples of the saints who have gone before you. Consider the example of the Lord. Consider these things in the Word. 
And let that influence your thinking. And the more that it influences your thinking, the less you will care about the world that is passing away. The more you will be able to understand the nature of the things that are persecuting or tri- giving you trial and keep them in their proper perspective. I'm not saying you won't be mourning, but you won't be bitter. There's a huge difference. Next time we turn to this chapter, we're going to look at it one last time through the verses I just covered. But now, considering Naomi and Ruth in the second story, as I call it. And you can already, I think, begin to see some of the pattern that we're going to return to. Naomi, as you know, the picture of Israel, how she leaves the land, how she returns to her land, and under the circumstances in which she returns. And then, now a new character to consider, Ruth, the Gentile, who has been attached to Israel, who has come and made themselves a part of a family of God, grafted in, as it were, and now is committed by covenant to remain within that fold. We'll talk about her as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. We have a time of prayer and and communion ahead of us to finish our service. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for the reminder of our confidence and our joy in you and not in this world. I ask that you would give us uh, eyes for eternity, spiritual insight, so that as we face things, we know that there there are circumstances that we dislike that are yet intended for good. And the good that they may propose for us, Father, may depend on how we respond. And so I ask, Lord, that you would um, give us a heart to do the right things under difficult circumstances. To mourn as mourning is needed, but not to, to, to turn that to bitterness, Father. To suffer as suffering is required, but not to be discouraged. To find joy even in our suffering, Father. What a, cont- what a contrary idea. What... What a strange idea to the world we live in, Father. And yet if our Master has shown us that it is profitable, then we as His servants can follow suit. We ask, Father, You give us the, give us the patience and the spiritual insight to see those moments in our own walk and to respond in the right way. And thank You, Father, for all of the majesty, the magnificent, magnificence and sovereignty of Your will demonstrated in the story of a of the book of Ruth, Father. For if you can orchestrate one family's life in this way over ten years, clearly, Father, you are at work in our everyday life. And I ask, Lord, you'd show us that as well so we can follow you clearly. Praying this in Jesus' name, Father. Amen. Dear Father, what a beautiful time to be in your house, Father, amongst those who know you. You you indwell our body, Father. The temple is the body, but we bring you uh, into our lives through to the practices of our faith, Father. For you're never away from us, but uh, we can get away from you. And we can forget you. And we can set aside following you and concerning ourselves with you. So uh, it's a good thing, Father, that we would take one day of the week at least and gather under a roof and call it a church and be mindful of you. I know you would prefer, Father, that we would think about you at every moment and that we would beware of your presence in our, our lives at every turn. And we long to do that, Father. We desire that we would have that kind of mind. That we pray, Father, you bring us there in due time. But in the meantime, Father, we put special significance on one day of the week and we put a special emphasis on gathering in this place because we love each other. We love the Spirit in us, Father, who who makes us one. And we love your Word. And we're just concerned, Father, for the world that doesn't know you. And we want to be better at representing you. Uh, and of testifying to you, of answering questions that people have, so that when we show them there, there are answers, that there is truth to be known, that that will call in their hearts, that will call them to, to want to know you better. And so, Father, that's how we want this time to go this morning. Preach through the mouth of a man, Father. Do it in your own power by the work of the Spirit. Don't let it be my words, Father. Let it be yours. Let the truth be self-evident, so that we would not be judged on the basis of how skilled I am, Father, but it would be seen and known to be true because you wrote it and because you provided it to us. And as we concern ourselves with it, Father, give us a, an honesty within ourselves to know whether we are living up to it or not. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So after a couple week break, I want to bring us back into the story of Ruth. Not the first story, as I call it, but the second story. And that is the story within the story of Ruth. Within this book, we read not only of a family in Israel in the time of Judges, but also a story of the nation of Israel 
And that nation's husband, spiritually speaking, Jehovah. So this second story is a poignant love story, much like the first one. In the case of the first story, you have two widows seeking security, seeking a provider, having been widowed. But in that story, you have a picture of another one, of another story, that of God's love for his chosen people and how God deals with Israel and ultimately with the church as well. Each week, we're studying one of these two stories. Last time we taught, I taught the second half of chapter one, looking at the primary story, that is of Naomi and Ruth and Orpah and so on. This time we're going to look at that same passage from the second side, from that of Israel and the Lord and a new character today, the church. I want to reread those verses, part of them anyway, so that we can remember what we looked at. We'll start in verse 7 again in chapter 1 and just read down through most of the end of the chapter. We read in verse 7 that Naomi, she departed from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her and they went on their way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return, each of you, to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. May the Lord grant that you may find rest, each in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, but we will surely return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return, my daughters. Why should you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb? that they may be your husbands? Return, my daughters, go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I said I have hope, if I should even have a husband tonight and also bear sons, would you therefore wait until they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is harder for me than for you. For the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. And they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. But Ruth clung to her, Then she said, Behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. Thus may the Lord do to me and worse if anything but death parts you from me or parts you and me. When she saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. So they both went until they came to Bethlehem. And when they had come to Bethlehem, all the city was stirred because of them. And the woman said, Is this Naomi? She said to them, Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi? Since the Lord has witnessed against me and the Almighty has afflicted me. I'm going to pause there. The next verse we'll cover is part of chapter 2. Today we're going to examine the prophetic story that's told by these events. Now, Naomi, as you just heard, lives in a day of sinfulness in the time of Judges. She has endured God's judgment while she's been outside the land. She's been in a time of drought and famine, and that's what caused her family to flee out of the land in the first place, into the land of their enemies, the Moabites. Those details, as you learned last time, picture the wife of Jehovah, that is Israel, judged by God for disobedience by scattering Israel into the land of their enemies, which took place after A.D. 70 and in earlier days as well. That scattering had the effect over time of reducing the number who are a part of Israel, bringing them misery, bringing them weakness. And as they remained outside their land for the better part of two millennia, the people of Israel have pined away until they were only a remnant, reduced greatly in number, from the prior days when they lived in peace and security in the land. That's the history of Israel for the last 2,000 years or so, which is a parallel to the scene that we see here in Ruth with Elimelech's family being only a fraction of its original size as they begin to return from the nations into their land. So we see in Naomi's story at the end of this chapter, the beginning of that change. We said earlier that they had been in the land of their enemies for about 10 years, and when we looked at that last time, we noted that the terms there of about 10 years is more than just an approximation of time. It's symbolically saying something about the nature of the events. Nine being the number of judgment, 10 being the number of testimony. They are about 10. That is to say they're between 9 and 10. They're ending judgment, and they're preparing to enter into a time of testimony. It's communicating God's purpose. That is to say, God had put Israel, or in this case Naomi's family, outside the land for a period of judgment 
as a response to the sin of the time, but it wasn't to their destruction. It would ultimately result in Israel being granted opportunity back in their land, and it would become a testimony to God's faithfulness that the nation would be restored at some point. And all of this is being pictured in Elimelech's family. All the details parallel with his family. Like Naomi, God promised Israel that he would regather survivors in a future day. And for the past 60 years of history, you and I have been privileged to watch that regathering taking place in the land of Israel today. In a sense, you could say you and I are living right now in chapter 1 of Ruth. We're watching the family of Israel, the forsaken wife of Jehovah, Scripture calls her, coming back into her land, seeking rest after a period of judgment spent outside the land. Now, back in that first story, we see Naomi returning to her land, a very different woman than the one who left originally with her husband Elimelech. First of all, she's a widow. Secondly, she has no sons. And in the days of this story and in the culture of the East, the plight of a woman under her circumstances was one of desperation, which we said last time. She would not be able to own property. She generally could not earn a living. She couldn't testify in court. These are all rules that applied to women in that day. And most importantly, the family name would only be carried forward by male heirs. So a woman without a husband or a son was like an orphan in that time. All land ownership rights in Israel would have naturally transferred through male heirs. So she is at the risk of losing her inheritance, losing her rights in the land. So she is a candidate for starvation in the way that this culture often works. So the family of this woman, Naomi, is literally at the end of the line. They're at the end financially. They're at the end socially. They're at the end emotionally. Her husband is gone. Both her sons are gone. So she has no hope to bring herself out of this hopelessness. So you can appreciate the plight of this woman in the way she says, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, which means bitter. Another example of this is found in Luke. In chapter 7 of Luke, Jesus comes across a woman who is under very similar circumstances. And in chapter 7, verse 11, we read this. Soon afterward, he went to a city called Nain, and his disciples were going along with him, accompanied by a large crowd. And as he approached the gate of the city, a dead man was being carried out. He is the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a sizable crowd from the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her, and he said to her, Do not weep. And he came up and touched the coffin, and the bearers came to a halt. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. This is a miracle proving his deity, but why did he pick this moment and that circumstance to raise somebody from the dead? It's because his compassion for this widow was much more than just a matter of her losing a son. It was the bleak financial future for her. She was a widow already, and now without a son, she had nothing. Which helps us understand why Naomi's decision to return to her land is happening now. She's driven primarily by a desire for rest, for security, for posterity, for rescue, something to take the burdens of widowhood off her shoulders and bring her back to a place of fullness. So then knowing Naomi's situation, what does that teach us about the second story, about Israel and about Jehovah? Well, amazingly, throughout the thousands of years that the people of Israel have been scattered across the globe, First, they have never ceased to maintain their identity. In the same way that Naomi has not become a Moabite as a source of rescue from her circumstances, neither has the nation of Israel ever disappeared from the planet. And there is no parallel in all anthropology. This does not happen. Israel remained distinct as a nation, though they had no country of their own and they were always living in someone else's land. This sort of thing, friends, just does not happen. Anthropologists cannot explain this in the case of Israel. A group of refugees may remain distinct while living in another land for a few generations, right? They may even maintain their language and some of their traditions for hundreds of years while they live in another land. That's not necessarily surprising. You can see this trend in cultural concentrations like Chinatown or Little Italy, these places that spring up inside larger cities to preserve the culture of some immigrant population. But friends, those groups are only able to survive in that way and maintain their identities because their homelands still exist. And therefore, they still provide a supply of new immigrants on a regular basis that go into those conclaves. 
If Italy didn't exist or China disappeared, Chinatowns and Little Italys would eventually disappear too. But Israel never had that. Israel didn't have a homeland. They didn't have a natural supply of new immigrants. They had been scattered in AD 70 and had no single source. And yet their identities have never been lost. Immigrants into larger societies always meld. They always assimilate into the larger culture. But Israel has never done this. They have no homeland for 2,000 years, and yet they remain distinct wherever they live. And that, friends, is a testimony to God preserving Israel as he has promised to do. And it goes even a step further in the case of Israel because they weren't just allowed to come in and join cultures. They found themselves routinely persecuted, systematically murdered for being Jews. And yet even then their identity survived. When all the pressure of the culture was to meld and to disappear, they persisted against all odds. God was keeping his promise to Israel to preserve them as a distinct people among their enemies. Ironically, that distinction was the very source often of their misery. But they maintained it ever since A.D. 70. And that strong identity, wherever they live, has caused them to be the target of persecution. But it also serves as a testimony that God is not done with his people. It would have been so much easier for Israel to just blend in, become part of the culture, and get along with everyone. But God didn't allow that to happen either. This is the life of Israel in her widowhood, as promised in Scripture. Living in the land of her enemies, God said, living as a foreigner, holding no true security, no true rest, and as a result, ultimately longing for their home. That's been the, the fate of Israel for 2,000 years, give or take. No matter how comfortable the Jewish people might have become living among other nations, that comfort was always temporary because eventually persecution reemerged. Eventually they lost their place of rest or security, like a widow in the lack of an inheritance, like someone like Naomi, who knew that she could find no rest in Moab. She had to return to Israel to her homeland. In 1948, everything changed for Israel. Jews the world over awoke on May 14, 1948, to the reality of a Jewish state on the earth again for the first time since A.D. 70. And immediately millions of Jews began making plans to return to that nation. They could finally rest from their enemies, or so they thought, and they could be at peace in their homeland, or so they dreamed. But they didn't return as the same people who left. They were reduced in number. They came in bitter from all the past persecutions, from all the loss, from all the suffering that had taken its toll over many years, the most recent of which, of course, had been World War II, which is what gave rise to the nation in the first place. 1948 was a direct result of some of the diplomacy that followed the war. They were all grieved and acting very much like Mara, as she calls herself. Reduced, pitiful, weak, dependent, but at least going home. She says, I went out full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. She acknowledges it is the Lord moving her both out and back. And at the same time, it is the Lord depriving her, at least to a degree. Like a widow, she returns, learning that there was an opportunity in Israel, glad to come back, but grieved and reduced in number. But more importantly for today, in our story, Naomi's not going back alone. In tow, originally, were the two Gentile daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth. And as we saw last time, Orpah, being an unbeliever, not believing in Jehovah, not believing in the God of Israel, but preferring the gods of the Moabites, she returns. She wouldn't make the trip. But the other Gentile, Ruth, attaches herself to Naomi. And as we saw last week, last time I taught, the attachment is a covenant. She makes a covenant with Naomi. Consider what Ruth's future held when she makes this covenant. As she thinks of going into Israel, what was in store for Ruth? Well, like Naomi, she's a widow. So she's looking for a security and a husband. But unlike Naomi, she's young enough to expect someone to take an interest in her and an opportunity to marry, to come along. But she's leaving her native land where she would have been free to marry anyone, presumably. And she's going to a foreign nation where the laws of that nation prohibit men from marrying her. She's literally not allowed to be married to anybody because the laws of Israel did not allow Jewish men to marry a Moabite. So Ruth's decision to accompany Naomi is crazy in light of her desire to be remarried. And as we learned last time, it was Naomi's God who had revealed himself to Ruth, which then caused 
to stir up a love for him in her heart to the degree that she was willing to attach herself to Naomi and to be part of that nation and that nation's God at the expense of a husband, if that were the case. That's quite a commitment. This attachment of Ruth, a Gentile to Naomi, a Jewish woman. That itself also pictures something that takes place in the church and with Israel. God knew that Israel, his wife, as he calls her, would depart from him and chase after other gods. We saw scripture in previous weeks in which he said that would happen. And so he forewarned Israel in the law that they would know a time of severe judgment for their unfaithfulness. But God also said he would turn this time of judgment into an opportunity for good for other nations. He would use Israel's judgment to extend grace to another group of people. We read it in Deuteronomy, just two verses. Deuteronomy 32, 20 and 21, he writes this through Moses. I will hide my face from them, meaning Israel. I will see what their end shall be, for they are a perverse generation, sons in whom is no faithfulness. They have made me jealous with what is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their idols. So I will make them jealous with those who are not my people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. The Lord said to Israel, you're going to provoke me with your idol worship. So I'm going to turn around and provoke you with a new relationship that I'm going to establish with a different people. Not you, but with someone else. That new relationship will have the effect of provoking, so to speak, the Jewish nation into a form of jealousy for what they lacked. So who is this foolish nation that the Lord has attached himself to in order to provoke Israel in their unfaithfulness? Well, look around. You're it. I'm it. The Hebrew word for nation in Deuteronomy is goy. And you may know that's the word for Gentile in, in Hebrew. So it's the Gentiles collectively which are this foolish nation that Israel is going to be made jealous by. So God said through Moses that he's going to establish a covenant relationship with Gentiles following a period of Jewish rebellion. He would use that relationship to create in Israel a longing to know him again, to have what they do not have. Jealousy for the relationship that he gives to the Gentiles. And God set out to create this opportunity among a group who would not have otherwise ever have known him. Isaiah 65 verse 1, he says this, I permitted myself to be sought by those who did not ask for me. Notice the actor, notice who's doing the action here. I permitted myself to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation which did not call on my name. A classic passage of scripture to emphasize God's sovereignty in the way men and women are called into the relationship. That's why Paul can say in Romans 3, there is no one who seeks for God, no, not one. The fundamental principle of scripture is that apart from God revealing himself to us, we would never have known him, we never would have even looked for him. But God in his grace and his mercy finds us. And God said to Israel, because you refuse to obey and, and worship me, I will go find another people for myself. Ruth, in the story of Ruth, represents a Gentile. She is Gentile. She represents Gentiles who come to know God because God comes seeking for them. And then how did that happen in the case of Ruth? Well, Ruth, from what we know, was... A Moabite woman living in Moab with no concept of Jehovah, no knowledge of him in any meaningful way, no interest in Israel or their gods. She's minding her own business in Moab. And what does God do? He sends a family to them, a family of men that obviously became her husband. And then from there, a relationship ensued. And at the end of it all, even though she no longer even has the husband that she started with, what's left is the spiritual relationship that God wanted her to have through Naomi, through the influence of that family. God says in Isaiah 55, verse 5 and 6, Behold, you will call a nation you do not know, and a nation which knows you not will run to you because of the Lord your God, even the Holy One of Israel. For He has glorified you. Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He is near. In that passage, Isaiah says, God will call a nation that the Jews do not know. And then he adds that this nation will run to Israel in order to have that relationship. That's the testimony of Scripture concerning you and I. In a sense, we have run to Israel in order to know Israel's God, just as Ruth has attached herself to Naomi so that she can know Israel's God. 
And in the same way that she attaches herself to Naomi, you may not have realized this, perhaps, but you and I, the Gentiles, have become attached to Israel in order to have access to Israel's God. How is that true? Well, you heard and believed in a gospel which centers on a Jewish Messiah, a man sent to Israel as a result of promises given to Israel by the God of Israel. Israel rejected that Messiah when he came as a part of God's plan, as God said it would happen. And now, in the interim, while we wait for Israel to eventually receive the Messiah, he has made opportunity available for the rest of us in an effort to provoke Israel's jealousy. So, you and I have been attached spiritually to Israel by way of the covenants God extended to them. Paul says this in Romans 11. Let me just read you Romans 11, 11 and 12. Paul says, I say then, they, meaning Israel, did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be. But by their transgression, that is their sin against God, he says, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel jealous. And then he says in verse 12, Now, if their transgression is riches for the world, and their failure is riches for Gentiles, well, how much more will their fulfillment be? Paul explains that God has set the Jewish nation aside just for a time in order to make the gospel available to you and I instead. And he says, if he was willing to set his own people aside so that you and I could have the glory of salvation, well then, how much more glory will it be when in the future God brings Israel to the fulfillment of what he promised them? And that's the expectation we have. That's the future we're looking for. If God can produce so much good from Israel's judgment, how much more good will he produce from their restoration? And then Paul explains later in that chapter of Romans how the church is attached to Israel as a function of our relationship to God. He says this in Romans 11:17. If some of the branches were broken off and you being a wild olive were grafted in among them and became partakers with them of the rich root of the olive tree, well, do not be arrogant toward the branches. But if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. Of course, he's using an analogy of an olive tree to represent two nations of people, Jews and Gentiles. And he says the tree of Israel was the origin of everything, the root. It's where the covenants came from. It's where God made promises. It's where the word of God came from. It's where the Messiah came from. Everything you can point to that attaches you to God, to salvation, to Christ, it all passes through Israel to get there. Israel's the root. He says, now that tree was pruned, so to speak, branches cut off and the like, for disobedience as a nation. And in the meantime, God is grafting in some foreign group of branches, you and I, into that root for a time. And we receive our nourishment, spiritually speaking, from Israel, from what God gave them, in other words. We owe our very spiritual life to the Jewish people in that sense, not individually to a person, but to the entity. But in the long term, God will eventually restore Israel as he has promised. We, meanwhile, benefit. And Ruth, going back to the first story, is a perfect picture of this. Ruth, in faith and love, recognized that this Jewish woman was her lifeline to a God that she has now come to know. In a sense, she's grafted into Naomi, and she's receiving her spiritual nourishment through Naomi, in the sense that it's through Naomi that she's come to know these things. And, friends, we're Ruth, in that sense. We're spiritually attached to Israel by our faith. As Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far off have been brought near to the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups, speaking of Jew and Gentile, both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God, through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So Paul says this, that the church and Israel are united by faith in a common God. 
Now, to be clear, Paul's not saying that the church and Israel are the same entity, or, for that matter, that the church replaces Israel in any sense. That's often taught, but it's not accurate to Scripture. Paul clearly teaches here and elsewhere that Israel remains distinct from the church, though we are one in our union with the same God, with Christ. Even as believing Jews are welcomed into the body of Christ today, nevertheless, the nation of Israel still remains on the earth today. One of the best pieces of evidence I could offer you, by the way, for the distinction between Israel and the church is the symbology in the story of Ruth itself. When Ruth comes to know and follow Naomi's God, do Ruth and Naomi merge into one single person in the story? Well, clearly not. Or for that matter, does Ruth replace Naomi in the story, pushing her out of the way, so to speak? No. The two remain distinct, but they remain united spiritually by faith and love for the same God. And I might add, in the course of this story, they both have two very different destinies in the story, though related, as does the church in Israel. For the Jew, the idea that the Gentiles share in the promises God gave to them, that poses a very difficult challenge for Jews, and especially did in the early church. You may remember, Jews prior to Christ long rejected the possibility that a Gentile ever had a share in the blessings of the kingdom. They were dogs, they were the lost, they were outside God's favor. There was never a possibility. You may remember that one moment where Jesus is teaching and a woman comes up to him, a Canaanite woman, and asks that she would have a healing and Jesus says something to the effect of it's not good that I should hand the things of God to dogs. He says that to test to find out what her true heart is. She responds with a a statement of faith. She says, even the dogs get the scraps that fall off the table. Her point was, I fully recognize you are the Jewish Messiah and that I am a Gentile. I fully recognize you were sent by God in fulfillment of promises made to the Jewish people, not made to me. But I also know from Scripture that it will be God's intention to bless all nations through those promises, not simply one nation. And I'm here to claim that promise. And Jesus said, you have a lot of faith, and he healed her. That's the relationship between the church and Israel, as you see reflected here. Gentiles attached to Jews, knowing that our source is through them. And they struggle with the concept that there was a plan all along for this. God has to step in and set them right. You may remember early in the church, some of the Jewish apostles struggled with the very concept that the gospel that they had been entrusted with was intended for Gentiles. At one point, the apostles gathered to decide as a group whether God truly intended to allow Gentiles to enter into the church. And in Acts 15, you read this. The apostles and the elders came together to look into this matter. And there had been much debate. Peter stood up and said to them, Brethren, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, testified to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did us also. And he made no distinction between us and them cleansing their hearts by faith. It's so funny for us now, it's so hard to actually consider now as we sit here today in the 21st century, that there was a time in the early church when the very apostles themselves were struggling with the idea that the church would have Gentiles in it. And yet, the church is primarily Gentile. That's how hard it is for Naomi to accept the idea that Ruth is attaching herself Did you catch that in the story? Did you notice that? As Naomi and Ruth are discussing, and Ruth says, I'll attach myself and I'll help you. Why is Naomi so resistant for a Jew to think that there's a place at all for a Gentile in the plan of God and in the blessings of God was a struggle? You notice there at the very end, verse 22, it says, Naomi returned, and with her Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, who returned from the land of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. I said at the beginning of today we would cover this as part of next time in chapter 2, and we will. What you need to know leaving the chapter today is that the events of their entry back into the land come with a backdrop of the barley harvest, a harvest time. A time of harvest sets up the events of chapters 2 through 4. When we go to looking at the second story of Ruth, that is the story of Israel and the church and God, We'll move out of this period of regathering, which I just said is our current day. Today we basically live in chapter 1 of Ruth, prophetically speaking. 
When we enter into chapter 2 and beyond, we enter into a time of harvest. And if you are a a student of Scripture, particularly the New Testament parables that Jesus teaches, you may be hearing in the back of your head a little ring going off thinking harvest. Harvest is often used as a picture in Scripture of something, isn't it? The harvest time, the reaping of something, the separating of the wheat from the tares and the like. And if you're thinking that, you should be. Because it sets us into a certain time frame prophetically as we move into chapters 2 and beyond. That of a time in which harvest will take place and what will come of the two entities in the time of the harvest. That's where we're headed in this story. That's why I said that Ruth is a story of eschatology prophetically. Even as it tells the beautiful story of a woman being redeemed from her widowhood. We'll come back to that next week. Let's go to prayer. We'll have a time of corporate prayer as I finish and then we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for our day of of doctrine and and the depths of your word. I know sometimes, Father, a Sunday is a time of exhortation or encouragement, or sometimes it's uh, a time in which we're reflecting on our individual lives. And then sometimes, Father, we simply sit at your feet and we learn. Sometimes, Father, it's, it's best that we just pay attention to where you're going and to the way you've worked in the past and the plans you have for the future, for it does... So good for our souls, Father, to understand you're in control and that there's a huge plan going on around us. And yet, in your love, you decided to make us a part of it. That we didn't seek you, that you sought us. And that in the depths of our worst days, when we're living in our flesh, when the world is persecuting us, when things aren't going our way, we can rest, Father, knowing that by faith alone we have already been saved. And that by your mercy, by your providence, by your wisdom, you've put us on a path that's leading somewhere. And we don't have to know the way. We just have to trust you. And if you can take Ruth and Naomi and move their lives thousands of years ago in ways that reflect perfectly your plan for the ages, well then, Father, truly, what else could you not do? I mean, is there any reason, Father, for us to worry? Is your hand incapable of meeting our needs or of solving our concerns. No, Father, we know that that everything lies in your control. Just help us to remember that as we may face struggles and as we may go through challenges, Father. We know that you're in control. And we thank you for that. We thank you, Father, that by your mercy you have brought us into promises you gave to other people and that you've taken your own people and set them aside for a time because you loved us. Let us love them in return, Father, as we love the the mission you've given us to reach the world. And let us do that diligently as we wait for your return. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, thank you, Lord, for Ruth and for the story of this woman and of her family. Thank you, Father, for, for calling and, and enabling this family to do remarkable things in a time in which men were doing what was right in their own eyes. Thank you, Father, for the reminder that you can work even in the darkest of times and in the, the least likely of circumstances. And I thank you, Father, that in all the books of the Bible we have been given this small and and such a a sweet, precious story so that we can understand that you are not just a God of the big things and of uh, mighty works and a God of of ends and beginnings, but, Father, you're also a God who is uh, quiet and attentive to the needs of one woman who lived in a very dusty, distant place in a time long ago. You were there even then, Father, thinking of just her and turning her small life into something big for our sake in a story of things much grander than things of her day. We remember these things, Father. We're seeing seeing these things in Scripture because each of us, Father, toil away in our own lives in ways that can be uh, obscure, can be frustrating, perhaps even unsatisfying. Father, even as a believer, we may find ourselves robbed of our joy from one way or another. And Lord, yet we can remember that you're not far. You have always been with us and will be. And that like a story like Ruth tells us, Father, even in the, in the days when we feel like we're, we're dry, there's nothing there. You're there. And you'll bring us to where we're to be. We thank you, Father, for that faithfulness. And we pray that you would offer us that same hope today in the scriptures as we read the story of, of Ruth in chapter 2. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go back into chapter 2 now, chapter 2 of Ruth. That's where we pick up this morning. I hope you guys are following and tracking what we've been doing here without too much confusion. The story and then the story within the story and the way we're weaving the two together. And if you haven't noticed, I'm taking an every other week 
approach to this. So on the odd weeks, that is the one, three, five, and so on, the odd weeks we're doing the first story, that is Ruth, in the traditional sense of what you see on the page. And then in the even weeks, we're doing the second story of eschatology that's hidden in this book, the story of Israel and the church and of the end times. And if you haven't been counting, you're on an odd week this week. So we're starting chapter 2 with the first story of Ruth. So after nearly 10 years spent outside the land, Naomi is now back in Bethlehem or in the area of Judah. She's come back a widow. She's bitter. She's fragile. She's desperate. Her family plot of land that she had had prior to leaving, that land has now been abandoned for the better part of 10 years, so it's probably overrun with weeds, it's not producing any income, it's not producing any food, so really she has nothing, even among the things that would legally be hers, they are very little value to her right now. And in contrast to all that bitterness, the land around her is enjoying a renewed kind of strength. The famine has ended, people are harvesting, we're told, we've come into this at the end of chapter 1, we learned that... It was the beginning of the barley harvest time. Now, the barley harvest in Israel happens in around the April time frame. So this is a springtime harvest. And so after a period of drought and famine, once again, life seems to be good for those who are living in the land. All for except Naomi and Ruth, who have found their way, found their way back and now find themselves as survivors without a provider in a land of plenty. So despite being poor widows together, these two women are actually on somewhat different paths. You can almost say that they're opposites right now because Naomi, on the one hand, is mourning the loss of her husband, her family, her sons. She has no prospect of a recovery. She has no real prospect of a husband again. She's in mourning and in desperation. On the other hand, though, you have Ruth. She's excited. She's excited to know the true living God, the God of Israel, the Jewish God that she never would have known otherwise, and to become part of the Jewish people and to have access to God through them. She has had nothing by comparison in her prior life in Moab, and now she has access to even greater things, everything if you think in terms of eternity. So as you enter into chapter 2, I want you to look at how these two women are responding to their life in the land, one of bitterness, one of hopefulness, despite having the same earthly set of circumstances. Ruth chapter 2, verse 1. Now Naomi had a kinsman of her husband, a man of great wealth of the family of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after one in whose sight I might find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. So she departed and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the portion of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. So chapter 2 introduces or opens here by introducing us to the next major character in the story, Boaz. And as the text says twice in that short passage, he's a kinsman or a relative of the family of Naomi. That's the key feature of this man. He is a kinsman, not just a, a man of great wealth, not just a landowner, but he is a man who has a special relationship to the two women in this story. So apparently what Naomi has done in traveling back into Judah, she's come back to the general area of her family's inheritance, probably intentionally, knowing this is among friends and family. After all, she's destitute. She has no prospect of finding a husband. So her only hope here is that perhaps somebody in her distant family would find pity on her and do something to help her out of charity. Boaz means, there's some debate about it, but it can mean swift strength or it can mean quickness as in readiness to serve. He's called a kinsman, but that's a technical term. It doesn't just mean he's a family member or a relative. The term kinsman describes someone who is eligible, according to Jewish law, to perpetuate Elimelech's family line. And we'll speak more about that in coming weeks. For now, just know that he has a special relationship to these women. And as I said already, he's wealthy, which is also useful because it means he's the ideal candidate within the family to assist two women who need help. So these two women enter into the land of Elimelech's family, and as they do, they're naturally focused on their basic needs. Try to put yourselves in their heads for a moment as you think about what was ahead of these two women. Like Maslow's famous hierarchy of needs, these women had to attend to food and to protection before all else entered into their mind. And the need for food is obvious, right? You've got to eat. They have no source of income. They have no way to produce their own food. So they've got to find some way to eat. But secondly, they've got to find a source of protection. And for, I think, the women in this room, I assume this is something that you already 
would have imagined, but maybe not for the men as much. Sometimes men, I think we forget just how vulnerable women are in certain circumstances. And just as is the case today, two women living on the streets, literally, or in fields in this case, were very vulnerable. Can you imagine how terrified they must have felt in the middle of the night anytime they heard someone moving, men coming their way, walking through the fields or whatever? Who knew what lay around the corner for these two women? That would have been an ever-present concern. So, in those circumstances, Ruth, being the younger, takes the initiative. And in keeping with the promises she made to Naomi back in Moab, she is going to go find a way to provide for both of them. That was her commitment to Naomi, to be there with her, to take care of her. And under these circumstances, they really only have one choice, and that would be to beg for assistance. And so Ruth asks Naomi's permission to go glean, that is to collect the fallen stalks of grain that are found in fields at harvest time. The Lord in his mercy made a provision in the law given to Israel for widows and for strangers, the term is, for people who had need like these two women. The Lord said to Israel that when they went out to harvest in their fields during the spring or the winter harvest, they were to go out in a particular way to ensure that the needy had some form of provision. Those who didn't have their own land, those who didn't have any opportunity to farm. And more importantly, it was a means of providing for these people in an honorable way, in a way that preserved their dignity. It goes like this. A couple places you can find it, but just, for example, one in Leviticus chapter 19, we hear this, 19.9. Now, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the very corners of your field, nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest, nor shall you glean your vineyard, nor shall you gather the fallen fruit of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the needy and for the stranger. I am the Lord your God. Harvesting is a multi-step process in the way it was done, particularly then when it was done manually. First, men would go out in the field with these long, real long stick, like you ever seen the guy that's the Grim Reaper? He's carrying one of these. Why? Because the image of harvesting has been used since the oldest time of writing as a metaphor for when God collects the souls of people off the earth. So the Grim Reaper is reaping the souls of men, as it were. But anyway, reaping starts with this scythe, and it's just a long stick with a curved, sharp blade at the end. And as you can probably already imagine, you just swing these things in an arc as you move through the grain, cutting down the stalks of grain, and they lay flat as they get cut down. Behind the ones who are reaping, you have the gleaners, those who would come along and collect all of the stock that's now laying down ready to be picked up. They bundle them. They carry these bundles to a threshing floor, a hard surface where the fruit is separated from the chaff by the treading of usually oxen or something heavy. Finally, the grain now separated has to be winnowed from all of the chaff lying around it. So they pick it up in, in baskets and they throw it up in the air. They do this in the evening when the evening winds pick up in the desert. And that wind just pulls the chaff away and the seed falls right back down and they collect the seed. Right? That's harvesting. Multi-step process. It's a time of celebration. It goes on over a period of a week or two. People end every night with a feast. It's a big time of celebration as you harvest and you work the field. So that's the, the general approach. In Leviticus... God directed that those in Israel who would be collecting the grain should do it in an intentionally sloppy way. Sloppy from our point of view, that is. That as the men cut down the stalks, think of it just geometrically, they're swinging this side in a circular fashion because that's the natural motion. You know, you, you don't go like this. You just move in an easy back and forth way, which creates an arc with each pass. And so as you reach the corner of land, their swing is typically going to leave behind a triangular section of uncut stock. Now, if you're really intent on getting every last grain, you can get in there and you know, cut the, the last stuff down. But the law says don't do that. The law says take your ark and move on and leave the corners uncut. And it goes further than that. It says even when you do cut, as those come behind you and gather, they're not going to gather every last little stalk. They're going to miss a few. You're just gathering quickly. And he says leave behind the ones that you don't pick up. In other words, don't be too careful about getting every last stock. Leave some stuff behind for the needy or for the stranger. The stranger referred to anyone who was just sojourning in the land of Israel, someone who was not of Israel, who did not have ownership in the land, therefore they didn't have their own land to farm. They were just passing through, but they needed food. Someone like Ruth, for example, would be a stranger. And then the needy referred to anyone who was of Israel, but they had need due to unfortunate circumstances, I mean, circumstances like widowhood. Someone like Naomi. So it's interesting that the Lord commanded the people to leave the grain 
not just those that had fallen and weren't picked up, but he specifically says, leave some that is also standing in the corners, in other words. Why? You know, he didn't say harvest everything, take every last thing, and then make sure you give 10% to the needy. He didn't say that. The point was to make sure that the needy and the stranger don't suffer humiliation in the process of receiving a handout. That instead he commanded that the needy be given opportunity to go out into the field and harvest for themselves. To do some measure of work in payment, if you will, for what they were receiving. They were permitted to harvest for themselves. They had the dignity of work. Even though they're harvesting in someone else's field, even though it's not what they planted, in a sense, you could say they were hired workers for that day and they were receiving the fruit of their own labor. Their pay was the food they got to eat that day. This is exactly what Ruth is hoping to do. And that's why she says to Naomi, may I go out and use this opportunity to collect food for both of us. She must know the custom. In fact, I would imagine that Naomi probably explained this to her as they talked on the way back from Moab. What are we going to do when we get there? What's our provision? What's our plan? Well, there's a little law in Israel that lets us have something. This is what it's going to require. Are you ready to work in the field? Now, this is no small step of faith because, remember, this is the time of judges. We've said this on many occasions. This is when people were doing what was right in their own eyes. And it was possible, and I might maintain it was likely, that the Jews in this day would have ignored Leviticus 19 every bit as much as they were ignoring all manner of other law, which we've studied in the book of Judges, right? And so there's a serious step of faith here on Naomi and Ruth's part to go back into a land assuming that their brethren are going to observe this law for their own sake. Because everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes means many people were probably taking every last stalk of grain. Back in verse 2, Ruth asked Naomi, can I begin? Naomi gives her agreement. I think she probably asked permission because she knew she was taking a risk even in this maneuver. Because she's taking a risk in going out in the fields by herself. Naomi's taking a risk by letting her go and then by the same measure remaining alone in the field by herself. These two women are splitting up. If they were ever vulnerable together, they're twice as vulnerable apart. But they have to separate if they're going to survive. So she sets out and follows the reapers. Now as a Moabitess, Ruth obviously knows no one else in Israel except Naomi. So from the point of view of of Ruth, as she sets out on this mission, she doesn't know where she's going. She doesn't know anyone. She has no reason to pick one field over another. From her point of view, it's just random, right? She's just looking for an opportunity, and if one runs out in one field, she'll pick up and move and go to the next field. It's hard work. You're out all day. You're exposed to the sun. She doesn't have water. She doesn't have anybody caring for her. This is seriously difficult work. But by the providence of the Lord, Ruth finds her way, as chance would have it, to the field of Boaz. Now, from Ruth's point of view, as I said, this is just another field. The writer says in verse 3 that she happened happened into Boaz's field. Now, the writer is not saying that this is an accident or that it wasn't according to God's purpose. The writer is not writing from God's point of view. He's writing from Ruth's point of view. Ruth herself did not know what she was doing, which makes God's providence all the more prescient. Because it's saying, even when she didn't know what she was doing, God was in control, moving her to where he knew she needed to be. As she sets about working, then the master of this field happens to come home. Verse 4. Now behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, May the Lord be with you. And they said to him, May the Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his servant, who was in charge of the reapers. Whose young woman is this? The servant in charge of the reapers replied, She is the young Moabite woman who returned with Naomi from the land of Moab. And she said, Please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. And thus she came and has remained from the morning until now. She's been sitting in the house for a little while. All right, our first introduction to Boaz. And we learn a lot about this man, even in just those few verses. First, we know that he comes from Bethlehem, and as he enters his estate, he immediately takes notice of this young woman gleaning in the field. Now, harvesting was a fairly sizable operation. You would have had a lot of people in the field. And not everyone would have been someone that Boaz would have known necessarily. This isn't necessarily the only stranger in his field. There would have been other poor collecting, probably, if not beyond all his servants, of course. But this woman catches his eye. And it's the combination of him taking notice of her and even the very timing of his arrival that further testifies to the Lord's hand in all of these circumstances. I mean, think about it. 
On the very day that Ruth happens into Boaz's field, Boaz happens to arrive back from Bethlehem at that very moment and then notices her among all the people that were already in the field. Look, you can believe in chance and circumstance or you can believe that the Lord's in control. One requires more faith. That's the first one. Because this is so clearly evidently something God is at work doing. Every detail of the story is pointing us to the Lord's hand. And as Boaz returns home, he greets his servants, as it says here, by the saying of, May the Lord be with you, to which they reply something very similar. What do you make of that, if anything? You may not even take notice of it. Don't overlook it, though. Remember, this story is set in the time of Judges, once again. In this day and age, people of Israel were not, generally speaking, thinking of the Lord. We saw that clearly when we studied the book of Judges, right? So, to have a man, during this time... Greeting even his servants in this way tells us something about his character. Boaz is a godly man. And I can say that on the basis not only of the overall story, which you'll see it for yourself soon enough, but even just in this little passage. This is a man whose mind is directed toward the Lord and toward the Lord's will. These are not throwaway lines. Even if that may be the case for us today, the Lord be with you, whatever, even if we are using them without much thought, don't assume that that was a common way for people to use such language in their day. To speak of the Lord, to speak of Yahweh without thought was sacrilegious. To do it without concern for what you were saying would have been very unholy. They were very concerned with the use of God's name and of, of any greeting like this. It carried weight. It meant something. It's a detail that is strikingly in contrast with everything else we studied about the time of Judges. The hypocrite will display piety only before men of privilege or wealth or power. They'll, they'll speak in one way to one audience and then they'll up their game when they need to in front of an audience that they want to ingratiate themselves to. Because in doing so, they want to make an impression and they want to take some advantage out of that situation, right? But the rest of the time, the hypocrite will just revert back to their true nature, lording over the poor, taking advantage of the weak, speaking in unholy ways, being ungracious, and so on. But as soon as they meet the right person, they'll, they'll change, right? They're the chameleon. But a truly godly man or woman will practice their godliness even before the lowest of their culture. As James tells us in James 1.27, Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. James says that true religion, and to be technical, religion here means worship of God. True worship of God is seen in serving the underprivileged. And do you understand why? If your heart is directed at people like widows and orphans, these are people who have nothing to give you in return. If you serve them, you have zero prospect of anything good coming back in human terms, right? They can't give you money. They can't give you power and prestige by association. They can't grant you some kind of access to things you want. They are powerless by definition in the culture. But if you make them your point in ministry, what purpose could you have in serving them except love for God? That's what true religion... He's not saying that's the only way you can express true religion. He's using them as the poster children, so to speak, of what true faith and worship looks like. Serving someone for no reason except love of God. Why take time to invest in their lives? Because you love God. So when Boaz turns his attention to Ruth, this poor Moabite widow, a stranger, gleaning in his field, you see him practicing true, undefiled religion, as James describes it. And that detail, together with his greeting, in which he's willing to speak words of blessing even to his servants... Those two details together tell you a lot about this man's character. This is just the sort of man Ruth and Naomi need. Boaz's servant goes on to explain that Ruth was the Moabitess that was related to Naomi and came back with her and so on. And then he goes on to explain, you know, this woman's been here all day. She's been working here from the beginning of the day of work, even until now, which means she arrived early, she worked hard throughout the hottest part of the day, and only now has she taken refuge for a time in the house. And the servant's report of Ruth tells us something about Ruth's character also. She's a woman of high character. You know, she's destitute. She's seeking the generosity of strangers. But nevertheless, that doesn't stop her from seeking some way to bless those that she's wanting help from. She works hard for their support. She doesn't expect assistance to just fall on her lap like she's entitled to it because she's poor. Remember, she had the law on her side. You could argue that she had no reason to work any harder than necessary. She should just be able to show up in the land and you know, pick a few things up and go home. 
I mean, to what benefit is it to her to work any harder than needed? Well, nothing except that she recognized that her duty in response to what she was getting was to bless those who would be giving her what they gave her. Boaz, in other words. To bless them by working hard. Her character is a perfect complement to Boaz's character. And by complement, I mean Boaz, on the one hand, is an example of someone who displays godliness in times of plenty, in situations of strength. Where Ruth is a woman who in need yet sought for assistance with an attitude of industriousness and faithful service. So he was blessed with much, yet he approached the needs of others with compassion. She was godly in her evident desire to bless others in return for charity. You can see it both sides. You know, there's no reason for someone in wealth to be any less godly than someone in poverty or vice versa. The attitude should be exactly the same. From what I have, I seek to bless those who have little. From what I need, I seek to bless those who can supply to me. Paul says it this way in 2 Thessalonians 3.10. He says, For even when we were with you, we used to give you this order that if anyone is not willing to work, then he should not eat either. Pretty hard words, isn't it? He goes on to say, For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, just acting like busybodies. Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in a quiet fashion and eat their own bread. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary of doing good. You see how he puts those two together, even in that admonition? He had one group primarily in view, yes, but he doesn't let that lack of industriousness on the part of the needy give cause for the rest to look down on them or to fail in doing good for them. We can't use one person's sin as an excuse for our own. He goes on to say, If anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that person and do not associate with him so that he will be put to shame. Yet, do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. I love the combination in Scripture. Hold people accountable, but don't malign them. Don't turn your back on them. Let's just work to get something good out of that. Situation. So, anyway, back in the story, Ruth's disciplined, hard-working attitude is evidence of her godly character. And this is an attractive quality for a man like Boaz. And, you know, don't overlook the fact that who you are before you get married will have a lot to say about who you marry. Boaz's interest in Ruth have to go far beyond her physical attractiveness. If he's intrigued by her at all, it's probably by her work ethic, by her character. A man of high character will seek a woman of high character, and I think vice versa most of the time. And if your character is wanting, yet you have high regard for someone else, you might want to up your game to get ready for them, even before you know who they are, for the younger ones here who might be in an eligible age. There's an issue of matching yourself in all respects to your prospective mate. You may remember Boaz's mother from Scripture, Rahab. You know that name? She was the Gentile woman who helped the spies as they entered the land under Joshua in the city of Jericho. And she was also, like Ruth, a Gentile woman who ultimately sought refuge under the God of Israel in Israel. Her life was spared as a result of that, and she was welcomed into the family of Israel. And she had a son. He is Boaz. So it's interesting that he would have come across a woman named Ruth, and then he should be equally gracious in light of how his own family came to enter into the land. I mean, if you think about it, Boaz is a Jewish man of wealth and power because a Gentile woman was brought in by grace to the nation of Israel. And so he looks upon another Gentile woman, one with admirable qualities, and he must have been thinking a little of his own family and wondering maybe if this was his opportunity to do something similar. So he gives his servants particular instructions. Look at verse 8. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Listen carefully, my daughter. Do not go to glean in another field. Furthermore, do not go on from this one, but stay here with my maids. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap, and go after them. Indeed, I have commanded the servants not to touch you. When you are thirsty, go to the water jars and drink from what the servants draw. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your sight, that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? Boaz replied to her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law after the death of your husband has been fully reported to me, and how you left your father and your mother in the land of your birth, and came to a people that you did not previously know. May the Lord reward your work, and your wages be full from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. Then she said, I have found favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and indeed have spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I am not like one of your maidservants. It's a tender moment, isn't it? 
Great moment. Boaz approaches Ruth after he's spoken to the servant. Apparently they're still in the house. This is where she's seated in the house. He approaches her and he says, My daughter. That term is a tender way to address a young widow like Ruth. Now she's vulnerable. She's probably concerned that someone's going to take advantage of her. I wouldn't doubt that she's in the house maybe for protection as much as rest. And here you have the master of the house. This is the guy with all the power who shows up and calls her daughter. Now, in this context, it does not mean literally that he's adopting her. What it means is he's referring to her like a woman who is employed, like a maidservant would be called, a daughter in the larger sense of someone under his care and protection. So he's placing Ruth under the protection of the house of Boaz. He's telling her, remain in the house, follow my gleaners, work in my fields, don't look elsewhere for your provision. He's saying, I will ensure that you find all your needs met in my house. It's a promise of provision. Secondly, he tells her, no one's going to touch you. That is, no one's going to harm you. This is the first anti-sexual harassment policy, and it's found in the Bible. For all of the world thinks it's so smart about these things. The Lord was doing this long before in the hearts of godly people. Boaz probably was not expecting, I assume, that his servants were going to attack Ruth in the field, because I don't think that Boaz would have employed such men routinely, but... On the other hand, you never quite know what someone's going to do, and he couldn't be sure of everyone who was in this field anyway. So at the very least, in case anyone was inclined, Boaz has put everyone on notice, don't even think about it, because I'm watching. The main point of his comment is to reassure Ruth. It's a promise of protection. And then finally, Boaz says to Ruth, you can draw water with the servants. In fact, he says, you can go get the water out of the jars that they've already drawn and filled. You know, access to water in a dry, dusty land of Judah, that's a particular importance, a particular need. Someone like Ruth would likely have been forced to find her water in open pools on the ground, perhaps maybe a stream if one were available. Such water is likely to be dirty. Waterborne illnesses was an ever-present concern for the poor, for someone in her situation. Finding clean water was a challenge, and if she could... Find a well, then you have the the back-breaking labor of taking a bucket, lowering it, and pulling up the heavy weight of water just to get a simple drink. This is not a trivial thing for her to be able to have water right out of the jars. Clean water, routinely available, filled by someone else for her benefit. Not only is she going to have ready access to it, but she doesn't even have to do the work to get it. More importantly, she has living water, which is the Jewish term for fresh water. It's a promise of privilege in the home. So Boaz has stepped into the desperate life of a Gentile widow and has given her promises of provision, protection, and privilege. And the receiving of these things stuns Ruth, as you can tell. She bows in respect, and she asks the question that many of us have probably asked in our own context, how could she have found favor? She says, how did I find favor in Boaz's sight? The word for favor in Hebrew is chen, which you may know is also translated grace. It's the question we always ask that literally has no answer. You cannot answer the question, how come I have found grace? You're asking the reason for something that by definition has no reason. Unmerited favor, undeserved favor, which means you cannot trace it to something you've done, which means you cannot say, how did I get it? Except to simply ask it in a rhetorical fashion, so as to emphasize that I could never have had this, but for the fact that you were willing to give it to me. And for no reason of my own have I received it, but strictly because of your mercy and your grace, your, your favor. Ruth asks, why do you show me this kind of undeserved kindness? And Boaz has an answer. Don't misunderstand me. There is an answer here, but it's not the cause. He answers her by saying, I, I've heard these things about you. I know that your testimony precedes you here. What you've done for Naomi, what you've done for her family. What you sacrificed in order to take care of a relative. And that's another piece of this, by the way. Naomi is a relative of Boaz. So... This act of sacrifice alone would have been worthy of some recompense, wouldn't you think? I mean, you've gone out of your way to take care of one of my family members. I should do something for you. But Boaz is not making his cause for his kindness that fact. That's the reason he took note of her. What was the cause? He's even more impressed, he says, by Ruth's commitment to join to a people that she did not know and a God who was not her God. He points to Ruth's choice to seek refuge under the wings of the God of Israel and says, that is the cause for your reward. May the Lord reward you in full, which is a way of implying, I'm doing my part, but the God that you've come to will do even more. In other words, Boaz is acting on behalf of the Lord to bring rewards to a child of God made so by faith. 
Finally, Ruth comes to understand that Boaz is serious. This is truly happening, and she acknowledges that. She says, I receive your favor, and I'm amazed to have it, and that she's comforted by what he's doing. And then she embraces the new position. She refers to herself as a maidservant. You might say she owns it. But then she says, nevertheless, I know I'm not like your other maidservants. What she's saying is, I'm mindful of the fact that I'm an outsider who's been brought into the home. I'm not a natural member of this home. In humility, she recognizes what the master here is doing is beyond even what would be expected. Her humility is magnifying his mercy and kindness. The fact that she was not of the home but being treated like she's in the home makes Boaz look all the better for what he's done, which is exactly the point. She's honoring him with that statement. The Lord has united a Jewish, godly master with a Gentile, godly Moabite in the midst of an otherwise ungodly culture, and he's done it by means of his grace. It doesn't take much effort to see yourself in this story, does it? I mean, just in the symbolism of what we're watching happen here, right? As we dive deeper into the story in coming weeks, you're going to come to understand even better that Boaz is a picture of Christ in this story, if you didn't already know that. But even now, you can recognize that Boaz's favor, his grace, bestowed upon Ruth, a Gentile, is a beautiful representation of Christ's grace given to each of us, Gentiles, in the body of Christ. We were strangers to God. We were, in a sense, working in the fields of the world, our heads down, Just getting by, not paying attention to anything except what we needed to get out of the field that day. We weren't looking for the Lord. We weren't looking for God. We didn't know who He was. And then one day, the Lord took notice of us. That's an important detail in this story. Who found who? Who came to who? Who discovered who? Who took note of who? It's Boaz taking note of Ruth. It's Boaz going to Ruth. It's Boaz offering grace to Ruth. And bringing her into the family. Ruth never made a motion in that direction whatsoever. She's sitting there, doing nothing as it were. And how did the two come to meet? What was the instrument that brought the two together? Well, in the story, it's the servant. You notice, even though Boaz noticed Ruth from a distance, he goes to his servant first and he asks, tell me a little about this lady. And it's really the servant who introduces them, if you think about it. And any time in scripture that you see a servant unnamed, and you notice there's no name given to this servant. Anytime you see that, or many times when you see that, it means the servant is the picture of the Holy Spirit. The unnamed actor, behind the scenes, working to make things happen. That's why he's left unnamed, to create that mystery so that we see it as a picture of spirit. And in this case, that servant, the Spirit of God, brought us to a knowledge of Christ. Introduced us, if you will. Where before we were strangers, Christ now joins us to the house of God, making us his adopted children or servants. And in the course of that new relationship being formed by means of the Spirit, several things come our way immediately, without us lifting a finger. First, we receive promises of provision, now and in the kingdom. And secondly, he promises us protection, first and foremost from the penalty of sin, And from the power of death, and ultimately from all things that could harm us, right? Paul says that neither life nor death, nor this or nor that nor that, can separate us from the love of God. There's a protection there that transcends anything of the creation. And then finally, he grants us privilege. Jesus says, I've called you my servants, now I call you my friends. He says, you're adopted sons and daughters of the living God. You've been made one in Christ. There's this privilege of identity that comes now because of our faith in Christ. And through it all, he gives us living water, the spirit that lives in us. He does all these things before we've even opened our mouth to acknowledge him. Did you notice that? Before Ruth even says one word to Boaz, he has put all these things in place. He bestowed upon her the things of his grace. He lifted her up. He granted her favor. And the best thing she could do in response was to bow down and worship him and to acknowledge there was grace at work. Now, as we come to the end of this section and we look forward into coming weeks of study, there's still a question now. The question is, well, this is all fine and dandy. Ruth seems to have her life in in good order. But what about Naomi? What about the poor woman back in the field right now? How is she supposed to enjoy some of these same benefits now that Ruth seems to have found the person who cared for her? Well, that's still to be decided. And then also, what about our second story? What do these events say about that underlying story of the end times, about Israel and the church and so on. Well, we want to study that as well. That'll be our second story as we come back to this next time. 
Let's go to prayer and then a finishing up with a time of corporate prayer to finish up our service. Dear Father, I thank you, Father, that you uh, remind us of, of grace and of your favor. Thank you for a, for a man like Boaz who would give Ruth what she needed when she didn't know him so that we can see just how much we did receive from Christ before we had even noticed that he was a part of our life. We're still catching up to that story, Father, each in our own way. We're still trying to understand what it is you've given us and live in the light of it. But one thing is true, Father, whether we understand it or whether we live in it, it's been granted to us. By faith, we have come to know you. And nothing in this world is going to separate us from the love that you've shown us in Christ. For if it could be separate, if we could be separated, Father, I dare say none of us could survive. I dare say very much am mindful, Father, of my own sin at times, as we all are, I know. And, and yet that sin, Father, has been dealt with on the cross so that what we know now is only you. What you see in us is only your own righteousness. And so, Father, thank you for that reminder of grace. Keep us in this story, Father. Keep our hearts attentive to it. Let us come back week to week and let us see the, the rest of it play out. Teach us as only you can. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity to serve in this small church. Thank you for the men and women who are serving. And for those who have come, Father, to hear and to, and to be served. And perhaps one day, Father... We'll turn around and serve as well, Father. That's the pattern we all know so well. Seasons in our life when we have been called into faith, called to receive, called to learn, called to grow, and then when the timing is right, Father, you'll give us the opportunity to take all that we've received and uh, pour it back into someone else's life as we serve in what we've been given. And that, that cycle, Father, of receiving and serving others is exactly what you've called us to do in in glorifying the name of Christ and in, in among the nations so that as they see our love for one another and as they see our service and our heart for, for you and for your people, that that would inspire perhaps in some, Father, a desire to know more and to be a part of what you bring uh, together by your Spirit. We thank you, Father, for the blessing that it is to be part of a community like this community. I also thank you, Father, for um, granting us the service and wisdom of teachers. Uh, I am but just one in a line of people, Father, that you have brought into this church over several decades now. Men and women who have a heart to know and to teach your word, to handle it rightly, to concern themselves with what it says. And uh, not just in the teaching of it, Father, but more importantly, in the living of it. And sometimes, Father, when you sit in something for a long time, you get the benefits of something for a long time, they, it starts to become the norm. It starts to become something you can take advantage of, take, take for granted, perhaps even overlook. Father, I just ask that in, in the way you stimulate our hearts and desires, Father, that you would never let it become just an everyday experience, that every time we have the privilege to sit at your feet and listen to your word taught, Father, let it be something important in our hearts too, so that the moment uh, is something that we should cherish. And I ask, Father, that like every moment, that you would let this morning be one of those times where we would not... Take for granted that we listen to the word of God. For many have longed to do so, Father. And many have not had the chances we've had. And uh, all the more reason, Father, why we should be thinking of how we can take what we've learned and put it to work. And let that be the result this morning as well. As we go into your word this morning, Father, we ask the Spirit would teach us, as he always does. And that our hearts would be prepared to hear it. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning we're turning back now into the hidden story of end times, which is found in the book of Ruth. Last time we studied the first part of chapter 2, looking at it for its first story, as I call it, that story of Ruth and Naomi, and then a new character, Boaz. Let's go back into that chapter. I'm going to reread verses 1 through 13, which is what we did last time. But as I said, now we're going to look at the story from another angle. We're sort of turning it over, and we'll see what it says about the end times. Chapter 2, verse 1 of Ruth. Now Naomi had a kinsman of her husband, a man of great wealth, of the family of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth, the Moabitess, said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain, after one in whose side I may find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. 
So she departed and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and she happened to come to the portion of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Now behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, May the Lord be with you. And they said to him, May the Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his servant who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? The servant in charge of the reaper replied, She is the young Moabite woman who returned with Naomi from the land of Moab. And she said, Please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. Thus she came and has remained from the morning until now. She has been sitting in the house for a little while. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Listen carefully, my daughter. Do not go to glean in another field. Furthermore, do not go on from this one, but stay here with my maids. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap and go after them. Indeed, I have commanded the servants not to touch you. When you are thirsty, go to the water jars and drink from what the servants draw. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? And Boaz replied to her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law after the death of your husband has been fully reported to me. And how you left your father and your mother and the land of your birth and came to a people that you did not previously know. May the Lord reward your work and your wages be full from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. Then she said, I have found favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and indeed have spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I am not like one of your maidservants. It's still just as tender the second time as it was the first, right? Naomi and Ruth returning to the land. Remember we said they've come in at the time of harvest, that we learned that in chapter 1, as a result of nine years outside the land, now coming into the tenth year. That also gave us the indication that this is a year of testimony to follow all that time of judgment. And as they've arrived, Ruth began to seek support for herself and for Naomi by gleaning, by working in a field, just collecting the leftover grain that might still be on the ground. And as we learn, she goes into this one field that happens to be the field of one of her family's relatives, a kinsman, Boaz. And after spending all day gathering that leftover grain for herself and for Naomi, Ruth meets Boaz. And when that happens, we see this great kindness extended from Boaz toward Ruth. And in the process, he commits something to her. He commits to protecting her as she goes about this gathering. And of course, we've already studied how Ruth pictures the Gentiles uh, of the world, the Gentiles of the church, and how they're attracted to the God of Israel uh, as the scriptures promise would happen. And then last lesson we saw how Ruth's time gathering in the field is reflective of the time that we spent in the world, so to speak, the field being a world and the way scripture often uses the metaphor. In fact, Matthew 13, Jesus refers to the world metaphorically as a field. So we sought our provision working in the world, but it was a work without hope. Ruth is working in the field. She's gaining some measure of success. But what she can't get through her own work is what she desires most, which is security, rest. And then all of a sudden in verse 6 out of nowhere, Boaz appears and he gives her the opportunity for that security and rest that she couldn't have found in her own effort despite working as hard as she did. And then as we looked at the text a little further, the next detail we notice is the way that Boaz establishes this new relationship between himself and Ruth. And that detail offers us the first opportunity this morning to start drawing some parallels between the events of this chapter, of this account, and God's plan for Israel and the church in later days, in the days that we've progressed through already and are coming upon soon. Now, as you probably already know, and I'm sure I'm not giving this away to anybody in the room, the kinsman redeemer in this story, Boaz, is a picture of our Lord Jesus Christ. If that is news to you, then don't worry. We're going to develop this idea more fully through the rest of the book. But suffice to say for now, Boaz serves as our picture of Christ himself. He's the hero. He's the one who's going to rescue Naomi and Ruth from their circumstances. And through the relationship... We're going to learn something also about the way God prepares a bride for his son, Jesus. We noted already that Ruth is a Gentile, and having been drawn into Boaz's field, not by chance, but by the Lord's hand, luck had nothing to do with it, her choice had nothing to do with it, the field 
was intended by God for Ruth. He planted her there and he brought Boaz in at just the right moment. We studied all that last week. And then we notice that the relationship between Ruth and Boaz began not because Ruth took note of Boaz, but because Boaz took note of Ruth. Before Ruth was even looking for a Boaz, Boaz found her. And then, of course, between them was the servant of Boaz who introduced Ruth to Boaz. That servant pictures the Holy Spirit in the role that he has in bringing us, the church, into a knowledge of Jesus, our Redeemer. So at this point, in our second story, let's take an inventory of what we know. We have Christ, pictured by Boaz, having introduced himself to his future bride, Ruth, who pictures the Gentile church. And even before Ruth is aware of Boaz, you have Boaz now making plans for Ruth. He begins his conversation, you notice, by calling her my daughter. That is, he welcomed her into his household. Secondly, he gives her access to his field indefinitely without condition. Third, he makes her one of his maids. And a maid, as you know, is a female equivalent of a servant, of a male servant in the household. Fourth, Boaz tells her to work with the other servants who will protect her and care for her needs. And when we looked at all this last time, we noted that all of these grants from Boaz were a measure of grace to Ruth. And you can clearly see in all of these points a picture of what happens to believers in the church as we enter into our relationship with Christ. The very same grants are all there. He gives us, as you know, grants of protection and provision and privilege. And it comes as a consequence of His grace to us, not for anything we did to earn it. It comes in a manner and at a timing of His choice. We simply have Him show up in our life when we weren't even looking for Him. But notice things that we didn't talk about last week. For example, notice it comes with an expectation of service. Did you catch that? Notice Boaz made Ruth a servant, a maid in the house. He didn't award her a bundle of cash which he could have done, so that she would never have to work again, right? He knows her situation. She needs a provision. But he doesn't just show up and say, here, here's all the money you need. Go buy yourself some food and, uh, you know, just go sit on the couch in the afternoon and play Xbox and eat a box of Oreos and you don't need to do anything anymore. I'm your sugar daddy. Everything is good here now. If you think about it to its logical conclusion... If the goal for Boaz was to support a woman in need, why didn't he just go to that ultimate outcome? He doesn't do that. He still expected her to work every day as a servant in the field. He just made the work easier. He made the work rewarding. But there was still work. That is the call, friends, of every disciple of Jesus. Just like Ruth in the story, we're Ruth, we're the church, we're the Gentile church. When Christ called us in, to the faith that He granted us, He called us also to work to serve the Master who bought us, who came and found us. And He did that with protection, with provision, with privilege. And that's why serving Him is easy compared to the work we knew before. Just as Ruth was working harder for less in the field, now she's working easier for more. And I'm not talking here strictly about the work of going to an office or going to some other setting and earning a living. That's not the kind of thing I'm talking about. We'll do that regardless. The point is it stops being the focus of our life. It stops being the meaning of life. It stops being the fulfillment of life. It simply becomes a means to another end. Instead, our focus becomes a work of spiritual things for a God who rewards us elsewhere. As John said in 1 John 5, 2, By this we know we love the children of God, when we love God and observe His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Today, prosperity teaching, and you know what I'm referring to, I assume, the kind of heresy that exists out there that says that God wants us to be rich and happy in this life, and is prepared to grant us riches Should we just do a few things that he expects us to do? Or usually it involves paying some pastor a lot of money in order to obtain that money for yourself. I think the heresy should be self-evident when it says you have to give away a lot of money to become rich. That doesn't make much sense, does it? The central error of that heresy is in overlooking that God has purposely left us in a state of need so as to motivate us to serve him. He didn't dump cash on Ruth. He doesn't do that for us. He says, continue in your work. Let me make it easy and purposeful for you. The work comes with promises. It comes with a provision of rest. 
We will have rest from the worries of eternity, from the worries of sin and judgment, from that endless race of trying to seek to please men. You know, the rat race, the treadmill we all talk about. So often people work thinking that that work will find satisfaction because they're seeking to please the wrong audience. First and foremost, themselves, but then secondly, men. But you have to work nonetheless. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, Come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. But then he says this, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. He says, If you're weary and heavy laden, come to me so I can put a yoke on you. He doesn't say, come to me so I can take all of everything away. He says, come to me so I can exchange the weary, burdensome work you've been doing for a new yoke that's easy, light, rewarding. Christ assured us that our service will be rewarding, both now and in eternity. Back to the story, Boaz responded to Ruth's question. You know, she asked that question we said last week, has no answer. Why did I receive grace? I mean, by definition, it's unmerited. You can't justify it. But you can't explain its purpose. And when she asked the question, Boaz told her in verse 11 that he had observed her actions, and based on that, he wanted to do something in response. And he mentions three things that Ruth had been known to do, had been observed to do, and they all have parallels to Christ and the church. First, he says he notices Ruth's association with Naomi. Now, we, we know already that Naomi pictures Israel. The Jewish mother in this case. She pictures Israel. She's widowed. She's under judgment. She's seeking rest in her land, just like the Israel of today. Every believer enters into a relationship with Christ because of Israel, ultimately. We could say, in a sense, Jesus comes to us, like Boaz came to Ruth, because of his relationship to Israel. Why was Boaz taking such an interest in Ruth? Because he says he's heard of what Ruth had done in taking care of Naomi. Naomi and Boaz are relatives. And in the same sense, why do we know Christ? Because of Christ's relationship to Israel. Because of him being the Jewish Messiah. But because of him being the fulfillment of Scripture. Because he is the covenant-keeping God. Then secondly, Boaz says that he has heard of Ruth's willingness to leave her family. Just as it would have been impossible for Ruth to ever know Boaz without first leaving behind Moab, similarly, it is the same for every disciple of Jesus. Your opportunity to know and follow Jesus begins, the scriptures say, with a call to repent and to leave behind the world and its values and its priorities. You have to turn from something to receive something new in this case. John seventeen sixteen, Jesus says, They are not of the world even as I am not of the world. That reference to the world is the ways of the world, the world of unbelievers, the way they think, the way they prioritize, the way they value certain things, their whole outlook on life and all that it contains. You were, and I were all once part of that. By faith, we turned from it and came to something new in Jesus. Sometimes that's going to mean literally distancing yourself from unbelieving people, like family members, for example. That is to say, if they force you to make that choice between them and Jesus. And Jesus said in Matthew 10, 37, He who loves mother or father more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. But that's not the norm. I know that happens. But it's not the norm. I think it's not the most common experience. What's most common, I think, is leaving behind the things of the world, the earthly accomplishments or the seeking of them, leaving behind earthly pursuits, earthly identities, and doing so so that we may live in a way that pleases Christ. The Apostle Paul, you might think of him as an example for a moment, prior to coming to faith when he was just Saul of Tarsus, he had as much to lose by becoming a disciple of Christ as anyone of his day. And yet, here's what he said about that loss, the inevitable loss that came as a result of him coming to Christ. He says in Philippians 3, 7, Whatever things were gained to me, that is to say those things of the world, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ, more than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. So Paul said he was willing to trade everything, and he had so much to trade. He was a man of prominence, of accomplishment, of respect, of power, of wealth. And he said, I don't want any of that anymore if it means I can have Christ instead. 
And not just for the sake of being pious, but because in Christ is great reward. Unimaginable reward in the kingdom, according to what Paul says elsewhere. So, it's not a fool's bargain by any stretch. As that saying goes, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. That's what Paul is talking about here. And Ruth is a perfect picture of that. Ruth traded everything she knew in Moab to gain something she had never seen before. She had no idea what was coming on the other side of that borderline. So it must have been a difficult choice for her in earthly terms, and yet she made that choice. It's got to be the same for us today. You have to let go of this world so that you can take hold of what God has waiting for you in heaven. Faith is the means by which that happens. But not everyone who is of faith in Christ will ultimately make the choices necessary to fully realize what is available to them by letting go of this world. There's a lot of us, and I guess to some degree all of us, try to keep one foot in both worlds. I mean, obviously by the physical nature of our existence, we must be in this world. But we don't have to be of it. We can live like an ambassador, which is what Paul calls us to do in 2 Corinthians 5. We literally carry a mindset that says, I'm living in a foreign place. I don't have roots here. I'm not putting down too much roots in this community. I'm here to represent another place. And at all times, I carry myself like I'm a stranger from another place. In a helpful way, in an ambassadorship, not in some kind of arrogant way, obviously. That's a hard thing to do because it means it all turns as the enemy puts something in your path and says, wouldn't you like to have this again? Wouldn't you like to enjoy the fruits of the world in this area of your life or in this area of your life? You've got to make a conscious choice. Is that consistent with serving Christ or is that getting in the way? Is it dissipation? Is it pride? Is it the ego or is it truly useful for Christ? Finally, Boaz commends Ruth for attaching herself to a people she didn't know. You know, Ruth, in a sense, throws her lot in with Naomi. And with the Jewish people. She doesn't know what it's going to be like on the other side. In fact, she's pretty sure it's not going to be a great existence because here's a widow with no way to make a living and no family left, etc. That's not the high probability of riches and reward. And yet she becomes one of them. Why does she do that? Well, we were told earlier she does it strictly because she wants to know Yahweh and this is the only way she knows to do that. And that pictures us again in the church, friends. Every Christian, Paul says, has been grafted into the promises God gave to Israel. In a sense, you and I have thrown our lot in with Israel, just as Ruth did with Naomi. Because if it were the case that what the Israelites, what Jews, what the Bible is teaching were not true, we have no backup plan. Now clearly that's not a concern. We know that. But what I'm saying is, in the same way that Ruth said, I'm going over that border, I'm going to be a Jew, I'm leaving everything behind, if I'm wrong, I don't have a backup strategy. Similarly, as I like to say, there's no plan B for the Christian. Pagans love plan B's. A little bit of Buddha, a little bit of Jesus, a little bit of yoga, a little bit of this, and whoever's right, I'm covered. For Christ said, there is no other way with the Father but through Him. So to think that He is one of many is to say He is not who He said He was. We don't have that back out plan, nor do we need one. The point being, we have come to believe in the God of Israel, not any other God. We acknowledge there is only that one true God, the one of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Like Ruth, we have attached ourselves to the future of Israel by faith. We have not become Israel, but we are attached to them. And as we leave the world behind, you're going to find new rewards to replace the ones you once valued. You notice in verse 11, Boaz told Ruth, ultimately... The Lord's going to reward you. I know you're happy with what I just told you I'm going to do, and I'm happy to help you, but I'm not your ultimate source of reward. Your kindness will be rewarded by the Lord who sees what you're doing. My kindness, Boaz is saying, is really just a down payment on what God is prepared to do. And here again, friends, you have another parallel between Christ and His church. The promises Christ has given to us, they're merely a down payment on a heavenly reward. We will have a measure of reward now in the sense of what God provides to us in our earthly life, even to the effect of the Spirit in us. Paul calls that a down payment, a pledge to us. And all of this is a precursor to the ultimate reward of what we will receive in our glorified life. We'll have a sinless body. We'll have the full knowledge of God and the full presence of Him to enjoy. And we'll be in a kingdom with no sin in our body and the riches of Christ awarded to us out of His inheritance. Jesus said this in Mark chapter 10, verse 29. Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake or for the gospel's sake, but that he would receive a hundred times as much now 
in the present age. Houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and farms, along with persecutions. And in the age to come, eternal life. It's easy to take those verses out of context and misuse them. But here's what he's saying. Turning from the world, that putting aside the things of this world in order to know and follow Jesus, that's going to mean, in some cases, leaving behind family members, as he mentioned here, or he mentions farms, that's a way of saying the wealth of this world, what it is you have in this world. And he says, if you've done that because of your faith in Christ, he says, be assured, you will have a hundred times those things, even now. And of course, what he means by that is, well, I might have had, in my case, two brothers and a sister, none of whom are believers. And as a result, my relationships with them are very distant and strained as a result of my coming to faith and them not. Nevertheless, I see a room full of brothers and sisters. I have a world full of spiritual brothers and sisters. And that's what he means by a hundredfold. The kind of intimate fellowship that I can have with a believer exceeds anything, anything I've ever had with my two brothers and sister in earthly terms, even before I became a believer. And that's the promise of Christ here, that there'll be a kind of relationship within the body of Christ that supersedes anything we had before and, if necessary, replaces it where we don't have it elsewhere. And then he adds, and farms. And again, it's not a promise to earthly riches necessarily. It's a promise to the shared provision within the church. You know, there's things that you own in your home right now that I don't have, and perhaps there's things I'll never have because I couldn't afford it if I wanted it. But when the time comes, you know, when I have this desperate need for a two-door sports car, Or if I have a need for some tool, or I have a need for some accommodation, or I have a need for something else, that's going to be the perfect opportunity for someone to say, you know, Steve, use mine, take mine, stay with me. And vice versa, right? This is not a one-way street, obviously. All of us are working within the body collectively to bring supply to bear where they're needed. That's his point. His point is that even in the middle of this time, when we're losing things, we're gaining things that are much more useful to us, and we're doing it all within the body. And then ultimately he says, in the age to come we have eternal life. Now that's an odd phrase when you think about it, because for the most part we go around thinking ourselves already obtaining eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. And certainly we have the promise of it. That's an assured certainty. That's our eternal security. But the reality of it is yet to arrive. And the best proof I can give you of that is you're going to die if the Lord doesn't return first. So the reality of eternal life is a promise that is certain and true because of your faith, but the arrival of it still awaits someday in the future. And that's what he's saying. There'll be a day when the fullness of your eternal life, when you'll have the body, the land, the inheritance, all of that will be there. All right, so that's a recounting of what we did in chapter 2, verses 1 through 13, now from the perspective of the church. We left off at verse 13. I want to go just a little further today. The next verse adds one more important parallel between these characters that we need to consider. Look at verse 14. Now they're still in the house. This is still the same moment. And it says, At mealtime Boaz said to her, Come here that you may eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat beside the reapers and he served her roasted grain and she ate and was satisfied and had some left. So Boaz ends their conversation with a meal. Now, in this day and age, meals had much greater significance, particularly in ancient Eastern culture, than meals for us tend to have today. It was very high honor for someone to host someone else in their home for a meal. And in fact, meals were commonly used to solemnize agreements or covenants, to put them into effect. But in our culture, you know, we don't even think of meals the same way anymore today. They're increasingly informal. You know, there used to be a time not all that long ago when families used to dress up for the evening meal. And I don't just mean on Sundays. People had to be dressed properly to come to the table and eat. This is probably, what, 50, 60 years ago now, but, you know, not ancient history, certainly. Today, we consider a meal to be formal if it's not served on a stick. (laughs) You're lucky to get most of the family around the table once a week in a lot of families today. I finally came to realize that dinner as a meal had lost its significance to us as a culture when a friend of mine one time told me about a practice he has of eating dinner at Sam's Club or Costco. And he said he often gets a seven-course meal there. And I said, you know, last time I was in those stores, I don't remember there being a fine dining establishment inside. How are you getting a seven-course meal there? And he said, it's not a restaurant. He says he visits all the food samplers working the aisles in these stores. So he starts in the appetizer aisle, he moves to the soups and seafood, followed by barbecue and pizza. He finishes off with desserts and maybe the sports drink aisle. 
And he says if you time your arrival at these places just right, you catch them on a shift change, and you can do the whole circuit a second time. They don't know you. Well, I heard that story of like, okay, we're done with meals in, the, in our society now. We're, it's a sign of the apocalypse. We're eating it in the aisles at Costco, right? All right, back to this story. Meals in this day, though, were very important. And a meal was often the integral moment, the, the key moment, when you establish a covenant. You can tell there's something important going on here when you look at the details. Look in verse 14 again. At the end of 14, you notice that the evening meal consisted of what? Roasted grain. That was the actual food being served at the meal. They ate grain, it says. They were satisfied. She even had a little bit left over. But earlier in the verse... It says she had bread given to her, and she dipped the bread in vinegar. And the Hebrew word there for vinegar is a word that means literally sour wine. So this is before the meal. This is not the meal. These are not appetizers, friends. This is a symbolic ritualistic moment that's taking place at the beginning of the meal. The meal itself is different. So we have to understand, what is this ceremony that's taking place in the beginning? This ceremony is the moment that seals... The covenant that Boaz is giving to Ruth. This is the moment she is entering into the covenant and he is establishing it. Now, I don't have time to go into the background on covenants for us. We've done that here in the past at other times. But suffice to say, think of it like a contract, but much more solemn than what we do today when we sign contracts. The key difference being that in this day, a covenant was breakable only by death. Which is to say, it's a lifelong agreement... But if you broke the agreement before you died, they killed you. So you died either way. So it was only breakable by death. And so it was a very serious moment. You enter into a covenant with great care and forethought because of what it meant. And to seal a covenant, today we have a piece of paper, we sign it, or in fact it's electronic half the time now. But in that day, they didn't do it that way. It wasn't as convenient. What they did instead was they had a meal. They exchanged something like bread or salt or some other food. And in the exchange of it, here's the principle. The principle is we are going to be bound together in this agreement. And to signify our binding, I'm going to take something that was once a whole, like a loaf of bread, and I'm going to divide it, and some of it's going to go in your body, and some of it's going to go in my body. And symbolically, it's like we're one body now because that bread is unifying us. It's just the idea. It's not magic. They're just a picture of us being one, united. They did a similar thing with salt. People used to carry salt around because salt was a very essential ingredient for life in a desert community. And they'd have bags of salt. And if you wanted to create a salt covenant, it was called, I would take a pinch of my salt, and you would take a pinch of your salt, and we'd put it in each other's bag, and now it's mixed together, and no one knows whose is whose, and we've united in that sense. Okay? So when you wanted to signify a covenant being established, you often did a meal. And in this case, that's what you see happening. A covenant being inaugurated between Ruth and Boaz through this meal. This is a lifelong binding obligation. It's only going to end with the death of those who make it. Some covenants place obligations on both parties, like contracts do today, right? There are other kinds of covenants, though, where only one person in the covenant has any requirements to do anything. And in this case, you can clearly see that this is a one-way covenant. Boaz has obligated himself to Ruth in the promises that he gave her a moment earlier. And Ruth has had nothing put on her. She has no obligations. She's not asked to do anything. She didn't have to work to receive it. He came to her before she even knew him with the plan to provide all these things to her. All the promises are one way, from Boaz to Ruth. And so what you see going on now, and this is significant if you think about it from Boaz's point of view, he is voluntarily entering into a lifelong binding promise to protect Ruth. All the things he said for her are lifelong. Clearly he's thinking beyond the current harvest season. He has determined there will be rest for Ruth the entire remaining life she has. When the harvest ends, when all the gleaning is done, Boaz is still committed to providing protection, provision, and privilege to Ruth because of this covenant. That's how he can say to her, that's how we can say, she has truly found rest. This is not momentary charity. He has made an agreement. So once again, in all of these details, you see markers that draw your attention to Christ and his Gentile church. Because just as Boaz found Ruth, Christ found us, and as he found us, he granted us these promises of protection, provision, and privilege. He sealed these promises in a one-way covenant in the blood of his sacrifice. And that covenant placed burdens on Christ, and it grants us privileges by grace. 
It comes with no conditions. As you entered into the covenant you have with Christ by faith, we call it the new covenant as God describes it, you came as a function of things done for you by Christ to your benefit, not because of anything you did, not because of any obligations put on you, and there are no continuing obligations. Now, I'm not saying there is not an expectation of service and obedience, but that's not a condition. In other words, you cannot serve Christ, you cannot obey Christ, but the covenant that He made with you is not dependent on those things, it's dependent only on His faithfulness. And He who promises is faithful. Paul says in 2 Timothy 2, 13, If we are faithless, He remains faithful, for He cannot deny Himself. Which is why Paul expressed such confidence in his own future in Christ in Philippians when he says in Philippians 1.6, I am confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Romans 8.38, sort of the classic place we go for this. Paul says, I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Why does he say that? Because the nature of the relationship we have with Christ is based on a covenant, and that covenant is binding to God. He cannot go against his own word. So understanding that our covenant with Christ is based on his work and his faithfulness explains why we can use the term eternal security at all. Right? We aren't saying we're eternally secure because we somehow have the strength to ensure that outcome, or even because of our forgiveness of sin. It's because our covenant with Christ is a one-way agreement, just as Ruth could rest knowing Boaz has promised her things that he can't go back on, we can rest knowing Jesus has promised to return for us, to glorify us, and to give us an inheritance, regardless of what might come between now and then. That's our source of rest. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 11, 28, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And then lastly, as we enter into this covenant, this new covenant, you notice we commemorate that routinely with a ceremony, with a meal ceremony, just as Boaz did for Ruth. And you know where I'm going with this, I hope. Boaz took Ruth aside after the agreement and he instructed her. You notice it says he told her to take the bread and he told her to dip it in vinegar. And as such, she is eating bread and wine as a way of commemorating, inaugurating, solemnizing this agreement. And of course, friends, we do the same thing. It pictures the church participating in the Last Supper meal. As Boaz instructed Ruth, so has Jesus instructed us, the church. And just as their partaking of bread and wine was a ritual, it was not a full meal, you notice, so our communion is just a ritual. It's not a full meal. I've seen some churches make a meal literally out of their communion celebration. I think they do this with the best of intentions, but they don't do it biblically correctly. They don't separate out any ceremony within it. They just call it the communion meal. That's not what God is looking for in our observance of it. Paul even says in 1 Corinthians 11, if you're hungry, eat before you show up. It's intended to be ritual. It's intended to be a picture of something. So we're supposed to treat it very carefully. We eat bread and wine or grape juice in some cases to remember the covenant in Christ's body and blood. And that covenant brought us into this new relationship. Just as Ruth and Boaz are remembering what was said in their covenant, we do the same. In our case, our communion meal is actually a reenactment of the meal that Jesus shared with his disciples shortly before he died. And the reason that's done this way is because Jesus could not have put the entire church around that table in that moment. First of all, it wouldn't have fit. Secondly, we weren't born. I mean, there clearly some, some big barriers to there. So he does it with a small group that represents us. And then he tells them, now you guys keep repeating this amongst yourselves until I come back, so that over time, everyone in the church gets a moment like this, at least once, and usually quite often. But there's yet one more detail that connects these characters and our story. Boaz's relationship with Ruth and this covenant meal, they take place during the barley harvest. That's what we said at the very beginning of this book. The barley season, the barley harvest happens in the spring. This is not a fall time. This is a spring time. And as it goes most years, the timing of the harvest tends to line up very closely to the observance of a particular spring feast, Passover. Therefore, on God's prophetic time clock, we can say that this moment between Ruth and Boaz is a picture of the start of the church age. 
that moment when Jesus inaugurated the covenant and brought the church into existence at Pentecost, all of that comes at the time of his death on the cross, which was the fulfillment of Passover. And it began a clock of sorts. The clock is, is still going today. The church is still on the earth, obviously, and we're waiting for that time to eventually come to its end. But meanwhile, we're still in the period of Ruth and Boaz, if you will. It started at Passover in the spring at the barley harvest, and it continues to today. It started with the Last Supper meal. It continues today with us observing the same meal. That, friends, explains why at this point in the story, Ruth is alone with Boaz. If you've been wondering about poor Naomi, I mean, you might have been tempted to think, why has Naomi not been allowed to enjoy some of these same benefits at the same time? Where's the protection promise from Boaz to Naomi? I mean, after all, he knows Naomi is in need. That's one of the reasons why he was willing to recognize Ruth was because of her kindness to Naomi. And yet, you don't see him reaching out to Naomi at this point in the story. It's a bit odd, in a way. And we know, of course, that Naomi represents the nation of Israel as a whole. So Naomi is not in the scene at this point because in its prophetic parallel, the Jewish people largely do not join the church at the onset of its existence. We have the Jewish remnant, obviously, and still do today. But as a whole, the church is Gentile like Ruth, not Jewish like Naomi. In a sense, you could say, currently, Naomi, the Jewish people, are still in the field of the world. They are still without Boaz. They are also without Ruth. They are alone, vulnerable, desperate, hungry, if you will, spiritually. God has left them there for a time while making a covenant with another individual, with the church. Ruth is secure. She's got this covenant relationship with the master of the house. This master, though, is a kinsman of Naomi. And just as our Lord is a Jewish Messiah, he is kinsman to all Israel. And that one-sided relationship goes on for a while, just as the age of the church lasts for a time. But you know where this is going, I'm assuming. Eventually, it comes time for the church to give way to a new time for Israel. And that new time will come at another harvest time. In Israel, there are two harvests, a spring and a fall. And as you may already know, the, the Jewish feasts center on those two times in the year. That's where we're going next time. As we finish two and enter into three next time, we're going to see where this age now transitions from the start of the church to the end of the church. And we'll begin to now look at some prophetic detail in the story that are not history, but are still yet future. And what God has planned for Naomi, even as he continues his work with the church. We'll see how that starts. But next week, we're going to start with the first story again, the events of Naomi and Ruth in their own day as we move forward in the story. And I hope you'll be here for that. Let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, only your wisdom could put so much detail into such a simple story. That you foreknew these events and predestined them and put them into place. That you orchestrated lives years ago in a place far away so that in this day we could look at them and see them in, their full under, in a full understanding of what you are doing in the world. The way you can move lives, Father, to create the storylines that you need to tell us about you is just further evidence, Father, not only of your power and your wisdom, but of your love for us. And thank you, Father, for the story of Ruth and Boaz as it pictures us coming to know Christ. Thank you that you found us while we were working in the field of the world. Thank you, Father, that you promised us such great blessings before we even knew you. Thank you for sealing them with a covenant that's dependent only on your faithfulness. For, Father, if it were any other way, we'd have no rest. And thank you, Father, that... Um, we can know these things to share with others. For the day is still the day when men and women may come to know you by faith. And we ask, Father, for the privilege that it would be to be an instrument in your hands to bring someone to know you, perhaps even this week. Bring us back next week, Father. Let us continue in this study as we learn more. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Thank you, Father, for summertime, the break to our work week and uh, our, our work schedules, the break to our school schedules. It's a it's a time in which families spend more time together and we get a chance to, to perhaps slow down a little bit, some of us. A time to spend more time with the family in the long evenings, Father, the chance to, to take vacations. Um, well, our, our lives have a pattern and a season that uh, you have constructed to give us a sense of um, the regularity of life that you've programmed for us, Father. And we enjoy these breaks. And, and then when they're over, we enjoy going back to what we've known. This is the rhythm of life. But, Father, it's all directed toward you. 
The creation speaks to us about you and our timetable of, of life, the way we move through seasons in our own life and in the seasons of a year. They all reflect the regularity of your grace and provision, the fact that this world was created for our sake. And, and yet, Father, at the same time, it's reminding us that there is a countdown, a time clock, that our, our world is coming to an end in a day you appoint. And that the regularity is there, Father, to, to reflect your faithfulness. But in the same way, we must give attention to your word, for you are faithful to keep what you've said. And you tell us, Father, that this world will not last, that we will not last, and that there is an age to come that we must be ready for. And so, Father, as we uh, take time off during the summer, I pray, Father, we haven't taken time off from serving you and following you and knowing you, representing you to a lost and dying world. Give us a heart, Father, to, to take time when, when it's available to us and put it to good use. And as we consider Ruth and the story what, of, of what happened to her and how it pictures greater things yet to come, I hope, Father, you would let it inspire us. And it would cause us to consider whether we've cr- constructed our own lives and patterns of life to the best possible purpose in serving you. Or whether we've, we've got wasted opportunities, Father. I pray that as we study today, as we hear about Boaz and Ruth and about your faithfulness represented in his faithfulness and the grace he extended to her, Father, a picture of what you've done for us, I pray, Father, that we would have a thought of how we're using it, where we're putting it to work. Give us new ideas, Father. Give us thoughts on where we serve you better and perhaps things we need to get out of our life to make room for you. Help us, Father, to see these things in new ways this morning. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, our study of Ruth and Boaz and Naomi marches onward. Now that we have seen Ruth receive all the promises that she did from Boaz last week, she's in this new relationship. She's enjoying this new spirit of optimism in the land, I assume, anyway, given where she came from. She now has great privilege, great protection, great provision from this man. She has reason for optimism. In fact, she just enjoyed probably the first full meal that she's had in some time when Boaz fed her that grain last week. And as we noted, these two individuals are moving forward now without the presence of Naomi, or so it would seem. While Ruth has benefited from Boaz's kindness in the way that they've come together, Naomi is not a part of this covenant. Naomi was not present when the covenant was formed. And yet, we know that Ruth has attached herself to Naomi. So really, Naomi's opportunity for rest is closely connected to Ruth's situation with Boaz, though at a distance. And speaking of Ruth and Boaz, that's an interesting relationship, isn't it? I mean, he's committed himself to Ruth, but that just begs a bigger question. What are his intentions? I mean, frankly, single men don't establish this kind of relationship with single women just casually, without some greater expectation. Clearly, Boaz has his eye on Ruth, and yet he's given no indication that he intends to move forward in any further degree in this relationship. So we're all searching to understand a little bit of why has Boaz taken such an interest in Ruth and then left her at arm's length in this relationship. I know it's out of a kindness for her and what she's done for Naomi. He said as much, but it would appear as though there's something deeper going on. And we're going to see a little more of that today and in weeks to come. In chapter 2, verse 14, last week, we learned that Boaz had concluded their meeting with a covenant meal, as I described it last week. Let's return to that point in the text. I'm going to pick up reading again in verse 14, which we looked at last week, and then I'll move forward a bit. So, Ruth 2, 14. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here, that you may eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat beside the reapers, and he served her roasted grain, and she ate, and she was satisfied, and had some left. When she rose to glean... Boaz commanded his servants, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not insult her. Also, you shall purposely pull out for her some grain from the bundles, and leave it that she may glean, and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. She took it up and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. She also took it out and gave Naomi what she had left after she was satisfied. So, after the covenant ritual that we studied last week, and remember the bread and the wine, that was the covenant ritual. Then following that, you had the real meal with the grain. 
First thing you notice as we look back on that moment again is the fact that it says Boaz served Ruth. Boaz served Ruth. Yet what we saw happen was Boaz had just made Ruth a servant, a maid, in the home. So it is surprising, to say the least, that the master of the home would have served one of his own servants. And I'm sure Ruth was shocked, though I wonder if perhaps the others in the house who saw this happen, maybe they weren't quite so surprised. I wonder if Boaz's character was well known among the other servants, and I kind of doubt this is the first time that he's ever thought to to reverse roles in this way. I'm not saying it was common, but I just suspect that Boaz is a man of frequent kindness and consideration of others that would seem to be in keeping with his character. Nonetheless, this is an unusual thing. This is a remarkable thing for the master to serve one of their servants. It's sort of in the same vein as Jesus washing the feet of his disciples. Next, we see that he also honors her by giving her this huge portion of grain. So much, in fact, that even after she's satisfied, and I have to imagine she was pretty hungry after working all day in the field, nonetheless, she has something left over. She has leftovers. Now, you may remember the story in Genesis where Joseph invites his brothers to visit him in Egypt, though they don't know that it's Joseph, remember? And they bring Benjamin, the youngest son, because Joseph insisted on it. And at the table, Joseph purposely reversed the norms of the culture by giving the youngest son, Benjamin, more food than he gave the rest of the sons, even though Benjamin, being the youngest, should have had the least honor at the table. Remember he did all of that in the story? And, of course, he did it to test the brothers' hearts to see if they would still have jealousy for their younger brother under these circumstances. Well, in the same way that Joseph had a good purpose in providing extra food to one of them, he wasn't just merely giving more because he was sloppy and handing it out. He had a very purposeful intent. Well, similarly, Boaz is being very purposeful here in giving Ruth more food than Ruth can eat at one sitting. It's not an accident. It's not a miscalculation. Nor is it an insignificant detail. Boaz is working behind the scenes to bless Naomi through this provision. He expected Ruth to take the leftovers, the excess food, and share it with her mother-in-law. But here again, notice how he goes about this work. He's working through Ruth to bless Naomi. You know, he didn't just give Ruth a normal portion and then come with a Tupperware container and say, by the way, take this home to your mother. He just gave it all to her and let her take care of it in that way. He leaves it to Ruth to transfer the blessing to Naomi. That detail will become significant to us when we return to the story and start looking again at the prophetic significance of what's taking place here. But going back to the story, immediately Boaz begins to fulfill all those promises he had just made to Ruth earlier. It says here that Ruth rose to go again. I want you to understand what's happened between these two verses. Ruth was given shelter in Boaz's home that night in probably the maid's quarters. And the reason would have been, because it was late in the day when Boaz found her in the house, at that point, for her to leave the home and walk back to Naomi would probably have meant she'd been traveling after nightfall, at least for part of her journey. And that would have been very dangerous for anyone, let alone a single woman walking alone at night. So Boaz has already begun to fulfill his promise of protection by insisting that she stay in the home that night And then it says she arose. That's a reference to her getting up in the morning. She would arise the next morning and she just continued at her gleaning the next day in the field. And then that gives Boaz an opportunity to fulfill his promise to provide on top of the earlier one to protect. We see Boaz directing his reapers first to keep an eye out for this woman as she works. In verse 15, Boaz tells the servants, allow Ruth the freedom to work in the field as she collects the leavings. What he's doing is he's ensuring that no one inhibits her. You have to understand, workers in the field, like these reapers, they can sometimes compete with one another for the best place in the field as they go about their work. Remember, just like guys and gals today going to work, you want to be sure that as you go about your work, you're seen to be a good worker because there's something in it for you, right? You like to impress the boss. Well, if you're trying to get your job done and some widow keeps getting in your way, it's going to suddenly become an issue that this person is no longer your friend, right? That worker could simply find the presence of a woman beggar like Ruth to be a nuisance. And then you might insult her. You might even give her a little kick with your leg. You might push her down out of the way. I mean, if this surprises you, then you haven't seen how men in the field work quite often. So Boaz ensures that the servants know that Ruth has equal right to be in the field, that they must not insult her or get in her way. But then he goes a step further. He begins to give her advantage in her work. 
The next thing he says is that she can glean anywhere. Remember the law that we looked at a few weeks ago, the law of Israel that provided a way for widows to supply themselves with grain, that law in Deuteronomy that said that they could effectively have the leftovers. Remember this? That they could go through the field gleaning, but they were to pick up the things that had been left over laying on the ground after the reapers had gone through a certain section of the field. Or they could have the corners. You remember the, the standing grain in the corners. Think about how that actually had to work for the ladies that did this work, though. I mean, the process. They would have to have worked pretty hard to find the scraps that were left over. The, the, just to get enough food, even for just one day, you know, they're bending over all day in the sun, picking through whatever's left. Oh, there's a stock. Oh, oh, there's a stock. I mean, think about how hard that is. It's like looking for a four-leaf clover all day long on the ground. And on top of it, you're competing with other widows who are looking for the same thing, right? It's like an extreme Easter egg hunt, only the loser here has the risk of starvation. This is not a game. That's what's normal for someone in her circumstances. But for Ruth, Boaz tells his servants, this lady is welcome to glean in the standing grain. That's even before the reapers would have gone after it themselves, where it's easy to get them, where you can see them. You don't even have to bend over. Obviously, it's going to be a lot easier for her that way. Now, I think that she probably would have had some difficulty even thinking to do this very thing because it's against the rules. So what I assume must have happened is these instructions to the servants aren't merely don't stop her. I suspect that they're an encouragement to the reapers that they would invite her into the grain and direct her to do so because I don't think she would naturally have taken it upon herself anyway. That would have been a dishonest thing to do on her part had she not been given the right. So she's guaranteed now to find success and plenty of it. And that's the point. That's why he's doing this. Boaz is fulfilling his promise to provide for her and to secure her rest. In a sense, you could say that Boaz is doing her work for her. Or at the very least, he's made her work far easier in the way that he's set the rules up. But what's really interesting about what he's doing here is from Ruth's perspective, from what she will see and experience in the field, she's putting in time, and she's putting in effort, she's working hard, and she's getting a reward for her work. In reality, she's being carried along by Boaz's kindness, experiencing a degree of success that is far beyond her normal abilities under those circumstances. But Boaz has taken away her worry. Boaz has taken away all her uncertainty, all her fear. You know, when you go out for something like this, you're hoping you find what you need for the day. You're not sure what's waiting for you. But for her, day after day, she's coming home with this bounty. I mean, Ruth is still working. But she just finds her work so easy and the rewards of her work even greater than she could have imagined and that removes all the fear of failure. Well, Boaz is blessing Ruth behind the scenes, making accommodations without taking away Ruth's dignity in the work and, for that matter, taking away her need to work. But what a joy it will be in the work. She's going to go out into the field with this great expectation every day. And if that weren't enough, Boaz goes a step further. He instructs his servants... And this is the part I really love. He tells the servants, I want you to purposely pull out some of the grain that you've already cut down, you've already collected, and you've bound into the sheaves that you're supposed to then carry in and deliver, right? After that, then go in and just pull a few out and throw them on the ground right before she turns the corner and sees them laying there. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, once again, he's going beyond anything required to assist Ruth in the gathering. And yet, again, he's doing it without leading her to feel uncomfortable because of his charity. So each day, and this goes on for about six weeks, we'll find out here in a minute. Each day for about six weeks, Ruth is going out into Boaz's field. And every day she's enjoying this bountiful harvest. It would be like a fisherman going out to fish every day, day after day. And it doesn't matter where you drop your lure doesn't matter what would normally be expected. You just throw it in the water and immediately you've got a catch. Everywhere. Can you imagine fishing like this? Right? Every day. Not just one time. You don't, everyone's got that magical one-time experience if you fish. But for every one of those days, you've got a hundred where you come in nothing else. I, I heard a great phrase one time that said, there's a fine line between fishing and sitting on the bank looking like an idiot. It's a fine line. And in this case, she's going out every day like a fisherman that catches the bounty every day. I wonder if she ever thought how it was so easy. You know, if he's doing it well, and it appears as though he's gone out of his way to do this in a particular fashion, I suspect she never quite figures out why it's so easy. 
It just appears as though she's the most talented widow reaper that's ever lived. Or her luck just won't give. Or I'm assuming as a godly woman, she's crediting it to God. But the practical outworking of it, how did it actually happen? I'm not sure she ever would have known, which is intentional on Boaz's part. Now, put yourself in her mindset as you get up one morning in that middle of that six-week period. What's your thought? Are you looking forward to the day? You have reason to get out in the field? You think there's something waiting for you that day? Wouldn't you look forward to your work? Now, I'm not taking away from the fact that in a hot day, working out in the field, it's not easy. As I'm sure the work was still hard at times, certainly. But when something's rewarding, the difficulty of it doesn't impinge on your joy. Hear that again. When something is rewarding, the difficulty of it doesn't impinge on your joy. And I think that's a concept that's lost in the world. The world thinks that when something's easy, it's more joyful. Kids think this. When something's easy, it's more joyful. Dad, just give me the money. Why do I have to work for it? We've learned, if we're an adult, or if we're certainly counseled by Scripture, that the joy of something is not determined by the ease of it. It's determined by the reward of it. And in fact, sometimes the harder you work for something, with a reward at the end, the more you value it. In fact, if not always. And in this case, each day brought its own reward. We remember last week how Boaz, we said, pictured the Lord in this story, Christ, and that his call upon Ruth to work in his field, as opposed to simply giving her charity, was a picture of the Lord calling us, the disciples of Christ, to work in service to him. And here again you see that picture filled out just another step. That is, what is it like to serve Christ? What is it like to work in his field? That is, you know, Ruth's work in the field is a picture of the church working to serve the Lord who bought us and brought us into a relationship through his covenant. He calls us all to serve him and he told us that the work will be easy and joyful. My yoke is light, Jesus said. Ruth, in her case, she saw her work achieving these unexpected results of bounty and she saw it while serving in the field that Boaz, her master, had directed her to serve in and so it will be for us in serving the Lord. You and I, as we're called to serve the Lord, to make Christ's priorities our priorities, the work in that field, rather than working in some other field, as Boaz said to Ruth, that is to say, instead of working in the world's fields, work in his field, stay there, don't wander off like he told Ruth. If you do that, if you devote yourselves to that pursuit, it's not to say the work won't be hard. It's to say that it will be light. And those are not the same thing. It's not to say that it won't be work, but it will be joyful. Just to be specific, what kind of work are we talking about here? Because I think sometimes we might think too narrowly about this. We're not talking just about those who work in full-time ministry or missionaries or even church volunteers. Those are, I guess, sort of the obvious examples. And they count, but they're hardly the extent of it. We're also talking about the mother who serves Christ in the home by sacrificing other desires in life for that particular goal. Or the father who serves Christ in leading their family, sacrificially making time available to that need as opposed to other things in their career or elsewhere. Or godly children representing Christ in their schools despite the persecution or ostracizing effect that it might have in their life. And in general, godly men and women representing Christ in all levels of society, funding ministries with their personal resources, praying for the needs of others, giving time and attention to those who are lonely or hurting or in need, serving the work of the Lord as he assigns it to us rather than serving the needs of the world. We don't have time today to list all the examples that would be included in that concept, but you probably have plenty you can make for yourself. But here's the key. As you do that work, the Lord is ahead of you. He's preparing the field to ensure that you're going to reap some kind of harvest in the process of what you do for Him. He is literally instructing His servants to go ahead of us and help us. Just as Boaz's servants followed Ruth around, made her work easier, put things in her path, and so on, the Lord is doing exactly the same thing for us. And you might ask, well, what servants am I talking about? Who's doing this work for us in the field? Who does Jesus have following us? Well, the writer of Hebrews says that the Lord's angels, the angelic realm, were created specifically for this purpose. He says in Hebrews 1.14, Speaking of angels, he says, Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? You know, for all of the Hallmark card theology, 
that surrounds the idea of angels, this concept biblically is the one sure place you can put your understanding when you think of what angels are for. They're not merely there so that you have something pretty to hang on your tree at Christmas. Angels are ministering spirits. In other words, God created a little army for himself of spirits whose purpose in existence was you. You and I, the saints who were, it says here, to inherit salvation. And what way are they ministering to us? Well, I'm not saying I know all the ways, but I can tell you one of them. One of them is that the angelic realm works behind the scenes to make sure our work is productive and easy. And in what respect do they do that work? Well, again, I think there's a degree of mystery there so that we don't think ourselves too wise about what God does. But we can make some safe bets. You know, there's a warfare that takes place constantly in the spirit realm between those enemies of God and the demonic realm and those angels of God that have remained faithful. And it centers on us. It centers on what the angels are trying to do to support us while the demons are trying to do something to inhibit us in service to Christ. So it's all directed ultimately at God's glory, but through us. We're a means to that end. And as you and I go out to serve in the field, we're not out there alone. The spirit in us is principally where God is at work. We know that. But it doesn't stop there. You have the angelic realm doing what they can to make our work lighter and easier. And if you haven't worked much in this field I'm talking about, if you haven't served Christ in some realm of life, then you probably haven't experienced this. But try them. You can't see them, and you can't see even how they work, but you will see the results of their presence in your life when you serve Christ. When you step out and you do something Christ asked you to do, when you make a commitment to follow His Word, or when you take on some new challenge, or stand firm in some temptation, expect Him to show up through the Spirit, but also through His angels. This is where I think the comparison to Ruth is so interesting. Ruth could not have told you where the support was coming from. Ruth probably could not have pointed to the reapers and say, I've been watching you guys, I see what you're doing. But what's happening around her is self-evident. I have seen this in my own experience, where I go out to do something that I am sure is going to fail because I have no clue what I'm doing, and I don't feel adequately prepared, and I don't even know what's coming. And something comes out of it that I could never have guessed. And I don't know if that's the Spirit of God, if it's the angels of God, all of the above. It doesn't really matter. It's proof to me that sometimes life is less about your ability and more about your availability. Show up and watch what God will do in the work that He's given to us. Because He didn't send you out to fail, not fundamentally. I'm not saying He won't give you a setback for trial or for testing your heart. But in the big scheme of things, He didn't set us out to fail. Expect Him to show up. You will not see the help coming before you step out. Ruth would never have seen the grain on the ground if she was not out looking for it. It's just a fundamental fact. So as God may choose to work through us, do not sit back in your current state of life and say to yourself, well, as soon as I see that God's positioned everything I need, then I can step out and take advantage of it. You'll be waiting forever. I'm I'm living proof of that. Every time I take a step of faith in some new direction, I see God show up. And all the time I spent before I took the step was really worry about whether God would show up or not. How much time was wasted doing that? It's just the nature of how we tend to think. That's why the Bible calls it faith. The assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not seen. Like Ruth, there's no gathering unless you enter the field. And the other thing you miss, and I remember this lesson distinctly from a friend of mine who was a full-time missionary, and in some of the trials he had to put up with on the field, some of the deprivation, some of the uncertainty, and all that comes with being on the field in the way that he was, I remember him telling me, you know, you won't see God do miracles until you put yourself in a position where you need a miracle. And it sounded very glib, but then when you see the examples that he cites, you realize, man, I would love to see God show up like that in my life. What a story that is. What an encouragement that is. He goes, yeah, exactly. I've had hundreds of those. But I never had any of them back in Dallas. Just that's where he happened to be from. I'm not pointing fingers at Dallas. I'm just saying he was in the middle of a modern America metropolis and roll with the normal everyday rhythm of life. But then he gets to Kenya in this case. And he didn't know where his next meal was coming from sometimes. And crazy things started to happen to help him get where he needed to be. And you started to realize God is big. Bigger than I realized. And we can see the impact of Boaz's grace on Ruth in this way. In just the first day of the harvest. In verse 17, Ruth collects an ephah, which is an ancient term, an ephah of grain. Now just to give you an idea, an ephah is roughly a bushel of grain or about 35 liters of grain. That's about 46 pounds of grain. We're not talking about 46 pounds with stalks and everything. We're talking just the seeds. How many of you can lift 46 pounds dead weight? 
I think she probably collected only an ephah because that's about the limit of what she could carry home. I can't tell you what the average widow would normally collect under average circumstances in the field, but I'm pretty sure it's a lot less than 46 pounds, right? So you know Naomi is stunned to see this showing up when Ruth comes back to her on that second day and brings her that first day's worth of, of grain. I mean, Naomi had probably been back there by herself praying that, oh Lord, please let Ruth show up with just enough grain that we can get through one meal together, right? What she gets instead is enough food probably to feed them for close to a month. And on top of that, she gets boiled grain left over from the previous night. So no, not only does Naomi get the immediate security, or at least a sense of security over all of this grain, but she also gets an immediate joy of food. I mean, if you're hungry, that, that means a lot in the moment. So Ruth has fulfilled her pledge that she made to Naomi back in Moab, that wherever you go, I will go, and I will be there with your people, which was effectively of saying, I'm here to take care of you, Naomi. I'm not going to abandon you. She's fulfilled that pledge tonight. And that's true because Boaz has a relationship with Naomi, and as a result, entered into a covenant with Ruth. And so you could say Boaz was the means to which both women receive a blessing. Ruth gets her protection and provision and privilege, and that transfers into Naomi through Ruth. And then, of course, we see Naomi's reaction. Verse 19, her mother-in-law then said to her, Where did you glean today? And where did you work? May he who took notice of you be blessed. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, The name of the man with whom I work today is Boaz. Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed of the Lord who has not withdrawn his kindness to the living and to the dead. Again, Naomi said to her, The man is our relative. He's one of our closest relatives. So Naomi asked the obvious questions. Naomi understood immediately that you don't get 46 pounds of grain doing the normal widow work in the field, right? Which is why she adds that other part of the question, who, who did this to you or made this possible? Because it didn't happen on its own. And that leads Ruth to tell the whole story. And when she reveals the name of the man, Boaz, instantly, I suspect Naomi's eyes just went, wow, because she knew that name. This is the name of one of her family members, somebody in, in the family of her husband. What's Naomi's first response? Notice, it's not to praise Boaz. It may read that way to you at first, but look at the words more carefully. Naomi responds by praising the Lord. She says, may the Lord be blessed, and then may he bless Boaz as well for what he has done. And then Naomi praises the Lord saying this, the Lord has not withdrawn his kindness from the living and the dead. Now, you might think at first she's thinking about the dead husband, the dead brother, and I think perhaps in part that's implied, but it's more specific than that. I believe it means the living and the dead referring to these two women. And what do I mean by that? Well, the living would refer to Ruth, and the dead would refer to Naomi. Ruth is living in the sense that she has a living womb. That is to say, she is still young enough to produce children. And the reason that's so key in this case is the producing of children was a woman's lifeline in these days. An eligible woman, eligible to marry, who could produce children was likely to find a husband. And that's the situation for Ruth. And by the making of children, having a posterity in that sense, that's really tied to the future of that woman's life. In that sense, Ruth is the living because she can bring life into the world and in being able to do so, that's her ticket to having someone care for her and have the protection it brings. But by the same token, Naomi then would be the dead. She's past childbearing years and therefore she knows she has zero prospects of ever being married again. No man would take her as a wife under normal circumstances because there'd be nothing in it for him. And all that sounds callous, but that's in, in a world of this type, the producing of children, the, the, the growing of a family and all that it brought was an essential aspect of what marriage was accomplishing in the life of anybody. And so she would have been more vulnerable, more desperate than Ruth. So here she is thinking, well, Ruth might have a chance, but I've got no chance. And then this shows up on her doorstep and she sees the hand of God. And she realizes God didn't forget me. He's still working through Ruth for me. He's supporting the living and the dead. And that's a great encouragement. This, all, this is all more credit to Boaz, by the way. It's obvious that Boaz has some interest in Ruth, and it would be obvious why. But he extended his kindness well past her toward Naomi. That's probably part of the reason why he made sure Ruth could collect so much. 
And it says he's truly desiring to do the Lord's work of showing mercy and kindness. Remember, we talked at one point in the past about James, and he says true religion in the eyes of God is that we would care for widows and orphans. Remember that out of James? And that whole phrase simply says that you'll know when you're looking at someone who's working truly for the needs of the Lord and not for some selfish motive when they serve the least in our society, those who could never pay it back either in money or in honor or in advantage somewhere. I mean, you help an orphan, you help a widow, at least in this culture, and that gains you nothing because they had nothing. You would only have done it because of a love for God. And similarly, Boaz is serving Naomi through Ruth because of his love for God. Naomi tells Ruth at the end of verse 20, Boaz is one of our closest relatives. And that leads Ruth to tell Naomi more of the story. Verse 21, Then Ruth the Moabitess said, Furthermore, he said to me, You should stay close to my servants until they have finished all my harvest. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with his maids, so that others may not fall upon you in another field. So she stayed close by the maids of Boaz in order to glean until the end of the barley harvest and the wheat harvest. And she lived with her mother-in-law. So Ruth says to Naomi that Boaz has instructed her, I'm only supposed to collect in his field until the end of the harvest. Now, normally, that would be a very bad strategy. I mean, if all else was equal, you you pick one of those fields clean, there's not much left, you move on, right? But she's saying to Naomi, this is what I've been told, and I think she's asking with this uh, expectation that Naomi would tell her, is this good? Is this not good? To which Naomi gives probably the most obvious answer that any mother-in-law has ever given to her daughter-in-law, right? Yeah, you should stay there. That sounds like a good deal. You had 46 pounds of grain in one day. Stay there. And then she gives the second reason as well, which, which is probably more the, the point. She says, this is going to be a protection for you because I don't want you wandering off into other property. Remember, this is still the time of judges, friends. Remember? You remember the story of what happened to the concubine who was abused by all the Benjamites? All right? Keep that in the back of your mind. That's the times they're living in. Historically, women have always been victimized by bad men. But apparently in this time of Israel, such abuse could be especially bad and maybe even common. So she's saying, look, that was my first concern for you. We found someone who will be nice to us. Stay there. That's a good thing. So Ruth stays close to Boaz throughout the barley harvest, it says, and up until the next harvest, which is the wheat harvest. Now, the barley harvest happens in the springtime. We said last week, around Passover. And wheat is harvested about six weeks later, kind of in the middle of the summer. So Ruth works in the field for about a season or so, a season of harvesting, if you will, up until the second harvest time, that is, of of the wheat. And all that while she stays, it says, with her mother-in-law. So what I'm assuming must have happened is Naomi found her way back to her ancestral property, Elimelech's property. Now, the land hasn't been farmed for 10 years, so there's nothing going on with the land, but I have to assume some of the homes are still standing, there's structure, so there's something there for her that she can live in. So she's doing that, and every day Ruth goes out to earn the living for the two of them in Boaz's field. And that living, that work, has enough grain coming in, clearly enough for them to live on, but beyond that, it must have been a source of income for them. You you sell what you didn't eat, And that became money for other things. So for a season, Ruth has this joy of working in Boaz's field. For a season, she's blessed. And during that same season, Naomi is blessed as well, but at a distance. But friends, you know, the harvest doesn't go on forever. Right? This is a great time. But at some point, the harvest is over. And so Naomi is probably foreseeing this coming end of the harvest. And she realizes, well, when it draws to a close, what's going to happen next to me? I mean, Ruth has got the covenant. Good for her. What about me? So I suspect that maybe that's the motivation for what she begins to do next. She begins to plan for something between Boaz and Ruth. And it centers on this fact that Boaz is a kinsman. We'll go just a little further today in chapter 3, verse 1. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you that it may be well with you? Now is not Boaz our kinsman with whose maids you were? Behold, he winnows barley at the threshing floor tonight. Wash yourselves, therefore, and anoint yourself, and put on your best clothes, and go down to the threshing floor, and do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. It shall be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lies, and you shall go and uncover his feet and lie down. Then he will tell you what you shall do. She said to her, All that you say, I will do. 
So Naomi begins by telling Ruth, Shall I not seek security for you that it may be well with you? What she's talking about here, of course, is getting a husband for Ruth. This is a twofold strategy on Naomi's part. She wants Ruth to have the security that, at least in this day and age, only a husband could provide for a woman. And so she's essentially implying, look, it's too late for me, but that's no reason for you to sit here and be a widow with me. You can have this. We should work on, a, on getting that for you. But I think secondly, and this is not to disparage Naomi whatsoever, I think she's also looking to obtain some security for Ruth because that's ultimately her means to security as well. That if one of them can land a husband, both of them certainly are going to be benefiting. So Naomi says to Ruth, you know, Boaz is our kinsman. Now I've been alluding to the meaning of this phrase for some time, the significance of the term kinsman. You remember I told you it doesn't just mean relative, it's actually a legal term. And so let's understand what this term means. It comes out of the law of Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 25. The law provides another mercy for a widow, not just the one of providing food and the grain of the field, but it also provided that the woman who would be widowed without an heir, without a son, could yet have another try, another chance at obtaining what they did not get the first time. It's a law that ensured a posterity for tribes so that families within tribes wouldn't die out. And here's what we read, just two verses. Deuteronomy 25, 5-6. When brothers live together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the deceased shall not be married outside the family to a strange man. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her to himself as a wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. It shall be that the firstborn whom she bears shall assume the name of his dead brother so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. Now it goes on from there to explain more of what would happen. We'll get into what follows in that same passage of Deuteronomy in future chapters. But for now, if a married man dies before he produces a male heir, his widow, the widow of that dead man, is given the means to ensure that the man's family name continues on. And the law required that the unmarried brother of that dead man in the family would take his widow as a wife. So if you were the brother of a man who died and had a wife with no kids, guess what? Your wife was picked for you. You would marry his widow. And then the first son that comes out of that marriage would then be technically, legally considered the offspring of the dead man, as if he had had a son. And then when that son becomes an adult, he inherits the estate of the deceased father, and he continues on the father's name. In that way, that name never dies out, as it would have otherwise. Now, the purpose of the law was twofold. First, it provided a second chance for that widowed woman to have the security and rest of a husband and a son. Secondly... It ensured that the dead man's family name wasn't cut off, as I've said. So the name of the man was literally given to the son of that deceased brother's widow. Now, that brother, this one we keep talking about who has to step into the gap and marry the widow, that man is called a kinsman. All right, that's where the term comes from. It's not just any old relative. It's literally the name you assigned to whoever was next in line to marry that widow. So if somebody said, you're the kinsman, basically they're saying, you have to do what's right according to law. That's Ruth's situation. Ruth was a Gentile woman, yes, but she married a Jewish man, and as such she became essentially a Jewish widow at that point, but without a son. And as such, she has to be redeemed by the brother of the deceased husband. The problem in her case, though, is what? The brother is also dead. Remember, they both died while they were in Moab. So now what? Well, the law requires the nearest unmarried male relative in the family would pick up the duty. We just keep going down the line until we find one. And I think Naomi is thinking of this very requirement on this particular evening near the end of the barley harvest. And she tells Ruth, gives her this womanly advice of how she needs to help further this process along a little bit and trigger Boaz to do the right thing by Ruth. And when we come back to the study next time, We're going to look at Naomi's advice, what Naomi is expecting to see happen here, and what will then result should it happen. And we're going to explore all of the prophetic significance of these matters. All right, so we're going to end at this point. As I said, we have a long break coming from this study. I hope I've left you with a bit of a cliffhanger, the story I did anyway. And hopefully you see some of where we're going already. Perhaps you're starting to be able to pick up on the prophetic pieces yourself. And when we come back, we'll certainly explore all of that. And if you forget what we've done... You have it online. Go listen to it. And I'll see you again on August 28th. All right, let's go to prayer. Dear Father, 
Watch over Oak Hill Bible Church, Father. It's um, certainly not a place that depends on me. You've always been the one, Father, to shepherd your church. Each of us take a turn, perhaps, in, in um, serving you as under-shepherds, but it is never the case, Father, that a church is outside your care, and the Lord is leading us every day. Um, but nonetheless, Father, I, I thank you for, uh, for giving me a chance to go and teach in other places while you bring others here, Father, to serve the needs in this place. I pray, Father, that uh, those who come would be blessed with wisdom and insight. Those who come to hear them, Father, would receive it as such, and your will would be done through all these things. And thank you again, Father, for the beautiful story of Ruth and the reminder that we work in a field that you've prepared, and we do it, Father, in joy, knowing that the results are in your hands. Let us continue in that work. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Father, thank you for bringing me back to my family, Father. And to the precious men and women here, Father, who love you and love your word and work so well together, Father, in so many ways. And, Father, we also acknowledge that we are children under your care, still working to walk in a better way with you, Father, to learn and to apply the truths of Scripture that you have given to us. And that's just never going to end, Father. We don't want it to end. We're looking forward to an eternity in which we get to know you even more. But in the meantime, Father... We thank you for this, this schoolhouse that you've assembled here in southwest Austin, where this, the study of your word is, is paramount. And I pray, Father, in the accomplishing of what we learn, it is equally paramount. I can see those who gather to learn, Father. I can't always see those who might apply, but I know you can. And so I pray that by the Spirit working in each man and woman here, that you are telling them even now, that what's coming is something they need to hear, that what's uh, to be done with it is something they can do, that we all can do if we set our minds to it. And that with our faith, Father, we please you by our works of service. So I ask, Father, that as we've done so much service for you in years past, that we'd have yet more to do, that you give us opportunities in taking what we learn and putting it to work. I thank you, Father, for the care and the, and the way the elders have worked hard in this church to care for you. I pray, Father, for each of them and that they will continue in that role. We ask, Father, that you would strengthen them for that endeavor, particularly Rick, Father, as I know he is, um, he is weakened a little in the way that his body is, is tired and, and uh, in poor health at times. But, Father, you kept him here with us today and you continue to strengthen him and we thank you for that. And we thank you, Father, for the gifts of all those in this body. Let none of them sit on the sidelines when there's so much to do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, after a long break, hopefully one that wasn't too long, we're now ready to get back into our study of Ruth. We're going to pick up again in chapter 3. We're following the story, as you know, of two widows seeking rest in the land of Israel. One widow is Jewish, one widow is Gentile. And as you also know, we're looking at a second story in this book in which these women represent larger concepts. One of these women represents Israel, one of them represents the church. And last time they had met this man, Boaz, and Boaz entered into this personal covenant to care for Ruth and for Naomi, the other woman. Boaz is discreetly making provision available through Ruth. And in that way, he becomes a picture of Christ. And his relationship with each of these women, we've come to see as pictures of Christ's relationship with first Israel, God's chosen people, and then also with the Gentile church, with you and I. So while Israel has been set aside now for a period of judgment, the church entered into a relationship with Christ. But Israel, as we said, has not been forgotten, so in a time to come, they will be restored as well. That's the big picture here. So you have two stories intertwined here in the story of Ruth. One story about two widows who are just working to obtain the rest that they desperately want in the land. And then the second story about two groups of people across history who obtain eternal rest through a grace that comes from a common Savior. So as we reach the end of chapter 2, we notice that the second harvest was coming to an end. We said that there was the original harvest of barley. That's followed soon thereafter in the season of harvest by a second harvest of wheat. They're separated by about six weeks. And at the end of chapter 2, we'd reached the second of those harvests, the end of the entire harvest season. During that season, Ruth has spent her time doing exactly what Boaz asked her to do, which is to come every day and work that field and go nowhere else. Now, we also noted the work has been relatively easy because Boaz has been making sure that the servants that he has are making it easy for Ruth. 
But Ruth didn't know it. She just knew that she showed up every day and saw reward. In the process, it gave Ruth and, by association, Naomi, a degree of, of protection and provision, the things they sought in the land. In those details, we also saw a prophecy of how God's plan for Israel and the church is going to play out over history. Israel is going to enter into a period of judgment, which, of course, they've done. And they did it as a result of their disobedience to the old covenant, to the one given to Moses. During that time of judgment, the nation experienced trial after trial, making the nation weak, reducing it in number. They're still in that situation today to an extent. And during that same time, the church, the Gentile church, is going to come into a relationship with Israel's Messiah. And it would do so really through the influence of the Jewish people. That is, through the scriptures and through their promised covenants and so on. So in a sense, we can say that Israel and the church have a relationship similar to the one that Naomi and Ruth do. And that Ruth came to know of Israel's God through her relationship to Naomi. Then eventually, the time for judgment for Israel is going to give way, Scripture tells us. It's going to change into a time of testimony. And in that moment, Christ's relationship with both Israel and the Gentile church is going to change in significant ways. Those changes are where we're going now in the story. We're learning what happens when it comes time for God to stop keeping Israel at bay and Instead, bring her back into focus. What will happen to the church when that comes about and what will happen to Israel when that comes about? Beginning now with how Naomi and Ruth's relationship to Boaz changes in chapter 3. So one is obviously picturing the other. The change in how these women relate to Boaz will picture the changes in the way the church and Israel relate to Christ. So here we are in the harvest season drawing to a close. And as it draws to a close... Naomi's concerns reemerge, and it's natural to understand why. For six weeks or more now, she's been able to see provision through Ruth because of this opportunity to work in the field. But when the harvest ends, well, where will the provision come from? What comes next in this relationship? How will these two widows get by during a long winter when there is no harvest? Will Boaz's kindness continue on after the harvest? And in what way? So not wanting to find out how that's going to play out, Naomi launches a plan of her own to help Ruth cement her relationship with Boaz and ensure that this season of provision might become a lifetime of provision. And when I was last here, we read the opening verses of chapter 3 and we covered some of this detail. For the sake of reminding you of what we've done, I'm going to reread them, but I'm not going to recover all of that material. We're going to sort of pick up with the next step of thought in this passage. And then, of course, moving on from it into the rest of chapter 3. Let's go to verse 1 again in chapter 3 and start there. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you that it may be well with you? Now, is not Boaz our kinsman with whose maids you were? Behold, he winnows barley at the threshing floor tonight. Wash yourself and anoint yourself and put on your best clothes and go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. It shall be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lies and you shall go and uncover his feet and lie down. Then he will tell you what you shall do. She said to her, all that you say I will do. So this is the thing we read last time, Naomi's plan. And it centers on Boaz's role as a kinsman to Naomi's family. Remember, we said Boaz is Elimelech's relative. Elimelech is the dead husband of Naomi. And according to the law, the Jewish law, he then is a man who might be expected to rescue Naomi's family from widowhood. But as we learn in previous teaching, Naomi is simply too old now to bear children. So it must fall to Ruth, who is still young enough to marry and have kids, to pick up in that way, to to be the one to be redeemed. There'd be no purpose in a kinsman to redeem Naomi, because it wouldn't arrive at the outcome. The the purpose of the redeeming is to arrive at a son who would carry on the family name. So a woman who can't have kids is not redeemable in that sense. But Ruth could be redeemed. So Ruth's decision to remain with Naomi instead of going home like Orpah did has become Naomi's best hope for security. If Ruth were to remarry and have a child, then Naomi knows she would be welcomed into that home and that son would continue her family line as she hopes. So it's safe to say Naomi's future is tied to Ruth's future. 
Naomi explains to Ruth that her relationship with Boaz is the key to their continued survival after the harvest end. She says, I'm going to seek security for you. Now, this is the chiastic turning point in the entire story of Ruth. Remember, we talked about chiasms here in the past. Chiasms are a structure of language in the, in the way the Bible is written that reflects the point of a story. So a series of thoughts are developed, and then a corresponding series of thoughts are developed in reverse. And where that turn happens is the point of the whole story. And as it turns out, if you did a chiastic outline of the whole book of Ruth, and the whole book is a chiasm, the point at that turn is chapter 3, verse 1. Chapter 3, verse 1 is the chiastic turn, and not simply because it's the midpoint of the book in terms of chapter, that just happens to be the way it is, but because it's the point of the story. This is a story of seeking rest. This is a story of how you obtain rest, how these women do, but in a picture, how we all do. And Naomi says, I'm going to seek rest for you, Ruth. The Hebrew word translated security here is manach, which is literally translated a place of rest. My Bible says security, but in reality you should say, I'm going to seek rest for you. Naomi wants to find a way for them to be at rest. Now, in the Hebrew mind, the word rest is a sacred term. It's a term with a far greater weight of meaning than you and I typically apply to it. When we talk about rest... We typically think of little more than lying down on our couch for a little while. And that's not what the Hebrew thinks when he thinks that word. Theologically, when they say rest, I want you to think of what we mean when we say being saved. In the broadest sense of the term. Obtaining rest meant for them ceasing to worry. It meant ceasing to struggle. It meant ceasing to doubt. Ceasing to be in jeopardy by obtaining a permanent source of blessing. Obtaining something that was permanent, that has no comparison in everyday life. So when they say rest, they mean an awful lot more than we do. That's what Naomi has just said to Ruth. Finding rest has been the desire of Naomi's heart from the very beginning of this story. The whole story is set up by her lack of rest. Think about it. She followed her husband Elimelech outside the land originally because the land was experiencing a famine and they were struggling just to get by. Struggling to be able to plant and eat. But then the decision that he made to let the family leave the land, that resulted in just one more tragedy after another. First, Elimelech dies, then her sons die, and then she finds herself destitute in a foreign land in which she has no inheritance whatsoever. The family has done everything it could by its own power to obtain rest, and it's only gone from bad to worse in the process. So, if anything, she's been moving in the opposite direction of rest from the beginning of the story. So now you see Naomi and Ruth returning to the land, still in search of that rest. And again, I'm thinking of the word in the Hebrew sense. The biggest sense of all. Blessing without struggle and without disappointment. And then meeting Boaz. Well, now that's given them this measure of provision, this this degree of protection in the land. But it's not true manach. It's not true rest. Because why? Because it's temporary. You know, the harvest ends, there goes your rest. It's temporary provision at best, friends. And when your hope lies in something temporary, it is no rest at all. Even as you enjoy it, you're worrying about when it's going to end, right? I always find it ironic when people lose their job and they may have this forced two, three month vacation. But does anybody enjoy it? Make the most of it. Go fishing. Plant a garden, just lie around and watch Oprah on TV. Just that would actually would not be a good way to spend time. But the point I'm making is you talk to people about, oh, I'm sure you'll get your job and, you know, someday God will fix this. And meanwhile, I want you to just enjoy this time off. You know, you don't enjoy it. Why? Because it's not permanent. The whole idea of Manoch is that it is permanent or it's not rest. That's what they want. I think many of us know the feeling that Naomi and Ruth are having at this point in the story. This search for rest combined with this constant disappointment and this constant insecurity in daily life. Rest in the sense of manoch, the big sense, it always seems just a little out of reach, doesn't it? Even when you get some measure of it, in the back of your mind, it's not permanent, which robs it of all its real value. Every phase of your life is like this. I don't want to depress you, but let's just think about this for a minute. Every phase of our life is like this, really. It's a pursuit of some kind of satisfaction, but for many, if not all of us, it's like living in a Rolling Stones song. I can't get no satisfaction through the whole of life. 
you start by striving in school as a kid. What's your expectation? All that striving will arrive at the security of a good job someday down the road. Well, then you get the job. But then you find yourself having to work overtime to afford the things that you have bought because you expect those things to bring you comfort and rest. Then you finally obtain all those things, but they never bring you the joy you expected. In fact, you struggle a lifetime to be ready for retirement because obviously that's when you're going to get rest. But then you actually approach retirement and you begin to worry there won't be enough to last. Or even if you do have enough money, maybe not enough health, maybe not enough friends, maybe not enough purpose. And what are you supposed to do in retirement anyway? You're supposed to enjoy rest. Now, I have family who are retired, and it's driving them nuts because they don't know what to do with their time. And even then, it just leads to death. It's just leading you to something you don't want to have anyway. In other words, if we're not careful, we'll fill our life with striving and regrets. So that as the end approaches, we're left with worry that we didn't use our life well. That's the ultimate irony in all this. At the end of it all, even if we attain something we were seeking, we'll wonder if that was the best use of our life. We worked our whole life for some kind of rest, which was always out of reach, which gave us no satisfaction. We never found security. We rarely find any freedom from want or worry. We were always thinking about the next problem. And as a Christian, these same things happen. It's not as though our Christianity becomes some insurance against this kind of mistaken focus in life. We all fall into the trap of trying to work the plan the world told us that we're all supposed to work. Right? I don't want you to think that it's just certain people. They think this way. I think we all do this to some extent. I've done this. And for the Christian who leads this kind of life, the problem isn't that rest can be found in this life. The problem is we were always looking for rest in the wrong place. That's ultimately the problem. As the saying goes, we all want to go to heaven, just not today. We know, like Naomi's family, that we're working to secure a rest that cannot be found outside the land. And for us, the land, of course, is a picture of the kingdom. The rest was found in a redeemer in the face of Boaz, who they never saw coming. And now, as they have him, they're anxious to move to the next step of the plan in their situation, which would be marriage, obviously. Just as we've come to know our redeemer, our protector, our provider, but at a distance at this stage of our life, He's made promises to us, just like he made to Ruth. He's directing us to work in his field, just like he told Ruth. But we're eager for him to bring us to the manok, to the rest that we really long for. The one that has no tears, no death, no misery. All the work of our hands prospers. We don't build and someone else lives in our homes or gathers our harvest. Everything we do has a great payoff without the frustration that we know so much today in our current life. Friends, that is the true rest of the eternal kingdom. It's planned. It's coming. While you wait for it, though, don't make the mistake of thinking you can accelerate that plan in the sense of trying to obtain that kind of rest on your own terms in this life. Again, I'm not trying to depress you because that doesn't mean you can't have joy, but your joy will come from seeking what is to be sought now rather than trying to replace it with some earthly version of what's only found in the kingdom. True rest is not going to come while you're working in the field, so to speak. Ruth got up every day. She went to work. She was lying around. But the work was joyful because it was for the right person in the right field. Our true rest, the one in which we will cease having any of the struggles or trials of life, where we don't have sin and disappointment and conflict, well, only that rest comes in the kingdom. And that kingdom is not going to come a day sooner than God presents it to us. If you think you can find rest while you're working in Boaz's field, so to speak, well, then you're likely to get distracted from the work of serving him and start wandering off into someone else's field, so to speak, some other part of the world, working on someone else's problem. Like your boss's problem at your corporate position or like your friend's problem or your family member's problem. We all have a life. None of us are going to sit at home and do nothing. We're not talking about idleness. As Paul says, the one who won't work is not going to eat. We're talking about serving Christ as he appoints wherever that is and not trying to find peace in a world that does not possess it. To put a a positive end to this before you, you all go off and get counseling as a result of this, we know that there is a measure of rest now, but you have to know what to look for. You aren't going to escape working, of course, but if you make your work building the kingdom, then that work will be joyful and as easy as it was for Ruth and Boaz's field. Uh, I worked in corporate America for 15 years, as you all know, and I spent a good deal of that time wandering the halls, counseling and praying and and teaching people whenever God made 
a moment available in my day. It just made my reason to go to work different than showing up to push pencils and, and fill in spreadsheets. I had a purpose, and those other things were simply a means to that. And we may not obtain earthly riches, not all of us, but we can learn to be content with less if that means redirecting our efforts to riches in the kingdom. And you won't escape trials, but you can endure them gladly, knowing Christ is testing us to know if we're worthy of greater things in the kingdom. In other words, you can withstand a lifetime of striving with Christ in order to obtain an eternity of rest with Christ. That's the trade-off. A minimal lifetime of struggle to obtain an eternity of rest. And by obtain, I don't mean to obtain salvation. I mean in the rewards that will come for the sacrifices made now. So that's the picture you're seeing here. Two women seeking for the rest that they need, working until a moment comes when the Redeemer is willing to advance the plan to the next step. And that's where we're going now in chapter 3. The Redeemer is going to advance the plan a step for these women. So at the start of chapter 3, they're seeking true rest, and Naomi sees an opportunity to secure it. What I want to talk about in this passage that we've already read that I didn't cover earlier is what the plan involves. Naomi's been waiting the entire harvest season for Boaz to fulfill that Leverite marriage requirement that we've talked about in, in times past. That's the one that says that the closest relative to a widow without a son is to marry that widow to produce a son to carry on the family name of the dead husband. Now, a husband and a son, husband for Ruth, a, a son ultimately for the family of Naomi, that would mean true rest in earthly terms for these women. Because in a patriarchal culture, a husband and a son would bring both protection and provision for the entire life of that family. That's what these women are desperately seeking. So if only Boaz would step up and meet the terms of the law on behalf of these women. That's what's at stake. One of these widows needs to pursue that relationship. Although in a very diplomatic way, of course, which of the widows is going to seek the proposal? Well, as we said earlier, only one of them, it makes sense to do that because only one of them can have children. And that, of course, in this case, is going to be Ruth. So Naomi instructs Ruth. Here's what you're going to do, Ruth. I want you to take this bold step. I want you to prompt Boaz into assuming the Levite marriage responsibilities that could be his. And so she tells Ruth in verse 2, Right now, Boaz is sleeping on the threshing floor during the harvest. And here's why he's there. At the end of the harvest, remember, this is a process of taking uh, grain out of the field, bringing it in and preparing it for use as food. So at the end of a harvest, you have the threshing followed by the winnowing. And the threshing is you take a stalk of grain, a whole bunch of them, and you lay them out on a hard surface, on a rock, usually something that's a naturally hard surface, and then they would either use uh, animals, cattle of one kind or another, or maybe they would use implements by hand, and they would beat this grain just mercilessly because they have to get the hard grains of the fruit to separate from all the chaff and all the wrappings of the, of the rest of the stock. So they're going to beat this stuff for a while. After a while, what you get is a whole mess on the ground. Now you've got to get the little seeds out of it, and you're not going to pick them out by hand. That would take forever. So they gather it all up in baskets. And then they would take them and they would throw the material up into the air. And then the wind would blow the lighter material away, the chaff, the stuff that's not seed. But the heavier seeds fall right back down into the basket. And if you're skillful in this, you can just keep doing it. Almost like looking for gold. It's a process. And before you're done, you've got a basket full of seed and nothing else. And then they would just continue to do that repetitively. They would thrash the grain, the threshing floor, and then they'd winnow it. And they'd move on, end up with baskets of grain. And those baskets get reused. So they take the grain and they pour it out at some point nearby. And over time, a pile of grain emerges out of this process. It's usually done at night because in the Middle East, in late summer, the hot, dry climate produces very little breeze during the daytime. But at night, right about sundown, the breeze will kick up and it'll blow quite strong all the way until just after midnight. So the first half of each night then is the threshing and winnowing process for the harvest, followed by a feast, usually for all the workers, late into the night, like midnight. And of course, you're already there with your pile of grain. It's the middle of the night. You're half drunk, usually, and you've had a lot to eat. So what are you going to do? You sleep right there on the threshing floor next to your grain, partly to guard it, and partly because you're going to be there again in the morning anyway, and you really don't feel like taking a long walk after a big meal. Workers would sleep by these grain piles, and in fact, whole families who were involved in the work would be out there. So it almost has this festival kind of feel to it, like a camp out. All the people are there, everybody's celebrating. I mean, they're happy to get their harvest. They're enjoying the meal. So it's a very celebratory period of time in, in Israel's year. 
Naomi knew it was harvest time, so she knew this was the pattern of work, so she knew where to find Boaz. So she tells Ruth, I know where to send you. Go to the threshing floor. And then she tells her how to encourage a proposal for marriage. First, Ruth is to wash herself, she says, anoint herself, put on her best clothes, which, given their social status, I doubt these clothes were all that special, but they represented the best she could find. And in all three of these steps, washing, anointing, and best clothes, what you see are the steps that are normally taken by a bride right before her wedding. A woman who is betrothed would live in this state of cleanliness and dress perpetually every day between the moment that she is betrothed and the next later moment when she actually has the wedding ceremony. And those moments can be separated by months in the year. So she hasn't received a formal marriage proposal, but she's going to approach Boaz in the form of a woman who is betrothed. And so as she comes to him that night in these clothes and then having been anointed and so on, then she's going to, as she reaches the threshing floor, she's going to find Boaz laying down in a happy, busy place in the evening when everyone is enjoying their work. But she's not to approach him until after the eating and drinking completed. This is a very strategic move. There's nothing in the law here. This is not something that's required. It's just good strategy. Because she knows it's a joyous affair. There's a big feasting time. He's going to be distracted in the work and in the eating and even in the drinking. And if you've ever had to ask something important of someone who's in the middle of a moment like that, especially if they've had a couple of drinks of wine, you may find that either helping your cause or hurting your cause. And in this case, Naomi's making the strategic decision that it won't help our cause for you to lay this on his lap in the middle of that moment. Let's make sure he's ready to hear it. But let's make sure he's in a good mood. So in verse 4, Naomi tells Ruth, lie down discreetly next to Boaz and uncover his feet. Now, men in this day wore robes that were as long as the ground. They covered their feet. So when a man lay down like this at night, he didn't have to go get a blanket. He was wearing one. So he just had to kind of curl up inside his, his cloak, and he was totally covered inside his garment, his outer garment. And men typically wore an inner garment than an outer heavier garment, and the outer heavier one would have covered him and kept him warm. So what Naomi's told Ruth to do is lay down next to him, and then very discreetly just pull up the outer robe enough to reveal his feet, to expose his feet to the cool night desert air. Now, at first, this may seem like a strange plan. In fact, I'm sure it seems like a strange plan. But Naomi knows exactly what she's doing. She's drawing on a Jewish custom, one that Naomi expects Boaz to also recognize. And you see this because in verse 4, Naomi actually tells Ruth, Boaz will tell you what to do. That's her way of saying, he'll know what we're saying. He'll know what you're trying to get across. All right, well, what is she up to here? What is it she expects Boaz to understand? Well, by taking these actions, Ruth would be letting Boaz know that she is willing to be his wife if he should desire to marry her. In Israel, uncovering someone in this manner was an allusion to marriage. And you can see this in Scripture in various places. Uh, in Ezekiel, for example, the Lord, when he describes himself as a husband and he describes Israel as his wife. So here again, we have a husband-wife picture. In that relationship, in that covenant, the Lord speaks to Israel this way. In Ezekiel 16, 7, he says, I made you numerous like plants of the field. Then you grew up, became tall, and reached the age for fine ornaments. Your breasts were formed, your hair had grown, you were naked and bare. And he's speaking here about the, the maturation of the people of Israel into a nation. A beautiful woman ready for a husband, in other words. And verse 8, he says, Then I passed by you and saw you, and behold, you were at the time for love. So I spread my skirt over you. The skirt here would be like his robe. I put my robe over you and covered your nakedness. And I also swore to you and entered into a covenant with you so that you became mine, declares the Lord God. All right. Notice that the Lord spread his skirt, or as I said, like a cloak, over Israel to cover her nakedness. That is symbolic language to represent a spiritual covering, the marriage of the old covenant. And the same is seen in the way men marry women. Uh, you see this similarly in Deuteronomy, uh, in the way the law spoke about how the people of Israel were to live. In Deuteronomy 22.30, it says, A man shall not take his father's wife so that he will not uncover his father's skirt. Again, euphemistically saying that I cannot have marriage relations, basically, with my father's wife. And then it describes that as uncovering my father's skirt. So if my father has put his skirt over his wife and I come and I have relations with that woman, it's as if I've uncovered his covering and taken that woman 
illegitimately. But again, I'm showing you that the language here is commonly used to represent marriage one way or the other. Lastly, Deuteronomy 27, 20 says, Cursed is he who lies with his father's wife because he has uncovered his father's skirt. So when Naomi asks Ruth, lift up Boaz's cloak to expose his feet, she's sending a real clear message to him. By uncovering the feet, she's inviting him to cover them back. And he would want to do that. It's uncomfortable. It's cold. As he does that, she's implying he could also cover her at the same time. So it's a way of inviting him to take that step in her life. Now, some have looked at this passage, and I'm just acknowledging this because you may find it if you run across in your own studies. Some have chosen to take this innocent moment in Scripture and pervert it by suggesting that Ruth uncovered more than just Boaz's feet in this moment. They draw on the fact that in some places you can see the man's feet used in Scripture as a euphemism for his privates. Now, that is true, that that can happen, but that's not implied by the text here. If anything, it's the other way around. She's doing everything she can to be discreet, to be polite, to do this in a diplomatic way. Hardly to be that kind of a woman, to be perverse and to be suggestive in that way. So that's just an overreach in interpretation. Others have suggested that Naomi was encouraging Ruth here in a brash way, as if Ruth was making the proposal to Boaz, as if it was Ruth saying, I'll marry you. Here again, the scriptures are very clear about the euphemism. The euphemism is that the man covering a woman is the picture of a man making a proposal. Ruth did not cover Boaz with her skirt. Ruth uncovered Boaz so as to Boaz to have to make a decision. Do I cover only my own feet or do I cover both of us? So it's very elegantly an invitation for a proposal. This is not a proposal itself because that would have been inappropriate. These speculations and others like them are just not dealing with the text honestly. I think they're coming from people who have ulterior motives. In reality, Naomi has asked Ruth to do something very discreet, very polite, and very appropriate to offer an invitation for a proposal. And Boaz has already indicated in the way he has established a covenant relationship with Ruth that he has an interest in her, that he's willing to protect her. So it's not a big leap here. Boaz just hasn't moved the relationship ahead. And so it leaves them wondering, why hasn't he gone to the next step? Therefore, Ruth's actions are a way to politely indicate her willingness to consider marriage. And I love the way Naomi set this up in a discreet fashion. She set it up so that it happens in the dark. Probably everyone else was sleeping. And under those circumstances, therefore, Ruth's appearance at the foot of Boaz would not have attracted a lot of attention because there's a lot of people sleeping all over the place. It's not as though she comes up to him in the moment when no one would have expected a woman to be nearby. And then thirdly, she uncovers his feet quietly and lays there in a way that simply offers him an opportunity to make the decision either way and no one's going to be wiser either way. He's not embarrassed for having said no. He's not forced or pressured to say yes. It shows respect for him in the way that they've approached this moment. We find out in the text next that there are two reasons why Boaz, two good reasons actually, why Boaz has not taken this step on his own up until this point. Let's go to chapter 3, verse 6. So we went down to the threshing floor. She went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law had commanded her. When Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, He went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain, and she came secretly and uncovered his feet and lay down. It happened in the middle of the night that the man was startled and bent forward, and behold, a woman was lying at his feet. He said, Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your maid. So spread your covering over your maid, for you are a close relative. Then he said, May you be blessed of the Lord, my daughter. You have shown your last kindness to be better than the first by not going after young men whether poor or rich. Now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you whatever you ask, for all my people in the city know that you are a woman of excellence. Now, it is true I am a close relative. However, there is a relative closer than I. Remain this night, and when morning comes, if he will redeem you, good. Let him redeem you. But if he does not wish to redeem you, then I will redeem you, as the Lord lives. Lie down until morning. So, The plan goes exactly as Naomi expected. As you see, Boaz awakes here. It looks as though they were laying there for a little while with his feet uncovered, which makes perfect sense. You're asleep. Someone uncovers your feet. You don't just wake up. Usually it takes a while. Why are my feet so cold? And he sits up, and that's when he notices her. And he says, who are you? Now, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? Because it wasn't that long ago, a few weeks. 
that he met the lady and he was so enamored with her that he put her in this covenant. Remember all of that? How could he not recognize her? Well, it shows you just how dark it was. Probably a very moonless night, maybe a cloudy night. Everyone's in the shadows. He's sleepy. I can't tell who this is. Right? It just shows the discreetness of it. And then she responds saying, spread your covering over your maid. She says, I'm Ruth, and I want you to do the right thing by me. The Hebrew word for close relative here is the same word that we translate kinsman redeemer. So she just said kinsman redeemer to her. She's using legal language out of the law. So she's politely saying, I'm willing to have you as my redeemer if you would be willing to fulfill that law on my behalf. Naomi's plan has expected this moment and she's expected this conversation and now she expects a certain response because she knows the character of the man that they're dealing with here, Boaz. And it happens. In in response to Ruth's overture, Boaz responds first in joy and he says he declares her first kindness to him has now been exceeded by this last kindness. Now that may seem like a strange thing for him to say when you think about it because after all, isn't Boaz the one whose kindness is the one that you know, has gone to Ruth. I mean, in and, and what way can we say Ruth has shown kindness to Boaz? It's sort of an odd statement, isn't it? Well, Ruth has showed respect and kindness to Boaz as well, which is the one thing he's referring to. And the first act of kindness and respect that he received from her was the way she has served him well as a maid. Remember, she's been made a maid servant in the house, and she's gone into the field every day, just as he expected. Ruth showed Boaz kindness in the sense of devoted service in the harvest, working every day, rewarding his trust, in other words, with conscientious, diligent service in the field. I've got to tell you, friends, every servant in Boaz's household would have been blessed to be a part of this kind of man's house. We know that. But not every servant, I'm assuming, responded to that favor by blessing him with the kind of obedience Ruth gave. Can you all attest to that? Not every servant, not every employee, not everyone does the right thing that they're supposed to at the same level that they should. But there are some who do. That's what he's talking about here. Boaz is saying, your first kindness to me was when I asked you to work my field and do what I asked you. You were there early. You were there to the late part of the day. Remember, he found her late in the day in his house. That's faithful, obedient service to a master. And it's a blessing to him. And now he says, your last kindness exceeds even that. And of course, he means here that she's willing to forego younger men in order to become his wife, which is an act of kindness to him because he's evidently unmarried. That's clear. And as an older man, unmarried, at some point your prospects start to diminish, certainly. And the opportunity for an older man to have a young wife, I mean, we have stereotypes, we make fun of it. But in reality, it's a wonderful thing for a man to attain the love, support and kindness of a younger woman for all the reasons that we can understand. The vitality of the woman, the service abilities of a woman like that. And in a cultural sense, the way it reflects well on the man from the best sense of it. So Boaz is saying, you have not gone after younger men, whether they were rich or poor, he says. And from that perspective, Boaz is greatly blessed by her interest. So in response to Ruth's kindness, Boaz pledges, I'm going to do whatever I can to make this right for you, to pursue the wedding plan that you're asking me to pursue. But he says, I can't do that freely at this point. There's an obstacle. And here's the second reason we mentioned. The first reason was he must have felt some inhibition to go after her because he was so old and it would have been an imposition on a young woman to have an older husband. She didn't, he didn't want to put that on her. He wanted to leave her free to find a younger husband. But now she's taken that objection off the table. And so the last objection is, There's another guy in the picture. He says that there is a closer living relative to you than I am. And another man, therefore, has the right of first refusal. He has the right to redeem over Boaz. And so I'm prevented from acting because of that. Now, remember, you and I may think of the Levite marriage rule as some kind of obligation or burden. That's not how it was perceived in the language of the law. It's certainly not how it should have been perceived in the culture. The idea was it was a privilege to have someone put a wife in your lap. I mean, as hard as it could be, perhaps, to find a wife, for the law to mandate your marriage to a woman, a woman who who has has this opportunity to receive a son and then continue on inheritance, this is a great thing. It's a great thing. Remember, most marriages were arranged anyway. So it's not as though you were losing some choice in the matter. You were simply gaining a guaranteed wife. That's a good thing. All right. So in this case, Boaz could not take Ruth knowing he was second in line because it would have been an affront to the man who had the first chance. 
He should want the wife if he has the opportunity. And we know, friends, Boaz is a man who keeps the law. He is a man who observes the law. He does not violate law. And he says he can't do it. But he says, I'll address this in the morning. And his plan, of course, is to put the first relative on the spot and to say, you've got this obligation. Do you want it or not? If the man will do it, fine. If he will not do it, he says, then I will do it. So one way or the other, Ruth and Naomi are finally going to get the rest that they've been seeking. Now I want to turn just briefly to finish on our second story, because as you know, we remember Ruth pictures the Gentile church, and as such, she's betrothed, we're betrothed, as the church is, to our groom, to Christ. And just like Ruth, we said we feel as though we're the ones blessed by our relationship to this groom we haven't even met yet, that we know one day will take us and and make us his wife and we'll see him face to face. And, And obviously we are blessed by that. It goes without saying that we're blessed by that. In fact, I think it's safe to say we truly don't even have a clue how blessed we are by that relationship from this side of heaven, right? How could we know? We can't possibly appreciate all the glory and all that our relationship with Christ will eventually give us in time because Paul himself says in 1 Corinthians 2, 9, he says, just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered into the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. So as simply put, you couldn't, if you tried, imagine All the glory that's prepared for us. It's beyond our ability to understand this side of heaven. It's that great. And I think also like Ruth, despite the fact that we've received so much from Christ, nevertheless, we can also be a blessing to him. That's the the side of our relationship with Christ that can be overlooked. We acknowledge that we needed him, and we certainly acknowledge the blessings that come from that relationship, but we may overlook the reality that we have an opportunity to bless him in response, just as Ruth, we were told, blessed Boaz. And we do it in exactly the same way, by working diligently in the field that he asked us to work in. And of course, we said already that the field that Boaz had was a specific plot of land. The field Christ has is the world that he's left us in. You can bless the Lord who extended grace to you by serving him faithfully in the field of the world. And it's a really small thing when you think about it. I mean, if you want to put these things on on comparison, it's a tiny thing. I mean, where would Ruth have been Without Boaz's kindness, how would she have found anything of any value if she'd been working outside his field? And likewise, where would you and I be apart from the grace God has extended to us and in the process changed the eternal course of our lives? Where would we really be? How lonely, how frustrated, how desperate, how hopeless in the face of death would any of us be without him? So when you put all of that on one side of the scale, how hard really is it to say we spend our life serving him? The little bit of time he's left us on this earth. It's really not a, a close comparison. It just feels that way when we have the blinders on of looking at our everyday life. right? To give that up for Christ, well, you're asking a lot. But it's only because our perspective is too narrow. If you wish that you could find a way. Have you ever had that feeling someday where you say, I wish I could just pay Christ back for all that he's done for me. I wish there was some way. I mean, I say thanks. I tell him I love him for it. But I wish there was a way I could just do something for him. Well, friends, there is. Paul actually gives us the recipe in Romans chapter 12. Verse 1. I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So here's the recipe. It's really simple. And we'll end on this. If you want to bless the Lord in the way Ruth was able to return a favor to Boaz, then you serve him sacrificially. Bless him by forsaking other more attractive suitors, younger, richer, more powerful suitors than him. Set aside your desires for earthly riches and fame and power and accomplishment and pleasures and the like, at least to the extent that those things get in the way of serving Christ. Don't waste time striving for rest that only comes in the kingdom. Serve in the field, that is, in the work he's given you to do every day, with an eye toward building the kingdom within that world. If you want to know how better to do that, come to our conference. That's what we're going to talk about. And when the harvest comes, friends, when that grain is harvested, and you may already know Scripture uses the term harvest as a picture of the end of this age. When the age comes to an end, when our world comes to an end, when our time comes to an end, we will obtain the rest, just as these women are now about to obtain theirs. And with it, we'll receive the reward of our service. That's our goal. That's what we're here to do. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Father, that you brought me back well and and strong enough to preach. I pray, Father, that the, the words I've spoken today have pleased you because they reflect your heart. 
that they deal honestly with your word, that they convey truthfully the priorities that you have for us as a church. But, Father, as a man, I know I'm incapable of equaling you in any of those things, except as you choose to speak through me. So I pray, Father, that whatever may not be according to you and your will and your your desires, well then, Father, let those pass through and, and not be remembered. In all these things, Father, make sure that it is your truth and your word that retains in the hearts of those who heard. And I pray, Father, that as it does its work there, that as we all consider our lives as we've gone through the text of Scripture day to day and continue to do, that in us would not just build a conviction of things, but also, Father, the courage to act on that conviction. You don't ask us to tear our lives upside down in a day, but you do ask us, Father, to, to take up our cross daily. And I know, Father, if we're following you daily, then we're going to get somewhere in the end. The place you want us. The place in which we serve you. And the place in which we do the most to please you. But if we ever set our cross down, Father, and sort of stare at it as we walk by to do our own things, well, then I know, Father, that you are not pleased and that we have, we have traded eternal things for things that are temporal. None of us are immune to doing that, Father, but we all have the potential to do better. So I pray, Father, for that as well. Thank you for continuing this work in Southwest Austin. Grow it, Father. Reach others. And, Father, I pray that you would uh, use each of us in that work. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Dear Father, teach us today, Father. Walk us through this. Keep it clear in our heads and, and make it sure in our hearts so that as we know it comes from you, we will consider it earnestly and and give great thought and uh, concern for whether we live according to the truths that you give us here today. And I ask, Father, that what we're learning would be useful as well so that we can be a teacher of others, that we can be an explainer, someone who can walk another through the word and help them see things they might not know. Father, many of us in this room may even be students already of this material, teachers even. And for us, Father, just let it reinforce what we know and perhaps give us something new. For the rest, Father, who may never have studied some of the things that we'll raise today, Father, I just pray that you'd open our eyes and just amaze us with your wisdom and power and the things you are accomplishing in history. And use it, Father, to reinforce our trust in you and in your word. And all these things, Father, show yourself strong in the weakness of the preacher and make sure that what's said and, and what's heard comes strictly from you and according to your will. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, friends, today in Ruth, we go back now to the second story. For those of you who have been here, you know what I mean. That is this unique quality of Ruth in the way that it has two stories really running concurrently through the text of what's written. The first story is the account of Naomi and Ruth and Boaz and, and the rest. These two widows seeking rest in the land of Israel and seeking a husband. But the second story is the one we're going to focus on today. The second story is the way these characters represent prophetically what God is doing in Israel and in the church, the Gentile church. Naomi, as you know, represents Israel. Ruth, as you know, represents the Gentile church. Boaz represents Christ, and there's other characters as well in the story. And as I've said here many times, most Bible students understand the first story very well. The pictures of redemption created through the story of Ruth, Naomi, and Boaz. But very few Bible teachers or students understand the fact that Ruth is a book of eschatology. That's a fancy word for a study of end times. It's a book of eschatology, every bit as much as Revelation is. And its beauty is in the way... The Lord has woven the details of this eschatological story into what seems to be an otherwise very simple love story. Only God can do these sorts of things, as you know. Now, I've reflected here on the past on how even the timing references in this story are important details of the prophetic pictures here. The fact that the story of Ruth and Naomi take place at the end of an age in which there is judgment coming and we're on the verge of a testimony of a new age to come. We've looked at some of these things in the past. I want you to think about where we are now in history on a timetable of eschatology. For example, today we've seen the reemergence of Israel as a political entity in the land. 
where people of Jewish background have reemerged in their own land now, they've returned. We know that we are living in a period of history that is anticipated prophetically then by the story of Ruth. Ruth was the story of Naomi, the Jewish wife, who was outside the land for a time, coming back into the land, regathering as it were, picturing Israel's regathering in the land before the end. And there have been other clues in the story of Ruth and elsewhere in Scripture that confirm for us that God's timeline of restoring Israel and bringing this age to an end are pictured in the book of Ruth. And we're going to review a lot of that today and go forward into a lot more. So let's begin by remembering a couple of important time references that we studied earlier. First, we learned in chapter 1, verse 22, this is in the book of Ruth, 122, that Naomi's return to the land with Ruth in tow happened at the beginning of what? At the beginning of the barley harvest. And then in chapter 2, verse 23, the very end of chapter 2, we learned that Ruth was working as a servant in Boaz's field until the end of that harvest. Now, in those details, we learned that Ruth pictures the Gentile church working in the field, that is in the world, of Boaz, while the field is white for the harvest. But now in the story of Ruth in chapter 3, we're told that this harvest is drawing to a close. And what then will become of Ruth and Naomi. That's where we left off in our first story. How are they going to secure their rest now that they don't have the opportunity to work in the field? But in our second story, what we're learning is what happens to the church when our work in the field is complete and the harvest has come to an end? What will happen to the church? And for that matter, what comes next for Israel? You know, while Ruth was working in the field, Naomi wasn't in the field. Naomi was on the outside by herself, picturing Israel outside the grace of God for a time. What will come for Israel once it's time for the harvest to end? Before we anticipate and understand the significances of these signposts, let's revisit the circumstances of Naomi and Ruth once more. Ruth enjoys now the security and the protection of her new relationship as Boaz's servant. Naomi, though, is still searching for that. She's still looking for her rest. She enjoys just a measure of protection made available by this relationship that she has with Ruth. But she is without a husband, therefore she lacks true rest. Now, Naomi's situation is a perfect picture of Israel today in the world. Regathered in the Middle East, still living in their land like Naomi has come back. And certainly Israel today is better than they once were in the sense that now they have some degree of rest. They're in the land. That's better than being dispersed. That much is true. And how was that provision made possible? Well, at least indirectly through the sympathetic support of Christians in the West. And time doesn't permit me today to go through all of the political events that lead to the modern nation of Israel's arrival in 1948. But suffice to say, the Lord encouraged Christians in Britain and France and the United States primarily to support Zionism and allow Israel to have land after World War II and re-enter into that area. Even after the nation was formed, many believers have continued to provide political and financial support for Israel. All of this is simply to say that the Lord has been using both individual Christians and collective nations of the same to provide for an opportunity for support indirectly at a distance for a group of people who have long wanted to be where they are now. And yet at the same time, despite all that, they're not really secure in their land. They possess very little of what was originally granted them by God. They are constantly under attack. They have to defend their land daily. They do not have security or rest in their land. I mean, if, if you're not aware of these things, you don't have to turn on any news station for very long before you'll see exactly what we're talking about. They're there, but it's not easy. They have it, but they don't have everything. What they're getting, they're getting because of protectors and benefactors who are able to help them both establish a place in the land and hold on to it in the face of strong enemies. That's the relationship that you see Israel having now with the Christian world that God is using to support them. And that's the relationship you see with Naomi and Ruth. Naomi has what she has because of Ruth's work in the field of Boaz. She's in her land, but she's hardly secure. But then last week, and here's the turning point that we now study today. Last week in chapter 3... The relationship between Ruth and Boaz changed dramatically. Remember? At the end of chapter 2 and into chapter 3, you have the end of the harvest where you have threshing and winnowing beginning. Remember that we described this process last week. Threshing is this violent process of beating grain stalks until you separate the fruit from the chaff. Stalks of grain would be brought in, like I said, they'd throw them on this hard floor and they'd either crush them with the, with the hooves of heavy animals or they would use implements to beat them. But in either case, it's incredibly violent crushing of grain. 
And then the seeds were collected, remember? And they were separated from the chaff. That's winnowing. And then the seeds are piled up. And where we ended last time is Boaz lying next to this great pile of grain that he's gathered from his field. And Ruth laying there peacefully resting at his feet. Now, this section of the book of Ruth, chapter 3, reveals the plan that God has for bringing the church's work on earth to conclusion. It pictures the church's departure. It pictures the church's wedding to our groom, Christ. And if we're going to understand this picture, friends, you're going to have to first notice how the Bible describes the church's work serving Christ on earth. Listen to this passage from John, John 4, 35. Jesus says, Do not say... Well, there are yet four months, and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes, look on the fields, they are white for harvest. Already he who reaps is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for life eternal, so that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. Now I want you to notice some things. This is part of what we're going to do this morning, is we're going to notice how certain terms are used metaphorically in Scripture to represent greater concepts. And these don't change. The concepts hold all the way through Scripture, and they'll apply as well in the book of Ruth. And here's some early ones. First of all, John 4 describes the world, again, as a field. We've seen this before. Just as Boaz's field is Ruth's appointed place of service to him, the world is where you've been placed. John 17 says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you would keep them from the evil one. We're in the world for a reason, to work the field. And then John 4 describes the believers as the workers. And what are we assigned to do? Gather a harvest. Gather a harvest. What is a harvest? Harvest is seed. The seed of the world, if you will. And as we work it, Jesus says, we earn wages which are fruit for our life eternal. In other words, to the degree you serve Christ in this field, you are earning eternal reward, which you will see in the kingdom. Now, next turn to Matthew. In Matthew 9.37, Jesus says this. Then he says to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Here again, the metaphors continue, right? Still a field, still seeking grain, harvesting, if you will. Again, believers are the workers, but now we find out that Jesus doesn't have as many workers as he would like. That, in other words, the entire church is offered the opportunity to go out into the field and work, but as it turns out, not all do it. In fact, few, apparently, are willing to go do the real work of ministry in the sense of serving Christ in the field rather than serving self in the world. And what's such a shame about this is there are rewards waiting for everyone, but yet it seems as though because few believers take up the opportunity to actually go work for Christ in this way, that plentiful reward is going to be divided up among a minority in the kingdom. And then we turn to Matthew 13 to discover that a harvest is a picture in Scripture or a metaphor For the end of the age, this age of history in which the church is on the earth working to serve Christ. Look what he says in Matthew 13, 37. And he said, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. And the field is the world. Well, there's our confirmation. And as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom and the tares are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil and the harvest is the end of the age. Notice that the harvest is the end of the age. And the reapers, well, they're angels. So just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth his angels. He will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness. And he will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. But the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. Now time doesn't permit for a complete explanation of the meaning of this parable. If you want that, I encourage you to go into the Revelation study available online. But meanwhile, for our purposes today, what we're here to look for is to notice how these metaphors are used consistently. Jesus compares the end of our age to the harvest period in farming terms. Notice, however, that he did change one degree of imagery here. Now the field's still the world, yes, but now the seed represents believers in the world. So he's moved the metaphor forward into a new way. Rather than us reaping people as the reapers in the field, as the servants, now he's put us in the field and he's made the angels the reapers at the end of the age. All of this is simply to illustrate that God is using farming terms like harvests, like seed, to represent this notion of a period of time in which there is growth on the earth, opportunity on the earth, God using the believer, the church, to accomplish things in the earth, 
All of it resulting in the kingdom being built in the sense that we're recruiting citizens. We're building a people for a kingdom to come on earth in a future age. And that these things happen through the believer, through the church. Notice also, though, that there are those who are on the earth that are collected, so to speak, but they're not the fruit. They're the chaff. They're what gets winnowed and separated. So in this little metaphor, you have the planting represented, you have the harvesting represented, you have the threshing and the winnowing represented. The whole process is a way of explaining God growing up people on earth for himself, having others collecting them, as it were, by the preaching of the gospel, having that result ultimately at the end of the age in a separation of those who would go into the kingdom from those who will not. And many of you, if you've studied much eschatology, these pictures all make good sense. You understand the bigger scheme of things. Now, when we put all this together, we come to understand that the harvest in Ruth 3, then, pictures the end of an age, the end of the church age, to be specific. So that begs the question, what comes next for the church? And Israel, for that matter. Naomi, in other words. What is the end of the age going to bring? Well, you get your answer to those questions simply by looking at what happens to the characters in the story of Ruth. And, of course, in comparison with other scriptures. So let's examine the characters. Let's look, for example, at Ruth and Boaz. Last week we studied how Ruth came to Boaz, just as Naomi instructed, remember? And she's coming to remind him of his opportunity to act as a kinsman redeemer under the law. And to redeem her to become her husband. Now, even though Naomi was a Jewish widow as well, she also lacked a husband. And we said last week that according to the law, either woman could have been redeemed because neither has a husband, neither has any sons. But, friends, Naomi already had sons. Remember, she had two sons. And they amounted to nothing. And so, in a sense, her opportunity was squandered in that way. It's not as though she never had sons. They just didn't turn out right. Meanwhile, Ruth, well, Ruth has never had any sons. Ruth's husband died before any opportunity ever presented itself. Moreover, she's still young enough to produce children. So, though Boaz could have acted as Naomi's redeemer as well, Naomi and Ruth chose to let Ruth take that opportunity. And from the story, it's clear that Naomi is foregoing her opportunity. It's not as though they flipped a coin. It's not like whoever could run to Boaz faster. There was a conscious decision on Naomi's part to say, I will not go after him. You should go after him. Well, those details are revealing a picture of Israel's relationship with their Messiah. You know, when Israel's Redeemer came to them the first time, making himself available in the first century, Israel declined him. Israel as a nation turned against him, which in turn resulted in Christ redeeming others in the place of Israel, not to the exclusion of Israel and not to the exclusion of all Jews. As Paul says, there is a remnant even now. But in general, the church is Gentile. Just look around. It's not Jewish. In other words, Ruth married Boaz, not Naomi. And you see that truth reflected even in the parable of Luke 14. You know the parable in which there's a banquet set by the, the master for a great feast, and he has his invited guests. Luke 14:16. he said to them, A man was giving a big dinner, and he invited many. And at the dinner hour, he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. And the first one said to him, I bought a piece of land. I need to go out and look at it. Please consider me excused. Another one said, oh, I've bought five yoke of oxen. I'm going to try them out. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I've married a wife. And for that reason, I cannot come. And the slave came back and reported this to his master. And the head of the household became angry and said to his slave, We'll go out at once into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. And the slave said, Master, what you commanded has been done and still there is room. And the master said to the slave, Go out into the highways and along the hedges and compel them to come in so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste of my dinner. It's all picturing Israel's opportunity squandered when the Lord came in the first uh, instance. And in place of them, the Lord has directed the, the attention of the Spirit of God to the Gentiles of the world. That's why we see a Gentile church now in place of what could have been an Israel uh, Jewish kingdom in the day. Now, the mistake we can make if we're not careful is assuming that's the end of the story. That is to say that it's now all Gentile and forget about Israel. That's a false doctrine. The truth is it's only this way for a time. And again, the story of Ruth reflects that as we move further through it. For now, just understand, Naomi represents Israel passing over her opportunity to receive her Redeemer, and in place, another receives the redemption that could have been hers. That other, of course, is Ruth, the Gentile church. 
So then, what will come of Israel at the time of the end of this age, at the harvest? What's next for Naomi? What's next for the bride of Christ, for the Gentile church, for Ruth? Well, when the harvest comes, Israel will be in her land, just as Naomi is. But, like Naomi, Israel will be lacking rest and security. And most importantly, Naomi will still be lacking the Redeemer. So at the end of this age, Israel will still be lacking their Messiah, at least in the moment. Meanwhile, Christ will have proposed to his bride, to the church, and that moment takes place as the harvest comes to its end in the pitch black of night, with Naomi nowhere in sight. Let's review those elements real quickly. When the harvest comes to an end, as we see here in chapter 3, when Ruth receives a proposal from Boaz, while Naomi is on her own somewhere in the dark of the night, when there is violent threshing going on, when there is separation taking place, while Ruth is resting at the feet of Boaz in security, while Boaz is resting at a pile of grain having been collected and brought in from the field. All of that is going to happen at the same time. Now let's look at Scripture to see how all of those details line up to what is coming at the end of this age. First, let's look at the detail of night. All this happens at night, in darkness. And the Bible, particularly in the Old Testament, teaches that the period of judgment that culminates the end of this age is often compared to a period of darkness or night. Let me give you some examples. In Zephaniah, speaking of this period of judgment that ends our age, he calls it the day of darkness. Zephaniah 1.14, he says, Near is the great day of the Lord, near and coming very quickly. Listen, the day of the Lord. In it the warrior cries out bitterly. A day of wrath is that day, a day of trouble and distress, a day of destruction and desolation. Notice, a day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and thick darkness. A day of trumpet and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the high towers. I will bring distress on men so that they will walk like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord. And their blood will be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to deliver them on the day of the Lord's wrath. And all the earth will be devoured in the fire of his jealousy for he will make a complete end indeed a terrifying one of all the inhabitants of the earth. So as the prophet explains here to Israel, the Lord is going to bring distress, a great distress upon the entire earth. One of the ways in which we can say definitively that this has never come to pass yet is the way in which it speaks so clearly about the entirety of the earth. All inhabitants being affected never has any such thing come upon the earth, not to this degree. And he says this is a repayment to Israel for their sins against the Lord. And he calls it a day of gloom and darkness. Jeremiah tells Israel that this time of gloom and destruction is focused on them specifically. If you look at Jeremiah 32, 30 verse 2, he says, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, write all the words which I have spoken to you in a book. For behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will restore the fortunes of my people, Israel and Judah, the Lord says. I will also bring them back to the land. Notice that. I will bring them back to the land and I will give to their forefathers and they shall possess it. Now, these are the words which the Lord spoke concerning Israel and concerning Judah. For thus says the Lord, I have heard a sound of terror, of dread, and there is no peace. Ask now and see if a male can give birth. Why do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in childbirth? Why have all their faces turned pale? Well, alas, for that day is great. There is none like it. It is a time of Jacob's distress, but he will be saved from it. It shall come about on that day, declares the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke off his neck and I will tear off their bonds and strangers will no longer make them their slaves, but they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. Notice a few details in this prophecy concerning Israel. First, he confirms a period of great calamity is planned for the world and for Israel. Next, these events occur, he says, after Israel's been brought back into the land. Friends, this again confirms that Naomi's return into the land. That's a picture of Israel's regathering before a time of judgment. Notice also in verse 7, he calls it the time of Jacob's troubles. Friends, Jacob is another name for Israel. This is a time of great distress upon the whole world. But why does it happen? For Israel. It's a time of Israel's troubles. Nevertheless, he says in verse 7, Israel will not perish in it. It's not intended to destroy the nation. It's ultimately intended to bring them back to God. 
Now, earlier in the study of Ruth, I read a passage from Ezekiel 20. I'm going to go back there again. Let's reread it now. Let's continue to build how these pictures come together. Chapter 20, verse 33. As I live, declares the Lord, surely with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and notice with wrath poured out, I shall be king over you. I will bring you out from the peoples and gather you from the lands where you are scattered and with a mighty hand, with outstretched arm and notice and with wrath poured out. Stop there for just a moment. The scripture is very clear. The return of Israel and the regathering of Israel is to be accompanied by God pouring out such great wrath as has never been seen on the earth ever before or after. Well, we've seen the regathering. We're waiting for the next shoe to drop. Going forward from there. He says, I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples and there I will enter into judgment with you face to face. As I enter into judgment with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so I will enter into judgment with you, declares the Lord God. I will make you pass under the rod and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. And I will purge from you the rebels and those who transgress against me. And I will bring them out of the land where they sojourn, but they will not enter the land of Israel. Thus, you will know that I am the Lord. Now, when I first read this passage in this study, we read it when we were briefly discussing how Naomi's return to the land is picturing Israel's return in the last days of the age. So we've, we've looked at that side of it before. But now what I want you to take note of, this gathering or regathering takes place during a period of judgment or in conjunction with judgment. Ezekiel says, I love this phrase, he says, Israel's going to be made to pass under the rod. Now, in our politically correct culture, this is a term that's starting to lose its meaning. Unless you were raised by an authoritarian father, in which case you know what it means to pass under the rod, right? So whether it's your preference or not, the scripture speaks of a rod in the sense of a disciplining instrument on children. And to pass under the rod is a way of saying to feel the sting of it so as to reform your ways. And here you see God using that metaphor to describe what he's going to do to Israel. His outpouring of judgment at the end of the age in conjunction with their regathering. In fact, as he said, they're regathered for judgment. It's almost as if, like the mother says, wait till your dad gets home, meanwhile stay in your room. It's like God put Israel in the room so he can come home with the switch. That's the idea of this regathering. Since 1948, we've watched them going to their room. We're waiting for the switch. And of course, since it impacts the whole of the earth, we're all kind of hoping we don't have to be there for it. And certainly we'll talk about that here in a while. Meanwhile, Israel is going to be disciplined in order, it says, to bring them back into the bond of a covenant that they are breaking. And that covenant is the old covenant, the one given through Moses. They took a covenant at the mountain, they failed to keep it, and they are due the judgments that the covenant prescribes. And we're waiting to see God carry out that, that order. Ezekiel also describes this time of Jacob's troubles as a period of darkness, a time when the world suffers under God's outpouring. So as we seek to understand what's going to happen to the church at the end of the age, and for that matter to Israel at this harvest time, our first clue is that this event is associated with darkness, which is a picture of great distress on the earth. So clue number one is that the story of Ruth is in darkness because that's telling you this is the judgment moment coming at the end of the age, at the harvest. Clue number two. Clue number two is that at this same time, there's going to be threshing and winnowing. Of the harvest. You know, the grain of a wheat kernel is so dense, it's so strong, that you can lay all of the, the grain stalks down on a hard surface like a stone, and you can have an oxen, I'm talking about you know, a thousand pound animal, walk on it, and it doesn't break up the grain. You would think maybe the grain would turn to flour, but it doesn't. The grain is strong enough to hold up under that pressure. But everything else is just crushed into little pieces, which is what allows them then to go to the next step of winnowing, of separating one from the next. John the Baptist describes Jesus in the Gospels as the one who carries a winnowing fork and goes to a threshing floor to separate wheat from chaff. In Luke 3.16, John answered and said to them all, As for me, I baptize you with water, but one is coming who is mightier than I, and I'm not fit to untie the thong of his sandals. He'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to thoroughly clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. And he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So Jesus is the one who applies the pressure at the end of the harvest. 
He's the one that does the threshing and the winnowing. And did you notice where he brings his grain? He takes his grain to himself, to his barn, as the metaphor goes here. Or perhaps we could say piles it up next to him while he sleeps in the darkness. See the picture? Isaiah describes how the Lord will strike his own people in this way in chapter 27. He says this, Isaiah 27, 6. In the days to come, Jacob will take root, Israel will blossom and sprout. That's a picture of their regathering again. And they will fill the whole world with fruit. Like the striking of him who has struck them, has he struck them? Or like the slaughter of his slain, have they been slain? He's asking rhetorically, has God ever struck Israel in the way that he plans to strike them in this future moment? And rhetorically, the answer is no. In other words, have they ever seen God do to them what he's about to go do to them? That's what he's asking. And you go down a little further in that text of 27, and Isaiah says this, In that day, the Lord will start his threshing from the flowing stream of the Euphrates to the brook of Egypt, and you will be gathered up one by one, O sons of Israel. Now look at that metaphor for a second. So Israel is being compared to a people who have filled the earth. They're scattered all over the world as God has appointed them, right? And then it's time for him to start reaping them. And he's going to go through like a reaper, taking all the stocks, laying them down, crushing them, and then picking them out one at a time. So in other words, to be harvested, that is for Israel to be returned to their Messiah, they're first going to have to go through a pretty violent process in which they are crushed, separated, pulled out, and he's going to do it one at a time. It's like a father saying, you know what, you've messed up and you deserve a beating and I'm going to get it one swat at a time. It's not intended to hurt. It's not intended to destroy. It's intended to bring someone to the good place they should have been all along, to the place they've been promised to be taken. But it's going to be done through a disciplining process. So this coming period of judgment for Israel, as required under the old covenant, for their disobedience, is compared in scripture to like the threshing, the beating of grain. And the one we're told who's going to accomplish this, treading, the one who holds the winnowing fork, well, it's Jesus, the Lord. And it results in a glorious future for Israel. Like we heard earlier in the text I read earlier, they will be saved out of this coming time of gloom and darkness. That's clue number two. Clue number one, time of darkness equals time of judgment. Clue number two is that a time of threshing and winnowing at the end of a harvest is a picture of God through the disciplining of his judgments, bringing the people of God to where they should be. Finally, to a third clue, which is Boaz, as we said, at the base of his pile of grain and Ruth resting at his feet throughout the whole period of the night. You notice we studied this last week. Ruth was told to stay there the whole night. Don't get up at any point during the night. The night is not something for you. Stay here with me. Remember that? Where's Naomi again? Oh yeah, she's in the darkness. She's not resting anywhere. She's alone, going through the night without Ruth. It's as if Boaz has gathered up Ruth as he has gathered up his grain. And just as he is sleeping next to his grain to protect it, he's sleeping with Ruth to protect her through this period of darkness, through this period of night. She has, in a sense, received her rest that night with her husband-to-be, even as Naomi, still seeking her rest, is alone and out there in the darkness by herself. Now, we read earlier in Matthew 13 that Jesus compares the end of this age to a harvest, right? And we know Ruth is a picture of the church. And so we see the church gathered to Christ at the end of the age and spending this entire period of darkness with him in security. So while there is a period of darkness and gloom appointed for Israel, that time of darkness and gloom is not appointed for the bride of Christ, who instead is protected by her groom throughout that period of darkness. In addition to the name, the time of Jacob's troubles, this period of darkness and gloom and destruction and judgment, it goes by other names in Scripture, names you may have heard before. Let me read you some examples. You have the Scriptures there in front of you. In Ezekiel 30, verse 3, speaking of this same coming judgment, Ezekiel says, For the day is near, even the day of the Lord is near. It will be a day of clouds, a time of doom for the nations. Notice the term, the day of the Lord. Joel 1.15, alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is near and it will come as a destruction from the Almighty. Day of the Lord. Joel 2.11, the Lord utters his voice before his army. Surely his camp is very great, for strong is he who carries out his word. The day of the Lord is indeed great and very awesome, and who can endure it? Amos 5.18, Alas, you who are longing for the day of the Lord, for what purpose will the day of the Lord be to you? It will be darkness and not light. 
And then Malachi 4, 5, he says, Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. Notice the consistency in Scripture whenever this day is mentioned, whenever this period. And and by the way, you can tell, obviously, that the Bible is using the term day of the Lord, not in reference to a literal 24-hour day. It's, It's a way of picturing this time, this period, this season. And it's a season that keeps getting described in exactly the same ways. Darkness, gloom, calamity, tumult, awesome but terrible. Who can endure it? Right? I mean, there's just no comparison in history. This is not some regional war, not some small skirmish. This is something that the world has yet to see and can barely even consider in advance. Joel asks, who can endure it? Friends, taking that same concept, the day of the Lord, and by the way, if, you, if you've studied eschatology and you've never noticed this, here's a great pointer for you to help keep things straight in your understanding. The term day of the Lord is used consistently both in the Old and the New Testament to mean this period of coming calamity. It does not describe the second coming of Christ. That's not what day of the Lord means. It does not refer to his second coming. It does not refer to the rapture. It does not refer to any of these things sometimes we assign to the word because it seems to us to mean that. Contextually, it always describes the same thing. A time or period of great calamity and judgment brought upon the whole of the earth by God because of Israel, for Israel. The New Testament uses this same term. We find Paul explaining to the church what will come amongst these events on this day. And then you find this in a long passage I've given you there from 1 Thessalonians, starting in chapter 4.13. He says, I do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, or we would say dead, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. And therefore comfort one another with these words. Now as to the times and the epochs Brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord, there's the term, will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, well then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, you're not in darkness, see the term? You're not in the darkness that that day would overtake you like a thief, for you are all sons of light, sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'd love to have the time to exposit the whole passage for you. Again, if you're interested, go take the Revelation study. But the sense of what we need today is pretty evident, isn't it? Paul takes the same term we've been studying, the day of the Lord. And he describes it as a a day of doom and gloom, of night, of darkness, of a time of destruction, like a thief coming in the night. You hear all that, right? And then he adds very quickly to the church, you all don't have to worry about that day because you're not in the darkness. This day is not for you. You're not appointed to this wrath. Well, then you would ask, well, how is it we're not going to experience it if it comes upon the whole earth? And, of course, his answer was in the preceding section I just read. Because before the day of the Lord kicks off, Jesus will have come, the coming of the Lord, he calls it, and will have taken to himself Ruth, the grain, the church, putting it at his feet, so to speak, in comfort, out of the world. He says, we'll be leaving the world. Those who have died in Christ will be resurrected first. Those of us who may still be alive on the earth at this moment will simply be moved directly off earth and into the presence of the Lord, and we will be with him forever. We call this, as you may know, the rapture. So the rapture's purpose, fundamentally, is to remove Ruth so that Naomi gets her intended judgment, but Ruth isn't collateral damage. Ruth gets married to Boaz, that is to say we get introduced to our groom in this dramatic fashion. As a night of darkness ensues, a judgment period is coming. And that judgment can fall upon its intended audience without coming against people who were not intended to receive it. It's a great escape hatch. And it's planned so that God can be just in all respects, not only to those under the covenant given to Israel, but also to those of us in the new covenant who have no relationship to the old and therefore we are not due any of its penalties to include the curses that are ultimately coming upon the earth. So let's end with this summary. From what we've studied through the first two-thirds of chapter 3, 
A dark time is coming on the entire earth. It is a time when the Lord brings judgment against Israel for Israel's sins under the Old Covenant. The violence of that time has been compared to a threshing floor, a severe beating that has the effect of separating fruit from chaff. Jesus is the winnower. He'll be the one to collect his grain, that is to remove the church from the earth, and place it in his barn. That time of darkness is called many things, the time of Jacob's troubles, the day of the Lord, but you may know it's also called tribulation. The threshing of God's judgment comes not only upon the nation of Israel, but also upon the whole of the world. But while it's happening, Ruth, the church, will be spending that night, that period of darkness, safely at Boaz's feet, at our Lord's feet, outside harm's way. That's a beautiful picture of the church raptured and removed before the calamity God brings. For those of you who have often wondered, are we supposed to be here for any or all of the tribulation? Are we pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, if you know what I'm talking about? Ruth is one of many places you can go in Scripture to definitively illustrate that the church is removed prior to the day of darkness, prior to the time of judgment. Because, as Paul says, we are not appointed to it. Finally, that rescue culminates with a proposal. Let's think about how the story ended last week. Ruth invited that proposal, and what do we hear happening at the end? Boaz then extends the offer, basically saying, your next in kin needs to refuse first, but if he won't do it, I will do it. Effectively saying, one way or the other, you're going to be married. And hopefully it will be him. I'm sure that was the feeling Ruth had. Likewise, the church will be wed to Christ following our removal from the earth. We see that in the last passage you have for the morning in Revelation 19, 5. And a voice came from the throne saying, Give praise to our Lord, all you his bondservants. That's speaking to you and I. You who fear him, the small and the great. Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude and like the sound of many waters, like the sound of mighty peals of thunder saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. And it will be given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Verses 6 and 7, that's you. The scripture just quoted you. That is, in our collective form as the church, that's us saying those words according to Scripture. In a future day, having been removed from the church, brought into the presence of the Lord and prepared for this wedding, these are the words you and I will speak. You've already got your script. You might want to memorize it now. It's going to come in handy later. This is the moment of the proposal or the the wedding, if you will, that's pictured by Boaz extending his grace to Ruth at night at the pile of grain. Next week, we're going to pick up again. In the story of Naomi and Ruth, moving forward now in the first story again, back to where the events of the story go. And then from there, of course, we'll come back into the second story as we continue to to see how the one story pictures the next. And as you move forward, we're going to be watching the work of Boaz now. We've really focused entirely, for the most part, on Ruth and Naomi, on the church and Israel, and how these two are moving into the end of the age. But friends, it all comes together in a Redeemer. Amen? I mean, if it's not for Christ, none of this stuff matters. And the rest of the story, by and large, now focuses on all that has to happen from the Redeemer in order for all of these things to happen. How is it you and I can be a church? How can we enter into heaven? How can Naomi eventually receive the things she's been promised? It all centers on a Redeemer doing all the work. And from here in in the story, we're looking at our Redeemer, bringing together the fortunes of Ruth and Naomi in his own grace, in his own work. That's where we go next. I hope you'll join us. Thank you for your, your patience today. I'm sure you got a little bit of a fire hose there. That's okay. You have the rest of the week to think about it. We'll come back next week and we'll pick up again. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and then we'll finish today. Since it's the first day of the month, we'll finish when a time of communion. Father, I pray that in the short time I had and in the weakness of my own ability that I was successful to your satisfaction in stitching together the truth of your scripture. Perhaps I missed some things, Father. Perhaps I misstated some things. Certainly wouldn't surprise anyone in this room to find out that I'm not perfect. Father, I ask then that you would be the one who would stitch this together properly. If if I manage to make some mistake, Father, you can correct it, and I pray you would, and to your own glory. But to the extent it is true and reflective of your word, Father, I also pray that you would explain it again in the hearts of those who've heard so that they would not receive it as if it came just from a man, but they would hear it as from you, an appointed moment, a, a date you set so that they could hear things they needed to know. If perhaps it's given encouragement to those who were fearing things they didn't need to fear, well then, thank you for that, Father. 
if perhaps it corrected some theology that has hampered our understanding of things, Father, thank you for that, Father. If it gave us something entirely new, if it opened our eyes wide to the power that you have to do things like this and to, to make the world come to its appointed end, then, Father, thank you for that, for we can never have a high enough understanding of you. Whatever it accomplished in our hearts, Father, we give you the glory for that and thank you for it. Let us enter into that time of communion now, Father, prepared to reflect not only on what you will do, but also on what you have done. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Dear Father, I thank you, Father, that you have entrusted to me and to the other leaders in this church the privilege of ministering in, at Oak Hill Bible Church and to the people who have been gathered here under your name for so many years. Father, the, the work of serving you is a, a work of joy, even if at times we find a way to turn it into burden. And serving you, Father, has such great reward, even if it seems to be nothing but an expense. And that's only because of the way we look at things in our selfishness, Father, and the way we add up our, our own desires and put them ahead of yours. But, Lord, when we put it in the right perspective and we see this work as eternal and when we understand how important your people are to you, it's then that we begin to understand the privilege that we have. And not just myself and elders at this church, Father, but every man and woman who has come to serve in some capacity has taken on that burden with us. And together, Father, we seek to serve in thankful hearts for what you've done for us on the cross. And I thank you for a building, for a room in which we come together to remember that sacrifice, to understand it better, to be prepared to explain it to others, so that we would always be ready to make a defense for the hope that lies within us, Father. Thank you for the opportunity to know the things you've given us in your word. And Lord, as I speak today, Father, I pray that you would have mercy on me as a teacher, that you would be able to speak clearly, though I can't, and that you'd be able to explain things in the hearts of those who hear, even when I'm unable to do it. We rely on that, Father. Thank you for that grace this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, we are approaching the climactic moment in our short story of Ruth, although I have found a way to make it long. Um, <laughs> This is the story of Ruth and Boaz now at the end of three, and, and really it becomes a story of Boaz in four. As it really should be, as we know, Boaz is a picture of Christ, and since all that we have in our faith is centered on Christ, it's only appropriate then that a story that pictures him should eventually focus entirely on his work. Where we are in the story now, having come near the end of chapter 3, is Ruth has followed Naomi's instructions on the night of the harvest. She's approached Boaz respectfully, according to what Naomi told her to do. And in that approach, he took up her invitation for a marriage proposal. She invited the proposal, and she was rewarded with Boaz's promise that he would redeem her one way or another. At the end of that, Ruth spent the evening with Boaz without anyone being the wiser, so that Boaz's reputation would not be compromised. But now Boaz has also told Ruth there was a problem, that it's not all smooth sailing. We have the problem now of a legal hurdle. There's a closer relative, he tells Ruth, that must be dealt with before Boaz can act to redeem her. That's where we left off last time. We're at the end of chapter 3. Let's pick up again in that conversation in verse 11 and then to the end of the chapter and into chapter 4 this morning. Ruth 3.11, it reads, Now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you whatever you ask, for all my people in the city know that you are a woman of excellence. Now, it is true, I am a close relative, however, there is a relative closer than I. Remain this night, and when morning comes, if he will redeem you, good, let him redeem you. But if he does not wish to redeem you, then I will redeem you, as the Lord lives. Lie down until morning. So, she lay at his feet until morning and rose before one could recognize another. And he said, let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. Again, he said, Give me the cloak that is on you and hold it. So she held it. And he measured six measures of barley and laid it on her. Then she went into the city. When she came to her mother-in-law, she said, How did it go, my daughter? And she told her all that the man had done for her. She said, These six measures of barley he gave to me. For he said, Do not go to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Then she said, Wait, my daughter, until you know how the matter turns out. For the man will not rest until he has settled it today. 
So as we rejoin the story, we saw again last week some of the same verses. So we remember Boaz explaining to Ruth that he was prohibited from acting on her behalf because there is this closer relative, this other man that doesn't get named in the story, who is a step closer to her in relations. And the Hebrew word here translated closer relative, it is the word for kinsman redeemer. So what Boaz has just said, in effect, is... I can't redeem you because I am not legally the kinsman redeemer in this case. I'm not the one appointed by law. The other man is technically the one who must act to redeem you. But then he adds, look, if this man's not going to step up to the plate and do what the law requires that he do for you, well, then he says, I am prepared to step in and assume that responsibility in his place. Now, I've said before, Boaz was not obligated to do anything that he's doing here. He's voluntarily assuming the role in the case where Ruth is found to be lacking a redeemer. Meanwhile, Boaz protects Ruth through the rest of that night. You know, we looked last week at the eschatology of this chapter. That is, in the way that Boaz pictures Christ, Ruth pictures the church, and Naomi pictures Israel. And at this moment, at night, at the threshing floor, and so on, we studied last week how this is a picture of the church having been removed from the earth, raptured as we say, brought to our Savior at His feet, so to speak, in safety, during a period of night, that is a darkness on the earth, a time of reaping. All of these things picture the tribulation that will come to Israel in the absence of the church after we've been removed and taken to be safe with our Redeemer. And now, back to the main story, just consider the reality of what happens in practical terms. You have a woman who is alone, she's single, obviously, she's uh, out at night, so if Boaz were to have told her at this point, okay, we got our plan, go on home, I'll see you tomorrow, that would have been a very callous thing for him to do. This would have put her safety at great risk. A young girl walking alone at night was a recipe for disaster. And Boaz protects her, he puts her safety above even his own Reputation, Because had it been the case that someone out there had come along in the middle of the night and noticed that there was this woman lying at the feet of this man, both of them single, not married to one another, that would have put his reputation at risk. Or at the very least, there would have been the insinuation that something was going on. And gossip sometimes is worse, often is worse, than the truth. So Boaz protects her at his own risk. And in keeping the visit secret, Boaz is also protecting her. You notice it says there that he gives direction in verse 14 to his servants. Don't repeat what you've seen. Don't tell anyone that she has come here. He's protecting her reputation as well. Because for the same reason, if word got out that she's going out in the middle of the night and spending evenings with strange men, that isn't going to serve her well in this culture either. Now, just to be clear, Boaz is not asking his servants to lie. And I want you to be clear on this. Because no one was going to ask them about something that wasn't publicly known anyway. It's not as though they were going to have this question put to them. What he's asking them for here is discretion. He's asking them to simply not say anything so as not to encourage gossip or lying. Because nothing did go wrong. Everything was perfectly appropriate. By not mentioning it, you don't give opportunity for those who have false intentions of turning that innocent situation into something that it wasn't. Furthermore, Boaz continues to care for Ruth and for Naomi's needs, even in the midst of all this planning. You notice that he gives her this grain. Now, in the past, God has allowed for these women to see their provision come through Boaz, but by means of gleaning. Remember, Ruth would go out every day and she'd glean in the field. That's how they were getting their provision. But friends, it's the harvest, right? No more gleaning. No more harvest. All the stuff that was in the field is gone now. And yet... God is still providing, and Boaz is still concerned with their needs. So he gives Ruth a portion of grain to take home, not just for herself, but as you heard, he was also thinking of Naomi in the process. Now the text here says six measures of barley, and the word there for measure doesn't relate to any specific measure. It's not ephah or something like that. It's just a generic word for an amount, six amounts. Six widgets. It doesn't have any specific meaning. And therefore, what likely it means is it's not a specific measurement. It was, it was Boaz just taking that pile of grain that was sitting next to him and just grabbing six scoopfuls and just going like this. So it's not a lot. It's plenty. It's enough for two women to eat for you know, a couple of days, three days, four days. It's certainly not a lifetime supply. It's nothing like a bushel was where it would last a month. 
So the fact that he sent her home with enough grain for a few days, that in itself is an indication to us of how quickly Boaz expects to act on this matter. Remember, there's no more gleaning, so whatever he gave her at this point, that's all they're going to have, and there's no prospect for more. They don't really know where the next meal would be coming from. But what Boaz is thinking is, these women are not going to be alone for long. One way or another, they're soon going to have a marriage which will then result in a provision, so they only need a few days' worth of grain to get by until this matter is settled. And when Ruth gets the report to Naomi, and Naomi sees what Ruth has received in the amount of grain that she's carrying in this bundle, well then she says to her daughter, don't worry, just wait, this matter is going to get resolved quickly. In fact, she says, today. How does she know that? It's my supposition that she knows it because of the relatively small amount of grain that has just been given to these women. She can see that Boaz does not expect to have to wait very long because he didn't make provision for any longer. And sure enough, Boaz does act quickly. And now that takes us into chapter 4. And as I said, we're really now looking at Boaz as the central character of the story. He's always been in the background. Now he comes to the foreground. Verse 1. Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there, and behold, the close relative of whom Boaz spoke was passing by. So he said, turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. He took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. All right, let's stop there. There's a lot of intrigue here that I think is fun to bring out in the story, and it'll help us really understand what's going on. So this is the next morning, right? So he didn't wait at all. And he goes to the gate of the city. Now, if you're not familiar with ancient uh, architecture or the way that cities worked in, in ancient times, it, it would perhaps surprise you to hear that everybody's meeting at the gate. You might wonder, why is everybody at the gate? Well, that, the, the reality of this situation is a consequence of the way cities protected themselves in this day and time. Cities in ancient times were surrounded by high walls. That was their principal means of protection. If you've traveled anywhere in that part of the world, you'll know. You see these old ruins, and they always have some kind of wall in some condition today, but you can see where it was. And of course, if you're in a city and you have a big wall around you, there's got to be some way to get in and out of the city, obviously, right? And when you add a gate to a fortified wall, you instantly make that place in the wall the most vulnerable part of the wall and the weakest link in your security. So it's a double-edged sword in a sense, right? You want to get in and out, but you don't want the bad guys to get in and out, and yet you can't really get one without the other. If you open the gate to let the city's residents go in and out, then you're also opening it to anyone who might be hiding ready to pounce on the city in that moment. And, of course, they don't just open the door when someone knocks. This isn't, knock, knock, who's there? Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar who? No. You know, they don't, it doesn't work that way, right? So gates were actually fortified chambers. They're not the kind of thing you think of today when we say gate. You need to think of a room. It's a fortified chamber of rooms, actually, because these walls were thick enough, and they were especially thick at the gates, so that it wasn't just a single brick line. They would actually create a full structure inwardly into the city at the point of the gate, so that what the gate was was not a single entry into the city at all. The visitor would first come to an outer door. That outer door, if it were open, allowed you to pass into a chamber which had inside all of these other rooms to the left and to the right. So it's a larger structure. You're still in the wall, though. You haven't even gotten into the city yet. Inside that chamber, you have guards stationed at the top where the wall top is. So you have the the top of the wall going around the city. When it gets to the point of the gate, it goes left and right and comes out as a big square before continuing on on the next side to the rest of the wall. And along that top area, you have guards stationed all around. They can see down into the chamber that is created at that entry point. So if by chance an army breaches that outer door and manages to fight their way into the chamber, well, there's another door on the other side that they'd have to breach as well. That second door is what gets you into the city. But it takes time to breach a door. And while you're in that little chamber trying to breach the second door, you're sitting ducks. It's like shooting fish in a barrel. All the folks up on the top of the wall, arrows or spears, are taking out the people who are in the chamber. So it's an effective defense because of the way it slows penetration into the city while giving you an advantage in the battle for the gate. All right, so this is the way architecture evolved over history was to create these gates, these chambered rooms as entry points. Nevertheless, a city is is ultimately a place of commerce. 
you know, people from the surrounding areas outside the city are going to want to travel regularly in and out of the city to conduct business on a daily basis. Typically at night, everything was locked up tight. And then at a certain point in every day, they'd open them up for business. But when people are coming in and out of the city to buy and to sell, the ones who live in the city don't necessarily want just anyone walking in. You want to know who they are and why they're coming in. So if someone needed to come into the city, either to conduct official business with leaders of the city or to do commerce, obviously to do trade, they had to go through these gates and they were typically going to be vetted. They were going to be inspected to know who they were, why they were coming in, and so on. And if you're not coming in to do business in the city, you're just coming in to do some kind of official matter with the leadership, well, then we'd rather you not get into the city at all, because then we might lose track of you. Let's just keep you as little in the city as possible. So a practice developed to bring the leadership, the judges, the elders, or whomever, from the inside of the city, out to the gates. And they actually set up their courts or their official rooms of business in the chambers of the gate. So if you were outside the city and you needed to do business, you could come into the chamber, do business, and then leave and never actually have access into the city proper. That was the idea. So these chambers became something like little bazaars where merchants were lined up selling and trading within this space, where you had other chambers that were like city hall. You have judges holding court. You'd have elders having meetings. And so the chambers of a city became a very vibrant, important part of the life of a city and yet they still serve this purpose of protection. So when you hear that Boaz goes into the gate of the city, and of course, as you may remember from chapter 1, the city here is Bethlehem. We're talking about the city of Bethlehem. So if you ever go visit the city of Bethlehem, and you see some of the ruins of the gates, one of those gates Boaz was sitting in. So in a gate of the city of Bethlehem, what you need to understand is that's like saying Boaz just went to city hall. And so he goes there early in the morning precisely so that he can catch this relative, this other man, as he is leaving the city for the day, probably to go work the fields during the harvest as well. So he loiters, essentially, in this gate for a while, watching everyone who's walking through, and then he sees the guy he's waiting for. And as he sees him, he goes up to this man, and he says, turn aside, which simply means, hey, stop for a second, very friendly greeting, and asks him to sit down. I assume the man knew Boaz, they're related after all, so he probably stopped in response to the greeting, and he's just expecting to sit down, catch up, hey, how you doing? That's perfectly normal. Um, but the fact that he's doing it in the gate of the city might have suggested that he had a more serious purpose. And if the guy had any doubt at all, the next moment... All doubt is erased because Boaz assembles ten men from among the elders of the city. So I have to imagine he has pre-positioned that. He has already gone to these guys, said, I have a meeting, I conduct some business, I need you ready. I'm waiting for this other guy to show up. When he shows up, we'll meet. You know, it's, it's almost like he's just been ambushed, right? The guy walks through and his friend says, hey, come on, sit down. Oh, yeah, hey, how are you doing? And all of a sudden, bam, ten other guys sit down. He's like, what did I do wrong? What's going on? It would appear as though Boaz had every intention to catch this guy a little off guard. And as you'll see with what goes on next, he's playing a game of sorts here without sinning with an eye toward a certain outcome. He's very shrewd. He's going to be a really good example for us as we go through this next part of the story of something Jesus says in the Gospels to the disciples shortly before his death. He says they were to be as wise as serpents, but as innocent as doves which is a tension that every Christian is supposed to maintain in their walk with Christ, which is to say, we are supposed to at all times be without sin. That would be innocent as a dove. But that doesn't mean we have to be naive. It doesn't mean we don't have to be creative. And while sometimes we mistake creativity for lying or deception, and that is certainly the case for some people, that's not a necessity. There can be a very firm line between sin and doing things that are creative, that are even, to some people's impression, manipulative, but all with a heart to do what's right for God and what's godly and what's righteous and without sin. In fact, if you've ever been a missionary in parts of the world where Christianity is not embraced or is, in fact, persecuted, China would be the example we use this morning from what the Dexters are doing. When I was there visiting them in China, it's evident that they have really learned this skill of being as wise as a serpent and as innocent as doves. They do not break laws, they do not sin, but they do everything they can to get around the persecution that is there around them in order to do what they're there to do. It's a really interesting kind of mix. Boaz is a perfect biblical example of this kind of thinking. He is being incredibly creative 
and very intentional. He has an outcome. He's trying to get everybody to go where he wants them to go, but he's not going to sin in the process. So this is what comes next. With Boaz and his relative and these ten men assembled in the gate, what's just come to pass now is an official inquiry. These guys are elders. They're not all the elders. We're told these are ten of them. But these men, a collection of ten now, form not so much a jury, because this isn't a trial, more of a witness to something. For legal purposes, there needs to be a witness to say that something actually happened, that it was formally done. So these guys are going to form a group of witnesses to witness what's about to be settled between these two men concerning law. So no man is going to be able to go back on his word. No one's going to be able to claim that there was a misunderstanding. No guy's going to be able to say this didn't happen. It's all going to be on record. That's the effect of what Boaz is doing. These elders never say anything. They don't need to. The conversation is just between the two parties that have an issue here. And by the way, I should add, when this conversation is over, the matter will be finished. Boaz will be able to say it is finished when he deals with this issue and it is complete. Verse 3, this is what takes place. Then Boaz said to the closest relative, Naomi, who's come back from the land of Moab, has to sell the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. So, I thought to inform you, saying, Buy it before those who are sitting here and before the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am after you. Then he said, Well, I will redeem it. To understand what Boaz is doing here, you have to know a little bit about the laws of this time and the customs. So let's begin with with where Boaz begins. He starts the conversation announcing to this relative, you remember Naomi? You know, the wife of our brother, Elimelech. You know, she's come back. Oh, yeah, yeah, she's come back. I heard things weren't so good with her. Yeah, it's tough times. She's kind of fallen on bad times. In fact, she's uh, got that property, you know, Elimelech's old property. She's received it now that she has come back in the land, but um, it's not doing well. You know, this property, remember, was left fallow for 10 years. No one's been farming it. And if you've ever worked land, you know if you leave it for 10 years, what kind of work now has to happen to get it back to the point of being productive. That's not the work that a widow without a son is going to have the strength to pursue. And as a result, though she has wealth in the form of this land, it's not capital that she can put to use to support her because she can't work the land. And she doesn't have money to go pay workers to work the land. I mean, she's in sort of that catch-22 where she has something that can't work for her and she has nothing more to put it to work. And so under those circumstances, she probably did have no choice but to consider selling this property. Now, with the funds from selling it, she could then go and provide for herself for a while. Now, the law of Moses addresses this very situation specifically in Leviticus. This is what it says in Leviticus 25:24. Thus, for every piece of your property, you are to provide for the redemption of the land. If a fellow countryman of yours becomes so poor, he has to sell part of his property, and that would be Naomi, then his nearest kinsman, there you go again, a kinsman redeemer, is to come and buy back what his relative has sold. So, in other words, Naomi has to sell to provide for herself. She has to sell to survive. But under those circumstances, the law wanted to make sure that the property didn't leave the family, the tribe. And so to make sure it didn't get sold out of the family's control, it had to be sold within the family. Or if it had been sold outside the family, then someone in the family had to go redeem it. That is, buy it back for the family. That's the idea of a redeemer in this case. So the intent of the law is to let the family hold on to their land. What Boaz is suggesting then to this relative is, you know when Naomi sells it that we want to keep this in the family. You're the kinsman redeemer. You're probably the oldest son or some other way he's the closest relative. You have first dibs on this property. Would you like to buy this land? Now, if the man wouldn't buy it, Boaz says, well, I'm prepared to do that. I'd like to have this land. Boaz would buy it if the other relative declines. So here's what Boaz is betting. Boaz is betting that the opportunity to purchase land is going to be too good an opportunity for this relative to pass up. I mean, he's naturally going to jump at the chance to enrich himself through a distress purchase without a bidding war with anyone else. This is the perfect way to buy land, right? A good deal, a brother-in-law deal on some good land. Finally, notice that Boaz says there, Elimelech was a brother to these men. Now, we can't be sure he means it literally. He could just mean it in a general sense as a relative. But regardless, what he's saying is these men, Boaz and this other relative, they share a blood relationship, something we'll talk about next week. 
Immediately, the man says, as you see, okay, yeah, I'll take it. Good deal for me. Why not? I'll buy the land. Which is exactly what Boaz knew he would say. Boaz has played this guy and done it well. He has drawn this man out into the open. Remember, the law places no timetable on the actions of a kinsman redeemer. There's no deadlines. This relative has the right of first refusal. No one else can act until he makes a decision. And yet, the law doesn't put any timetable on his decision. So, theoretically, legally, he could defer forever. He could just never make a decision which would freeze everybody else. No one else could act in the meantime. Boaz knows that he has to act for the sake of these women in the meantime. He can't wait. And he's trying to draw this guy out. So here's what he's done. By offering the land first, he has brought this man out of indecisiveness, off the fence, so to speak, and forced him to commit to whether or not he will accept the kinsman redeemer role. He's done it now. He said, I will do it in front of ten witnesses. He's made a decision. And by committing to buy the land, there's something else that happens. He has officially assumed the role of kinsman redeemer for Naomi's family. That's a brilliant tactic because he gave the man an incentive to act rather than to defer. And now with the land as a bait, the guy has stepped up to the plate. Now I want you to try to help you understand the strategy here by using an analogy. I want to draw a parallel to something that could happen for us today. I want you to suppose that my brother had found this great used car for sale. The car belonged to an older man who barely ever drove it. It only has 10,000 miles on it. And now he's gone, he's died, and his widow is trying to sell the car cheap. This is the deal we all dream of, right? So the car's a steal, and I really want to buy it, but my brother found it first. He saw it first, and so, you know, I really can't swoop in underneath him and buy the car while he's thinking about it. I really need to give him first chance to make a decision if I'm going to do what's right. And again, Boaz is doing what's right. But my brother's hesitating. He won't make a decision. So here we are talking about it. And meanwhile, what's going to happen? I'm worried some other person will show up and buy the car, right? I can't control what the world would do. So I tell this brother of mine, I say, look, I want to buy that car if you don't want to buy it. And so I'm going to give you to the end of today to make a decision. And if you don't make a decision by the end of the day, I'm going to go buy it tomorrow. So in effect, I'm giving him first chance, but I'm also letting him know he has to commit one way or another. He can't be indecisive forever or he'll lose the chance to buy it. That's what Boaz has done here. Boaz has forced the relative to take a stand or get out of the way. And with the opportunity to buy land, it seemed like such a great deal. The guy stepped forward. Now, there are some differences between my analogy and what's going on here. Not the least of which is we're talking about cars versus wives. But more importantly, first, Boaz is engaged in a legal question here. There's no law that says someone has to buy that widow's car in my analogy. That's the difference. But in Boaz's situation, there was a law that said there had to be a redeemer. So it was only a matter of who, not a matter of if. So when the relative commits to the purchase, he, as I said earlier, he assumed the legal identity of kinsman redeemer. Once that legal identity attaches, it can't be revoked. It can't be refused. To become a kinsman redeemer means to assume all the legal obligations that come with that title. So the law requires him to do a certain number of things, and he's obligated to keep all of them if he's going to step into the role. So, of course, that means with the elders watching, he will now be on the hook not only for the land, but as you all probably have guessed, he's also going to be on the hook to redeem the wife that needs a son. And so the law requires that a kinsman redeemer redeem the land, and in the presence of the elders, excited at the prospect of doing it, he says, I will do it. And then the catch. And this is the second difference, by the way. Verse 5. Boaz says, on the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi you must also acquire Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of the deceased, in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance. So Boaz reminds the relative, if you're going to assume responsibility as kinsman redeemer, for Naomi, for her land that is, well then you've got to be prepared to do all of it, friend. Not only do you have to do the land, but you have to redeem this widow that is in Naomi's house, this Moabitess, you may remember this lady that came into town with Naomi, Ruth, yeah, you've got to marry her. Now, this would be like me telling my brother, oh, I forgot to mention there's a catch on the car. If you buy the widow's car, you also have to marry the widow. 
right? I'm sure that's going to diminish his interest greatly in the purchase. And that's exactly what Boaz was expecting in this case as well. I mean, as you may remember about this a few weeks back, the Levite marriage requirement that Deuteronomy 25.5 says, When brothers live together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the deceased shall not be married outside the family to a strange man. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her to himself as a wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. So the Redeemer has to marry the widow in a case where that woman has not received an heir yet and there's a potential then for that family name to die out in Israel. Instead, this Redeemer swoops in, marries the woman. First son out of that marriage will be considered, legally considered, the son of the deceased man. And that means he'll take on not just the name, but he'll have that man's inheritance as well. Think about this for a minute. In such a case, the child born to that union was legally the offspring of the deceased. And therefore, the property of Naomi would flow to that child. So in this way, what Boaz has compelled out of this relative is that the relative make a decision regarding not just the land, but also the marriage. The opportunity to buy land was dangled in front of him. He jumped at that. Now when he hears, oh, there's this catch, it's going to cause him to rethink the whole deal. But I'm going to assume for a moment that this relative was not an idiot. And what I mean by that is this. He probably assumed that redeeming Naomi's land was going to mean he would also have to redeem Naomi. He probably assumed that, because I don't know why he wouldn't have assumed that. That would have been common knowledge. But he also would have known that Naomi has passed childbearing years. So, he probably thought, well, I'll have to take a widow into my house. She can have the room in the back. She can probably help with the cleaning and cooking. That's not such a bad deal. But I don't need to worry about actually having any children that could then impact my own inheritance. She's just going to be a widow in the house for a few years. Fair enough price to get some good land. That's what he's assuming. Evidently, though, he either hadn't heard or he hadn't considered the situation of Ruth. And the fact that she didn't have any children either. And that as a member of the family, she needed to be redeemed as well. Had he suspected that, I think he might have deferred on the decision. That is to say, he wouldn't have said no. He would have just said, not today. He would have played the waiting game. Because look at it this way. He could have waited years or even decades until Ruth was also past childbearing years. Maybe by then Naomi's dead. And then he could have said, I'll be the redeemer and gotten away with what he probably was assuming he was going to get here. That is the land with no responsibility to have to father a child. But now he's trapped. He's trapped by his own words. He said, I'll be the redeemer, which means he has to commit to taking Ruth as a wife and raising up her first son as the deceased son. He can't say, I'll wait. He can't say, I'll think about it. He's already on the record. So Boaz has played this guy really well. He put forth the opportunity to purchase the land, to gain the man's commitment. Then he introduces into the deal the whole idea of the wife, knowing it's going to make the man's interest go away. But now the guy is on the record, so it can't be left to another day. Predictably, the man declines. Verse 6, the closest relative says, I cannot redeem it for myself because I would jeopardize my own inheritance. Redeem it for yourself. You may have my right of redemption, for I cannot redeem it. So he changes his mind. He says, I can't be the kinsman redeemer after all. And he says, I can't do it because it would jeopardize my own inheritance. Here's what he means. In order for him to buy this land, he's going to have to bring money to the table, obviously, if he were to redeem it. Let's just assume he's got a bank account somewhere. He's going to take money out of his bank, and he's going to put it on the table, and he's going to buy the land. Where's that money going to go? Well, the money's going to have to go to Naomi. That's not his family. Now Naomi is another family. So he's moving wealth out of his own family into Naomi's family in order to take on this land. But when the child of Ruth is born, that child will receive Naomi's land as his inheritance. For it's as if that child always existed. You act as if that child was the son of the deceased, which predates all of these other arrangements. So it's like going back in time. As soon as that child is born, we sort of reset. That land is now the son's, and we go back to that point in time. But the problem is the money that went to Naomi, that's gone. The man would have taken money out of his bank that would have effectively been his inheritance, something he could have passed on, and he would have spent it for land that he couldn't hold on to. And so what he's saying is, I can't redeem it because I'm taking my wealth out of my pocket for something I can't hold on to. Because as soon as the sun comes along, I'm going to lose it. Because it won't be mine. His own wealth is more important to him than this woman or the law or the need for what has to be done under law. So in that sense, he's saying, my love of my own wealth exceeds my love for Naomi's family. 
And so he says, I don't want to be kinsman redeemer. After all, I cannot redeem this land. I cannot redeem Naomi. And now many of you probably see, even now, some parallels that we'll address in our second story next week. I mean, Christ is our redeemer, would be the most obvious, and of the church being redeemed and so on, even of Israel ultimately, which we'll talk about as well. And we'll look at all these parallels. But do you also wonder who this other relative is? Now, he's not named, but he is picturing something in our second story, a person actually. And without ruining it, I won't tell you today who he's picturing. But give some thought to the one who couldn't redeem to the close relative who was inadequate. And we'll look next week at how that begins to fill out our second story of Boaz and Christ and what Christ did in redeeming us under law. Pray with me. Dear Father, we love pictures in Scripture, Father. They're like puzzles. They're, they give us a thrill when we start to see it all coming together. But Father, they serve such an important purpose in our understanding as well. They Remind us that you have been working for many millennia to create a story that you authored. And when we see the details of it in pictures, Father, we can gain confirmation that you were at work long before we could have detected you. That's true in the annals of history, Father, but it's also true in our own personal walk. That you knew us before we knew you. You had a plan before we understood it. You were working in that plan before we recognized it. Father, that's the true meaning of grace. And we are so thankful, Father, that you extended, to, uh, extended it to us for no reasons of our own, by no merit of, us, uh, of our own, Father. You, you stepped into our life and you have done an amazing work redeeming us from the penalty we deserved and building us up in the knowledge and grace of Christ. I just thank you, Father, for that, for that mercy, for those in here who have received it, for the many more who will in your plan. Let us, Father, work in that grace, understanding it and being amazed by it and then motivated to work with it, Father, to be useful to you. Thank you, Father, for Oak Hill, for the food that's going to be given to us here. I pray, Father, a blessing on the meal that you will use it to nourish our bodies and that our hearts will reflect in thankfulness over what you provide. And for the workers and those who have supported the the putting of this event together, Father, thank you for their hands of service and for their hearts as well. Bless our time as we fellowship. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Our dear Father, thank you for this beautiful, simple, marvelous book of Scripture, Father. How many people have read it over the centuries and been awed by the beauty of the love story, and yet here we are, Father, studying it once more and finding it so rich and so deep. We've seen eschatology in it, Father. We've seen pictures of Christ repeatedly. But don't let our hearts, Father, be distracted by some of these things. It's... It's obviously intentional, Father, that you've buried these pictures for our sake, and we see that, but at the heart of it all, Father, is Christ, and we want to make sure our focus as we study this is on him and on his work and on our relationship to him. And I do thank you, Father, for a church that puts your word first and gives me the opportunity to preach in this way, Father, to know that as I stand in the pulpit to open your word, I'm surrounded by those who want to hear it. That's a true blessing, Father. Thank you for this this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're finishing our study of Ruth. I've been doing the first story followed by the second story, as I call them. The first story being the main characters, the second story always being the prophetic picture. You've noticed that pattern. You may have counted with me and realized that this is the week I would normally have gone into the second story. But instead, we're going to go back to the first story again, continuing through chapter 4, looking at the characters of Boaz and, and Ruth and Naomi, watching him pursue rest for these ladies. So pick up there again with me and where we've been, what we've been doing. Last week we studied Boaz's brilliant strategy to compel the kinsman redeemer in waiting to either commit or relinquish his role concerning these women. The unnamed man in the story stood between Boaz and Naomi's family. So that man was a closer relative, we're told, so he had to decline to redeem before Boaz would have been permitted to step into the gap. Boaz knew this, And he also knew it wasn't going to be easy to get this guy on record. This relative had good reasons to delay his decision, as we learned last week. But Boaz had a plan to get this guy to make a decision one way or the other, just as he promised Ruth. 
He did it, remember, by dangling the prospect of receiving Naomi's land, which got the guy's interest as he expected. This man was allowed the first right of refusal for purchasing Naomi's land, the land that she had to sell to survive. And obtaining land in that day, friends, was a -a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. It's easy to overlook how different life was then versus what we know today. Today you can run out and find land if you can afford it almost anywhere. Not so in this time. All the land of Israel had been divided up and assigned to tribes and to families. There was literally no land available in the day. And the law, as you heard in our reading this morning, set very complicated limits on how long land could be possessed outside the family should it have been purchased under some situation. And under most circumstances, land that was sold outside the family eventually reverted back to the original owner at the Jubilee. So the opportunity to acquire and to hold permanently any land at all, that that was a deal too good to pass up. In fact, it seemed like a deal that was too good to be true in this case because it was a distress sale from a woman who had to let it go cheap and this guy was going to get to keep it because he assumed that Naomi's family was on the verge of disappearing altogether. Remember, you, you have Elimelech gone, you have his sons gone. The only one left is Naomi, or so the man must have assumed. And she's not going to have any more kids, and she's not going to live forever. So within a relatively short time, the land would be his, for there'd be no one else to inherit it. Again, too good to be true. And in fact, it was too good to be true, because as the guy found out last week, there was this other woman, this daughter-in-law, who also needed to be redeemed. And suddenly, the man's hopes faded as fast as his commitment did. He was willing to pay the price of redemption for the land so long as it profited him. But now there was this real personal cost involved, this threat to his own inheritance, as he said last week. And now, as we saw, he's no longer able to redeem, no longer able to pay such a steep price. And so he says, I cannot redeem the widow. I cannot redeem the land. And he spoke those words in front of ten witnesses. Remember? The ones, the elders of the city that were assembled by Boaz. These elders stood by silently, but their impact was pretty significant. It was felt. Their watchful eyes ensured that everything that was done was binding and all according to law. And so now the matter is finished. That's where we pick up. Now let's proceed forward. Verse 7. Now, this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning the redemption and the exchange of land to confirm any matter. A man removed his sandal and gave it to another, and this was the manner of attestation in Israel. So the closest relative said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, and he removed his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses today that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belong to Elimelech and all that belong to Chilion and Maon. Moreover, I have acquired Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Maon, to be my wife in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance, so that the name of the deceased will not be cut off from his brothers or from the court of his birthplace. You are witnesses today. So as Samuel, the author of this book, explains, there was a custom in this day in the time of Judges, for how a matter of this kind was to be officially concluded. And remember, when we say the time of Judges, there are no kings at this point in Israel. And not even judges are on every street corner. So it fell to the leaders of a city or a town, generally speaking, to enforce the rule of law in their particular area. So in that day, as Samuel says, the people adopted a custom for how a man was to refuse his right as redeemer and to have land transferred under those circumstances. And the custom, he says, was for a man to remove a sandal that he was wearing at the time and give that sandal to the one who was actually going to redeem the land, to pay the price and own the land. That custom finds its origins in law given to Israel. In Deuteronomy 25.8, we read this. Then the elders of the city shall summon him and speak to him, and if he persists and says, I do not desire to take her, speaking of redeeming a woman, then his brother's wife shall come to him in the sight of the elders and pull his sandal off his foot and spit in his face, and she shall declare, this is done to the man who does not build up his brother's house. In Israel his name shall be called the house of him whose sandal is removed. So here's what the law required. The law required that the woman who wasn't being redeemed by this man who should redeem her, 
is to go to the, the elders, and she was the one to pull off the man's sandals. Furthermore, as you heard, she spits in the man's face for refusing to redeem her. Spitting was a sign of disgust, of course. And then in having a woman do all these things, particularly taking the sandal, etc., that's a particularly humiliating moment for a man in a patriarchal culture. And all of this is going on under law because the one who would not keep law be publicly shamed. The whole intent here is to publicly shame someone who's not living up to the expectations of the law for the sake of this woman. So interestingly, the law did not compel the man to marry her in the sense that it forced that outcome. It still expected him to do it willingly, but if he wouldn't, he was to be shamed publicly. But notice the difference. There is a difference between what I just read in Deuteronomy and what we see happening here in Ruth, isn't there? In this time, the custom was practiced differently than the law expected. This, again, is a time when people were doing what was right in their own eyes, the time of judges. Instead of a woman shaming the man, they had changed it. Now the tradition had become that the discredited redeemer simply took off his own sandal, no one spitting in his face, no woman present, and just gave his sandal over to the new redeemer. Now, by giving up just one sandal in the way that you see happening here, the discredited redeemer would have been unable to walk properly as he left the meeting. I mean, he'd have to kind of walk a little strangely, like I am right now with my sprained ankle. His lopsided stride would have drawn attention to himself publicly as he leaves this meeting, and it communicated the shameful refusal to redeem. But you can tell they've muted the whole thing, haven't they? From what the law required, men came along later and said, you know, we don't like that spit-in-the-face thing very much, and, and I don't want to have this happen in front of women. How about we just do it this way? Just another indication of how the law was being set aside, at least to some degree. Moreover, the new redeemer, this man who held the sandal now, he possessed physical proof that he had gained the redemption right from the other man. I mean, this is effectively like a signed piece of paper. I have your shoe. It tells everybody what we just did. But giving up footwear to the new redeemer also created two very powerful symbolic messages. First, standing on land in that day was a way of expressing ownership over it. You can see this when you remember how God told Abraham to walk throughout the land that he was giving him in Canaan. Remember, that walking on the land was a way of expressing, I own this. And therefore, when you remove a sandal, it means symbolically, it's a way of symbolically relinquishing the right to land. The right to walk on it, in other words. And in this case, that's what exactly what's happened. The relative gave up his claim to Naomi's land, as he says in verse 6. But the even more powerful symbol here is that taking possession of another person's sandal symbolizes walking in their footsteps. Boaz was taking the place of the other man in redeeming the land and in redeeming the woman. He's walking the path, so to speak, that the other relative should have walked but was unable to do under law. Since the relative couldn't meet the terms of the law, he had to give up his footwear to Boaz, who was now prepared to keep the law in his place. And so it's as if Boaz stepped into the man's place, as if wearing his shoes, so to speak, and walked his walk for him. That's the symbology that's implicit here as you give up a sandal. So that's the first step now. The man, the transaction has happened. Next, Boaz declares to the witnesses that he has rightfully assumed the place of this other relative. The elders in the crowd have all gathered there for this meeting. They're all watching this. They're observing it. And they are the witnesses so that if called upon in the future, they could truthfully testify to this matter, to what took place, and that it was settled according to the law. They could report that the closer relative was disqualified from redeeming and failed to meet the law of redemption and they could say that Boaz met all the qualifications to assume the redeemer's role he has performed the law in the place of the relative and they respond not only by agreeing with what he said but they go much beyond an affirmation they actually go to praising Boaz here for his actions verse 11 all the people who were in the court and the elders said we are witnesses May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, both of whom built the house of Israel. And may you achieve wealth in Ephrathah and become famous in Bethlehem. Moreover, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah through the offspring which the Lord will give you by this young woman. There's a lot going on there, actually. Let's break it down. First, the people say, yes, we are witnesses. But then they say, 
and I guess really they ask, that the Lord would bless this woman, that is Ruth, to be like Rachel and Leah. You remember the stories we studied years ago in Genesis about Rachel and Leah. They were the wives of Jacob that he obtained when he was working for Laban. Each of those wives, though, were famous within Israel for the fact that they produced not only a lot of children, but so many sons. Each of them produced sons between the two of them. Those sons eventually give rise to the tribes of Israel, as you know. And they ask, in this case, in like manner, that the Lord might bless Boaz with a host of male descendants, a host of sons, similar to the way those women bless Jacob. Here's why they're asking that. Not just in some general sense that, hey, we hope you have a nice family. They're asking in a very specific sense. Remember, Boaz is obligated by the law, the law that he's fulfilling, to take the firstborn son out of this relationship and designate this firstborn to be a Lemelech's son under law, not Boaz's son. So what if this son is the only one that Ruth gives Boaz in their entire marriage? What if he only has one son? Well, then, if that were the case, Boaz would be left without an heir. That's the risk you take. As the Redeemer. The risk you take is, if I only get one son, I'll have no sons. And so, the people ask the Lord, don't let that be Boaz's testimony for all that he's done for the sake of Ruth. Bless him like you blessed Leah and Rachel. Give him a lot of sons. And therefore, he would have his own. Furthermore, they ask the Lord that Boaz might possess great wealth for having placed his personal inheritance at risk. And they talk about two places here. Ephrathah and Bethlehem. Ephrathah is just another name for Bethlehem. So they just say the same thing twice. It's a, a way of repeating for emphasis. But the reason they're asking for it is, remember the closer relative? When he was originally asked if he could take on the land, he says, oh yeah. Then they tell him, oh, you have to take on the wife also and raise the son up. And he goes, oh, wait a minute. That puts my inheritance at risk. We explained last week why that was. And just like the closer relative, Boaz is going to have to pay money to Naomi for this land. And that money will leave his wealth and go to her, and he will not see that money come back when the son that is born becomes Naomi's son and gets the land as his inheritance. He's not going to pay Boaz back for the land. The land's just going to be his by birthright. So, in the same way that this other man was too concerned about losing his wealth to take the role of redeemer, Boaz has the same risk, only Boaz is willing to do it. And so they say, Lord, would you compensate Boaz for his loss here? Would you bless him in return? Not a promise, not a guarantee. Don't let some of the nonsense that's floating in the church today cloud your thinking. God does not promise that you'll get back what you spend. Sometimes he leaves you with less for good reason. They're just asking, would God do that? Would it be a blessing to Boaz in this way? Finally, they ask that Boaz's name would be made great for this sacrifice. They declare, may he be famous. The word famous in Hebrew is kara, Q-A-R-A, kara. It literally means to be called upon. May your name be called upon. May it be declared. So they're asking, may Boaz's name be declared in Bethlehem. And then the crowd says in verse 12, that Boaz's offspring for Ruth should be like Perez who came from Tamar and Judah. Now that's another story out of Genesis. Remember chapter 38 Judah has had a few sons. One married Tamar, the man died. Another married Tamar, that man died. And now he's got one son left, and he won't let the last son marry Tamar, which he should have done because she was a widow without sons. She deserved to have a husband. The brother was supposed to step into the place of the previous sons. But Judah said, nah. The sense he was saying to Tamar, you killed my first two sons. I'm not going to let you do it a third time. That wasn't literally what it says, but you wonder if that wasn't in the back of his mind, right? And as a result, Tamar's left as a widow, much like Ruth, with no prospect for marriage because the Redeemer in this case was being prevented from acting as Redeemer. So it's similar to what we see here. No one could step into the gap because the one who had the right wasn't going on the record to refuse it. He just wasn't doing anything. And Tamar, in her impatience, decided to go a step on her own. You, you remember she then posed as a prostitute on the road, on the roadside and entrapped Judah to come into her and produce a child, which was not the right way to go about it, but God used that sin to produce the offspring that was intended and to move the line of Messiah forward in the tribe of Judah. There are some interesting parallels between Ruth and Tamar, some of which I just mentioned, of course. They were both Gentile women. Tamar was a Gentile. 
Both, we said already, are widows without children. Both were due to be redeemed but couldn't be. Both married considerably older husbands. Tamar ended up marrying Judah. Both had to resort to creative methods to obtain the offspring that they both rightfully deserved under law but weren't getting. Eventually, she bore a man named Perez through Judah. He inherited the seed line that leads to the Messiah. He's in the list of genealogies that lead us to Jesus. He also became the leading family within the tribe of Judah. And that's all in the minds, I think, of the crowd when they say, would you make the son of Boaz and Ruth just like you made the son of Tamar and Judah? Make him someone in the line of Messiah. Make him someone great, a name, prosperity, a posterity that will be a testimony to this marriage. That suggests that the crowd knew that Boaz carried the seed promise. There was one family line through whom God was sending the promise of bringing a seed from Adam all the way to Jesus. And whoever carried that seed promise was known by the Jewish people to be someone very special in God's plan. It appears as though the crowd understood the connection that Boaz was in the seed promise line. One of his sons was going to be the one who carried the seed promise forward. They didn't know which one it would be, but they're asking the Lord, may it be the first son, the one that comes from Ruth and Boaz and will go to Naomi. What we're learning here is very important. We're learning that the firstborn son of Boaz is destined to carry the seed promise, that is the family line to Messiah, but he's going to legally be Naomi's son, and therefore he's going to inherit the wealth of Elimelech, Naomi's husband. So the seed promise comes through Boaz. It's going to remain with the firstborn no matter whose son he becomes legally. So in a sense, and this is where it gets interesting, Naomi will be the mother of a child that will have been said to have one father, but his actual father will be different. And ultimately that son will lead to a savior for the nation. Then, as promised, Boaz takes Ruth, his wife, and soon, by the grace of God, they do bear a son. Verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her. And the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a Redeemer today, and may his name become famous in Israel. May he also be to you a restorer of life and a sustainer of your old age, for your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. The neighbor woman gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. So they named him Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. So Naomi's dreams come true. She has come through a dark time, a time of hopelessness. She returned to her land, broken, bitter. She called herself Mara. Yet the prospect of Redeemer gave her some hope. Now, today, her hope has been realized because she receives a son. After the child's birth, Naomi, we're told, becomes the child's nurse. The actual word in Hebrew means caretaker, not wet nurse. It's just simply the custodian of the child. She becomes the mother, in a sense. Now, you might ask at this point, why does Ruth give the child to Naomi? Well, remember, under the law, the Redeemer was responsible for for providing to her, to Naomi's family, this missing heir. Elimelech and his sons died. So the family needs a male heir. But Ruth, now that she's married into Boaz's family, she's no longer a part of Elimelech's family. She's now part of Boaz's family. So she cannot simply raise this son within that family and call it Naomi's son. It has to move to the other family so that that family name continues. So Naomi has to receive this child as her child. Meanwhile, Ruth and Boaz go on with their life and have more children, we presume. So that makes Naomi the last living member of Elimelech's family, so she has to be the one to raise his son as if it were Elimelech's son. So when Boaz, who is Naomi's redeemer, brings a son into the world, that son is the son of Elimelech, the son of God the king. Therefore, Naomi receives the son as if it is her son. So from human terms, who is the father of this boy? Boaz. In spiritual terms, according to the law of God, who is the father? God the King, or Elimelech, as we would say. But, as I said, this child is also the seed promise holder, because the fact that he is legally transferred into Elimelech's family doesn't change what God is doing. God is still using this child to carry the seed promise. He may legally be part of Naomi's family, but he is still in the line of Messiah. That's what you see when he says he becomes the father of Jesse, who becomes the father of David. The the seed promise continues on through this child. 
the women of the town are now rejoicing with Naomi because they all know what it must feel like to be in her position. And so they declare that now may the name of the son be famous. This again is in Hebrew meaning kara, meaning declared, called upon. And they say this child will be a restorer of life and a sustainer in old age for Naomi. Because of Naomi, Ruth came to know her Jewish redeemer and husband. Right? Without Naomi, Ruth never would have known Boaz. And now the tables are turned. Because of Ruth, Naomi now receives a redeemer or a deliverer that is in the son. So there's a real symbiotic relationship here. Ruth is redeemed because of Naomi. Naomi is redeemed because of Ruth. Interestingly, the parents don't name the child. Parents always have that right, and very rarely would you ever see someone let someone else name your child. In this case, a neighbor woman comes up with the name. It's Obed here. The name means servant. One who serves. And the neighbor gave the child this name because she recognized Naomi's care for the child. Naomi was caring for Ruth's child. She's a servant. But, of course, you see a bigger parallel there as well, right? A child named the servant. In fact, at this point, I'm guessing you're seeing many parallels, as I've alluded to them, in what we've already read, right? Parallels between Christ and Boaz and even some other characters. And, for that matter, if we go all the way back into last week, where I was teaching the first part of this chapter, we've never gone back yet and actually unveiled the second story, so to speak, the underlying symbology of that part of the chapter either. I kind of owe you the whole chapter now unveiled, so why don't we do that? We're going to go back through from the... What we looked at last week, all the way through what we're doing this week, we're going to unpack the second story of chapter 4. But now, friends, the second story, as I call it, is not one of end times. We're not looking forward to future prophetic events now. This now is a story of history. Let's go back to last week, where we had Boaz in the gate with his closest relative at the beginning of the chapter. The easiest piece of this whole puzzle, of course, is Boaz himself, right? Everybody in this room knows that he's a picture of Jesus Christ acting as our Redeemer. And and by that same token, we've said already, Ruth, the Gentile bride, is a picture of the church. In Ruth's case, she needed redemption from widowhood. But we, friends, we need redemption from something that's far more serious, far more devastating. As sinners... We incurred a life-threatening debt before God. The Bible says that all people come into the world as sinners. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And our sin nature causes us to live in ways that are contrary to God's law. Our contrary nature and the behavior problems that it produces, all of that collectively is called sin. And sin is a debt that we have before God. Because we have this debt before God, we need someone to pay this debt. And paying this debt, by the way, is not easy. The payment must be equal to the debt. You can't pay off half of it. And the debt we owe, according to Scripture, is a life, an eternal life. Romans 6.23 says that the wages, the payment of sin, is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So here's the problem, friends. We needed someone to bail us out, so to speak, from the debt, the sin debt, that we have before God. You could say it this way. We needed someone to redeem us. Because the word just means to pay a ransom, to pay off a debt. We needed someone to redeem us from the sentence of eternal death, which is due all who sin, and that's pretty much everybody in this room. Boaz, as you know, pictures Christ our Redeemer, who was the one willing to pay that price for our sin debt before God on the cross. Like Boaz... He goes before the elders, that is to say, before the witnesses in the gate, entering into a legal transaction. How so? Well, he made a payment for our debt, which the Bible calls propitiation. First John 4.10, John writes, In this is love, that not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. So he was a legal payment made to offset a debt that we have before a holy and just God who is going to hold us accountable for our sin. By that payment, the Bible says we were justified. Another fancy word which just means to be acquitted of our guilt. Paul says in Romans 5.1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So Christ stepped into the gap. He's the Redeemer who stepped in to assume the role of Redeemer 
And friends, he did it in place of a close relative who could not do it. Let's go through the whole setting again. Like Boaz, Christ assembled ten witnesses for this transaction. In Boaz's day, the the men here, the elders, they represented the authority of the people. They could testify concerning what was right and what was wrong. Notice, though, that the ten elders never forced anyone to do anything. Did you notice that? In fact, they stood by silently the entire time. They simply give witness to what ought to happen in that situation. So where do we find ten witnesses in the story of Christ? Ten witnesses concerning right and wrong. We find them in the law, specifically the Ten Commandments. That is to say, before Jesus could redeem us, he had to meet the terms of the law, and specifically the scrutiny of the law, the Ten Commandments. Remember, the law doesn't compel anyone to do good. It's not capable of doing that. If law compelled us to do what's right, then none of us would speed You'd see the sign, you'd always do the right thing. If you've ever sped once, even one mile over the speed limit, you have proof then, in your own experience, that laws cannot compel righteousness. Their only power is to convict you when you don't keep them. That's their only power. So you have ten witnesses, so to speak, representing the law, silently standing there, making no attempt to force any outcome, simply testifying to what is to be, what ought to be. And now the only question is, will you live up to them? Will you meet the terms of them? In the case of Boaz, Boaz could do what the closer relative could not do. There was that relative who could not meet the law, who could not stand up to the test, who could not satisfy its requirements. But Boaz, he could stand in the gap and he could satisfy those requirements. Boaz withstood the scrutiny of ten witnesses, having satisfied all that the law required concerning Naomi's family. And likewise, Jesus Christ has met all the requirements of the law by living a perfect sinless life. The Ten Commandments and all the other law of God have been met in his life. As John says in 1 John 3, 5, you know that he appeared in order to take away sins and in him there is no sin. So like Boaz, Christ is a man who fulfilled the law. But what about that other man? What about that closer relative who could not fulfill the law's requirements? Remember, he's a close relative of Boaz. In fact, he's a blood relative of Boaz. But he couldn't do it. He couldn't pay the price. He was under the scrutiny of the ten elders, and under their scrutiny, he was forced to hand his shoe to Boaz. And then Boaz could walk in his place, doing what that man could not do. And I said last week that the close relative offers a picture of something else, someone else. And it was interesting to think about who that might be. I didn't tell you because I was hoping you'd come up with it. I'm sure many of you have. Who is the close relative? Well, at the top of the chain, he pictures Adam. As the Bible says, Jesus is the second Adam, the one who came to do what the first one could not. But ultimately, friends, and I hope you see this, ultimately that closer relative is you and me. It's everyone who is descended from Adam with the same sin nature that Adam took on, with the same problem that Adam began, this problem that we cannot meet the scrutiny of the silent law that stands to convict us. Therefore, we cannot pay the price that our sin requires. We needed to hand our shoe to someone who could walk in our place. Hebrews 2.14 says, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who has the power of death, that is the devil. Jesus is truly a close relative. But he had that interesting parentage. He was supposed to be of Joseph, but his actual father is God the King, Jehovah God. And though Jesus was God, he took on flesh so that he could walk in our place, taking our punishment under the law for us, having paid our price. Paul says in Philippians 2, 5, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of man, being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So Boaz and his relative pictures Christ on the one side and mankind, all of us, on the other. But like that relative, we are more closely related to each other than we are to Christ. 
Remember we said that this other man was a closer relative of the person needing redemption. That's a way of signifying that you and I are more alike than we are with Christ. I can't redeem you because I can't pay your price for you. I'm still first in line for my own debt. And for anyone who goes to the grave, never having stepped out of the way and given their sandals, so to speak, by faith to Jesus Christ, they go as their own Redeemer, which is to say they go to hell, literally. Because the price is a perfect life. You don't have it. Empty your pockets. You don't have the perfect life that costs for sin. You literally have to say, I can't afford it. Only Christ has the payment. So as Boaz paid that debt for the man who couldn't pay, the shame that rightfully belonged to the man who could not pay his own debt, that shame in our case transfers. Because Christ doesn't just pay a check. Remember, our debt is not paid with a bank account. Our debt is paid with a life. So he had to actually step into the role taking the death we deserve. That means the shame that was ours for being unable to redeem ourselves transferred to Him. Scripture says in Colossians 2.13, When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, He made you alive together with Him, having forgiven us all of our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to a cross. And then Hebrews adds, Hebrews 12, 2, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who, for the joy set before Him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Lastly, we remember that Boaz redeemed not only Ruth, but he also redeemed Naomi's land, remember? That was part of the deal. That also happened with Christ. The scripture says that as Christ died on the cross, he wasn't just redeeming the souls of those who put their trust in him. He was also redeeming all creation. Colossians 1.19 says, For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Christ and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of the cross through him. I say whether things on earth or things in heaven, he redeemed literally all creation. Next, in this picture we're pursuing, we see that once Boaz became Redeemer, what happened to him? He received adoration. He inherited all that belonged to Elimelech, according to verse 9 in chapter 4. Now remember, we've said already that Elimelech means God is king, and his character in this story represents God the Father, right? Like it's reflected on your sheet. Well, Scripture says that God the Father was husband to Israel, just as Elimelech was husband of Naomi. And now you see Boaz receiving everything that was Elimelech's for this sacrifice. As he redeems Naomi, he also redeems all her land. He takes on possession of the inheritance of Elimelech. Here again is a picture of Christ, because Scripture says, in his death on the cross, in his payment for sin, Jesus inherits all of God's creation. Hebrews 1 1, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers, in the prophets, and in many portions, and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things. So Christ has inherited all. By the way, that's where in Scripture we see how we will receive an inheritance, an eternal reward in the kingdom. For it is Christ who shares his inheritance with the saints on a meritocracy, on the basis of who is worthy of what. So those who are more faithful now receive more in the kingdom, etc., as we've talked in the past. What Christ is doling out is his inheritance that he received. He's sharing it with us. And Boaz's act of mercy led to many descendants and a great name for him in Bethlehem. But Jesus' work on the cross did the same, wouldn't you agree? He has many sons and daughters in faith as a result of his redemption. And the name of Jesus is synonymous with Bethlehem. And it's called upon there first. At his birth. Philippians 2.9 For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, and all those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So why did Boaz do all this? To give Ruth and Naomi rest. I mean, that was the basic purpose in the whole story. To give them permanent security and peace, this Sabbath rest. For, for Ruth, we know the rest came in the form of this marriage, just as our Sabbath rest is found in our faith in Jesus Christ. We are the bride 
who has found her groom. We're never going to work for our righteousness again. We rest in the work that Jesus did. That's why he is our Sabbath. But what about Naomi? Naomi still needed a redeemer. Ironically, Israel, who Naomi pictures, is the one that brought us, the Gentile church, to our redeemer. That is, through the covenants, through the scriptures. Jesus himself was a Jew. So we are like Ruth, coming to know of our redeemer through Naomi. But today, friends, Israel is still in widowhood. They're still a nation waiting for their Messiah. But in a day to come, Scripture says that nation, Israel, will receive the same child that they rejected so long ago. That same Israel who made possible our opportunity to know the Messiah will one day receive that very same Messiah. Just as Naomi led Ruth to Boaz, and one day Ruth turned around and put a child, a deliverer, in Naomi's lap. That's how it's going to work. Zechariah 12.9 says, speaking about the day in which Israel receives the very same child that they rejected earlier. Verse 9 of Zechariah 12. In that day I will set about to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem and I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication so that they will look on me whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. Can you imagine Naomi might have been crying as that firstborn son was placed in her lap? Only in her case, of course, tears of joy. In the way Zechariah describes this future day of Israel's redemption, they'll come to a spirit-led recognition that the child that came to be the man they pierced was the very one they've been waiting for, the Redeemer that they've been looking forward to. So in that sense... They'll understand what's pictured here, that Naomi's receiving of a redeemer through Ruth was the promise of redemption made possible through Boaz. Paul says in Romans 11.30, Just as you, speaking to the church, were once disobedient to God, but now have been shown mercy because of their, Israel's disobedience, so these Israel, these also now, have been disobedient, that because of the mercy shown to you, they also may be shown mercy. For God has shut up all in disobedience, so that he may show mercy to all. So God has orchestrated this relationship so that both Ruth and Naomi needed each other and needed Boaz the most. All right, now the story ends with a genealogy. Verse 18 through 22, the story ends with, Now these are the generations of Perez. To Perez was born Hezron, and to Hezron was born Ram, and to Ram, Aminadad. And to Aminadad was born Nashon, and to Nashon, Salmon, and to Salmon was born Boaz, and to Boaz, Obed, and to Obed was born Jesse, and to Jesse, David. People often wonder, why does this story end with a genealogy? Well, let me explain it. Samuel connects the descendant of Judah and Tamar, Perez, to King David. Now, remember, we did the book of Judges right before we did this study. And that was intentional. Remember, this was written by Samuel, the same one who wrote 1 Samuel for the most part. It was written during the monarchy of Saul. But it was also at the time after David had been anointed and was waiting to assume the throne. So the book of Ruth is written in that period of history where Saul is still ruling, but everyone knows David should be. And there's a contention between the house of Saul And the house of David. Which dynasty is going to win out? And maybe more particularly, which dynasty should win out? And in the midst of that debate, Samuel writes this book. David, he says, not Saul, is in the line of Judah via Boaz and Ruth. That is, in the line of kings. And the Messiah is going to come through David's line by way of Boaz and Ruth. And in that way, what Samuel is doing is making a spiritual argument For the house of David over the house of Saul. That David has to assume the monarchy and Saul has to fade away. That has to be the case in order for God's promise of the Messiah and the kingships of Judah to be fulfilled. Clearly, this is all in God's plan. That's the first and probably the most immediate reason for why the genealogy is there. But it's not the main reason. There's another reason we have this genealogy. One that testifies to God's grace. Perez, remember, was the son of Judah and Tamar. Tamar was Judah's daughter-in-law, and as I told you earlier, she tricked him into impregnating her through that scheme of acting as if she were a prostitute. Now, she had the right to be redeemed as a widow, but because of Judah's refusal to let her have his last son, she felt forced to take this step. A sinful step, yes, but one that felt forced because of another man's sin. 
Now, the product of that union, as we know, is Perez. And because of how that union took place, he's an illegitimate son. I mean, in technical language, we would say a bastard son. There is a law regarding such children in Israel. Deuteronomy 23.2 No one of illegitimate birth shall enter the assembly of the Lord. None of his descendants, even to the tenth generation, shall enter the assembly of the Lord. So here's what the law said. The law said that such a person like Perez could not enter the assembly, nor take, which means they could not take part in the religious life of Israel. They couldn't go into the temple, they couldn't sacrifice, they couldn't participate in the feasts. And that same prohibition had to be carried forward nine more generations within their life. That's the curse of the law for those who came into existence in this kind of illegitimate way. Now, I'm not saying the law was followed. I mean, for that matter, we've seen already from the time of Judges that they didn't follow anything they didn't care to follow. I'm saying that's what the law expected. And you can be sure that God did not lose track of those generations, even if the people stopped observing the law. Follow me? So we have to count out ten generations before someone in that line of Tamar and Judah can enter into the assembly rightfully according to God. What's interesting about Deuteronomy 23 is the very next verse, after the one I just read about illegitimate sons, the very next verse is one I've already read in here, early in this study. I'll read it again. The next verse. No Ammonite or Moabite shall enter into the assembly of the Lord. None of their descendants, even to the tenth generation, shall ever enter the assembly of the Lord. Now the law placed the same restriction on a Moabite who joined to the people of Israel. That person was also barred from participating in the assembly of Israel and their generations after them. Well, we know Ruth was a Moabite, so she would have fallen under the same restriction. But as our story ends, you find a list of exactly ten names tracing from Perez to David. Ten, we remember, is the number of testimony. And the curse of Perez's line ends with David who is another picture of Christ, remember? All right, so think about this. We have Boaz. He is a man who pictures Christ on the cross, paying our price, taking the curse for us, right? Taking, in this case, the curse of the Moabite woman for us. And then you see David in the last one in the line. David is a picture of Christ risen and ruling as king as having come to remove the curse. That's how these two men are classically pictured in Scripture. Boaz is the suffering picture of Christ. David is the ruling picture of Christ. David is the one who sits on the throne, right? So, in other words, in Boaz, you see a picture of the first coming of Christ. And in David, you see a picture of Christ removing the curse, the second coming of Christ. I hope that study opens your eyes to the power of God The God we serve out of Scripture. That is to say, He has obviously authored history in much more than simply in a random way. These people lived a normal life from the point of view that they just went about their days. They didn't think about what was happening as if God was controlling it. They just lived. But in hindsight, as Samuel tells the story, it becomes self-evident that God orchestrated every little detail of their lives so that it becomes this play, like a drama, lived on the stage of everyday life that tells a much bigger story. Now, I'm not suggesting you and I have that same kind of story embedded in our life. We're not picturing Christ in our own life in that way as they did. But that doesn't mean God doesn't have a story of some other kind that he's telling. And it certainly tells you that in the everyday struggles of life, you can look up and know God's in control. Nothing's random here, right? The trials, the difficulties, the health scares, the other things that we just think have to be a sign that God's taking a break in our life are actually signs that God is working in your life. The only question is, what are you doing with the material He's giving you? When you see the puzzle coming together, you recognize God is not just the author of history in some large sense. He's the author of history down to the minutia of everyday life because, frankly, you can't author the large stuff if you're not also authoring the small stuff that gets you to the large stuff. There are some unanswered questions I'm going to leave as unanswered. Hopefully that will give you something to go back and study on your own. Let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for giving us a chance to finish this study, to see a part of what you've embedded in it, in the story of this this small family long ago. Thank you for showing us our story in it. Remind us, Father, that we could not pay our own price, but you did it for us, 
We handed you a sandal, so to speak, and you walk in our place. Thank you for that blessing. Let us communicate to others. Perhaps somebody we know who doesn't understand the gospel will see it more plainly if we take them through a book like this than if we were to take them into something else in the scriptures. Let, let our knowledge of this book be useful to us, Father, in serving you in that way. And send us out from here, Father, renewed, replenished, refreshed, and committed. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.